thing gonna blow up. Okay, here we go. We're on. We're on live. Good. All right. Welcome, everybody. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, move into our uh, study session, and then we'll talk about all the cool tools we have in here later on. Um, I'll do a brief introduction here. Um, this afternoon, we have a study session on the 2012 short range transit plan and a discussion of a proposed fare structure. And Anita Winkler will lead that discussion. Anita is our assistant uh, director of public utilities for transit, or public works, excuse, transportation and public works. I have utilities on my mind, I think. Um, uh, so she's in the other department that handles with thing, things out in the field services. <laughs> so without further ado, <laughs> please take it, Anita. I'm not sure which one of those jobs I want right now. <laughs> so, um, Good afternoon, Mayor Olivares and members of the council. I'm Anita Winkler. I'm the Deputy Director of Transit in the Transportation and Public Works Department. Um, and I'm quite relieved that somebody else still struggles trying to get that right at times. So, The study session today is intended to update you about city bus service and fare proposals under consideration as part of our short range transit plan process and to have an opportunity to hear your questions and any concerns you may have about the proposals we're presenting. It's kind of fun to, to give the test drive to the new technology so it's, this is going to be exciting. So uh, the overview for today, uh, just to give you a quick sense of how we're going to carry this through, an introduction now and a quick financial update. And then I'm going to turn this over to the rest of the team to talk about what we learned at a series of public outreach meetings, uh, the proposed fare increase, the proposed transfer policy reform, and the proposed service modifications, and then the next steps. So to sort of get it started, skip that one. Let me introduce the team because otherwise I'll forget to do it and they're really the important ones here. Behind me are Rachel Ede, who's a transit planner. You might just raise your hand. Uh, Michael Ivory, who's a transit planner. Joy Gibson, who's our marketing and outreach coordinator. And somewhere between the transit operations building and here is Steve Roris, our transit superintendent. You'll recognize him when he walks in rather out of breath. Um, when we started this whole process, I m made a commitment to this team that there were no rules about how we tackled the issues in front of us, that the past was past and the door at this point was open to innovation and new ideas, that we needed to tackle service reductions with a scalpel, not a meat ax, not just ax the whole route, but do this very carefully, and that we needed to do the best we could to match our service to the community needs and demands. When you and I last talked, it was during the budget review, and at that time we talked about some un financing uncertainties that we were facing. Um, do you not have a copy of the, the slides in front of you? Mm -hmm. You do? Okay, hard copy. Okay. At that time, we didn't know what Congress would do, if anything, about transit funding, and I was extremely nervous about not being able to use operate federal funding to help support our operations. In the last couple of months, Congress did enact legislation known as the MAP 21, and I didn't have a chance to get the actual, what that MAP 21 stands for, but you'll probably be happier just knowing it is MAP 21. Uh, that did include provisions that will allow a transit system like City Bus to continue to use some federal money for operating. That's the good news. The uh, harder news is that it's a two-year bill, so we have some relief for two years. But the other part of that is it requires congressional appropriations each year. So we'll see if that part happens. We, however, being somewhat optimistic, are operating um, on the assumption that given Congress got it this far, we'll see some of that money. The second part that we talked about was Transportation Development Act money and Measure M money. Those are both sales tax money. And we all know what sales has, tax has been like. We managed and have taken a great deal of pride in not cutting service over the last many years when other transit systems were making huge cuts as much as 25% of their service. We had what we call, probably really inappropriately, a TDA reserve. It was kind of a savings account of TDA money 
that we didn't use every year, and that's allowed to accumulate for us in an account, and we can draw from it later. The term reserve, when I use it that way, gives the accountants real nightmare, so I use it very cautiously when I say it here. Um, but we've reached the point now that that's, that's becoming more difficult. Those two sources of money, both sales tax, I'm trying to see how this is going to amount to 46% of our budget. It's huge. I knew it was big. I didn't know it was that big until we ran some recent numbers. So we're now facing a situation where a source that we're relying on for almost half of our funding is not sufficient to meet that. And our reserve that we've been using is almost depleted. We have enough to make it probably another year and a half, maybe two years. Um, and hopefully the economy is turning around and that will begin to grow, but I don't want to bet the transit service on that happening. So that, um, let's, let's get the other part here. That brings me to the charge that I gave to the team, and that was I asked them to find a million dollars in either service reductions or revenue increases f as the first step towards addressing this problem. It's not the final solution. It gets us a couple more years down the road and gives us a chance to really fine tune things, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. The, um, well, that, that next step will be a very intense evaluation of the overall system and um, even the design of the system and really just cutting to ground zero and rebuilding a transit system that will meet this community's needs. The design of that system is as old as the transit system itself from the 1950s, and it worked great when we were a fairly small, compact community and everybody could come downtown and go back out. It just doesn't work very well for that anymore, and we're finding that out. So the package of proposals that we're bringing to you today represent well-thought-through ideas that are supported by statistical data, are intended to spread the impact as fairly as possible throughout the community, and to form the foundation for the next steps for CityBus. It's a creative approach combining service reductions, service improvements, and increased revenues. And it's probably one of the most difficult packages that this team has ever had to bring to the council. As I mentioned, city buses prided itself on being able to main service while others were cutting service, but we've just reached the point where we no longer can do that. Um, you know, as most of you know, I was here for a long time, a long time ago, and I don't remember ever bringing a service cut to the council during that time. City bus, well, we recognize as a team and individually that our transit service is critical to many, many of our riders, if not most of them. We, and we have not taken the impact of these changes on people, of the impact of these changes on people's lives lightly. I need to commend the team for the public outreach that they've undertaken, and they'll explain some of that to you. It's very extensive over the last couple months. And for the quality of work that they've done to bring something that's creative to you. Um, and we understand that we're asking you, we will be asking you in a couple months for some really tough decisions. We hope we're giving you the information that will help you through those decisions. But we just want you to know that we're very sympathetic to what we're asking you to do. With that, I'm going to turn this over to the rest of the team who will explain the work that they've done. I'll remain available for questions if needed. Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Lead, Transit Planner. Before we launch into the main part of our presentation, I wanted to take just a few minutes to talk about the public outreach we've done over the last few months and what we've heard in those meetings. We initiated this effort back in May with two traditional public meetings, one at the City Hall Annex and one at the Transit Operations Building. We had about 55 people participate in those meetings. And then throughout the course of this uh, summer, we've been going out in the community and doing meetings and um, interacting with folks at uh, the other locations you see listed on the slide. And then we've come back to um, do three public meetings uh, last, just last week, one at the Downtown Transit Mall in the old bank building, one at the Bennett Valley Senior Center, and one at the Transit Operations Building. And we had uh, over 60 people attend those meetings. So uh, we've had very good attendance. We feel like we've had a good opportunity to talk to a real cross-section of the community. So just to summarize in broad terms what we've heard from the community, um, first on the topic of fares and transfer policy, we received surprisingly mixed input on the concept of a fare increase. Obviously, a lot of people said to us, please don't raise fares. These are hard times. Any increase in either the fixed route fare or paratransit fare is going to be a real hardship for me. But we also heard people say, if you have to do something, we'd rather that you raise the fare a little bit rather than cut service more. We heard a lot of support for preserving the service as much as possible. 
And then we actually did have a few people who said, you know, city bus is a real value compared to a lot of other operators. You haven't been in for a fair increase in four years. We understand that you need to do this in these times. So we did hear that too. So it was surprisingly mixed. Um, regarding the transfer policy, we heard a lot of frustration um, both from our drivers and from the public about the transfer abuse that we'll talk about a little bit that folks are seeing in the system. Um, the way our current transfer policy operates, there's a lot of opportunities for people to um, hand slips between each other for um, folks to avoid paying a fare that they should be paying. And the riders see it, the drivers see it, and it's um, a source of frustration for people who are doing the right thing and paying their fare and using their transfers appropriately. We of course also did have people say that if you do tighten up the transfer policy, that will have an effect on us as well. Um, some people may have to pay an additional fare to complete their business in a day, and that's something that we were working to take into consideration and try to find some ways to mitigate. And then finally, we heard a lot of support throughout the community and with the drivers for the concept of a day pass, which is not something that's included in these proposals for February, but something we're looking very closely at for the future. And this would be a pass that would be unlimited rides for just one day. It would be purchased on the bus. And for someone who has to make a lot of trips in one day, they would pay uh, something less than what they would be paying if they were just paying for every single trip. Um, we, would, we haven't priced it out yet. But it would enable people who don't use a transit system enough to buy a monthly pass but want to run all of their errands on one day, which many people do, it would give them a lower cost discounted way to do that. In terms of service proposals, uh, we heard a lot of specific comments on routes, far beyond what we're proposing to you here today. As Anita mentioned, we'll be looking forward to do some more um, deep work with the system um, in, in the coming year and beyond. A lot of folks had very specific comments about route alignment, about major destinations where we sh should try to find a way to find more or, um, provide more direct service. A lot of comments on our overall system design, frustration with the one-way loops we have in our system. One-way loops are a great way to provide coverage with uh, a limited resource, but um, there's a lot of frustration without having a, with a, a lack of two-way service, both for riders um, and, and, in term, and also confusion. Um, we heard a lot of suggestions that we need to do more to integrate with our transit partners, inc including Sonoma County Transit. A lot of our riders are using both systems and want us to continue to work um, to see what we can do to coordinate, and also some comments about future coordination with SMART. Um, earlier service on Sunday is always a request. We've had this request for years, as well as later service in the evening. And then a series of comments about on-time performance on specific routes. Um, route 6, which is West 3rd Street, Route 9, Sebastopol, Sebastopol Road, Route 14, which is County Center, and Route 17, Piner Road. We're addressing on-time performance issues on all of those routes as part of these service proposals. And finally, um, the last comment we heard a lot was that school bell times were seeing some real impacts in the system. We know about this, but some requests both from riders and drivers to try to get a little bit more supplemental service out there to help with those loads. So before we go into fair analysis, I actually I, I wanted to end that slide by saying, um, acknowledging, as Anita mentioned, that what we're really focusing on today is our fair and service proposals for February. But all of these larger issues that the public has raised will be incorporated into the, the larger short-range transit plan. We will be bringing those in as proposals either for um, things we could do if we reallocated hours within the system or things we could do if additional operating resources became available. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joy Gibson to talk about the fair proposals. Good afternoon. I'm Joy Gibson, Marketing Outreach Coordinator for Santa Rosa City Bus. As part of our fare analysis, we looked at the California Transit Association's 2011 fare summary. These are the California transit providers whose fares we looked at. The averages for these providers are shown here for their adult cash fare and their um, monthly passes. Many of these providers have other media that they use, but these were the ones that were most consistent with what we offer. In the next column, you'll see our current fares. And you'll notice that, that we are quite a bit lower than average for the other California transit providers. And the last column shows what our proposed fare increases are uh, that we want to present to you. So even with the new pro, uh, proposed fares, you can see we're still very competitive and very right on point with what the other transit providers are offering, or are charging, I should say. In addition, some of the things that we want to do to help mitigate the fare increase is to keep the prices of our ticket books at the same rate. Currently, they are sold at a five cent discount off of a cash price. So we'd like to maintain that for people for at least the next six months or so until um, we can see how that works. 
Um, also, as part of that, we want to sell the tickets in 10 ticket increments. Currently, the ticket books for adults are sold in 50 ticket increments, and seniors and youth are in 20 ticket in increments. Um, a part of our public outreach, we talk to a lot of people that do um, get paid weekly, so th those expenses are um, significant. The other thing that we've um, discovered is often people want to get a monthly pass, but so now we're going to offer them at the prorated amount of 50% off on the 15th of the month. Since they're only good for half the month, they'll be half the price. The last thing that we have to take into consideration is increasing the paratransit fare. So that will be double the proposed adult cash fare, and that will be $3 per one-way trip. Another important component of this is that we are mandated by our federal regulations to have a 20% fare box ratio for our fixed route service and 10% on our paratransit service. Our fixed route service, we're very close. We're just slightly under that. The, however, paratransit is um, significantly under that, and we'll, we'll be augmenting that going forward with some Measure M funds. The second part of the revenue increase is a transfer policy reform. Our current transfers are issued for free with a paid fare. That means if someone gets on the bus and uses cash or a ticket, they're given a transfer. Um, people that have a monthly pass, that's good for unlimited rides, so they don't need a transfer. Currently, those are good for two hours. This is a history of our transfer use over the past six fiscal years, and you can see in fiscal year 10-11 that we broke the uh, one million trip mark on transfers, and you can see that the transfer use has gone up significantly over the past six years. By um, changing our transfer policy to make it a one-use transfer for either city, county, or Golden Gate, um, what that does is anytime somebody boards the bus, they need to give the driver something, either cash, a ticket, a transfer, or show them their pass. So that should help um, with uh, boardings and help mitigate a lot of the, this passing of transfers around. They would still be valid for two hours, and they would be issued on request only. What our projections are, if we can reduce the transfer use and convert those into a paid fare, you can see on the left that if we can reduce them by, say, 25 percent, we have the potential of increasing our paid fares up to up the amount of 255,000 fares. So it really is significant, and we really feel that it's important to make this change to people that are taking advantage of the transfers as opposed to an additional fare increase for people that aren't taking advantage. The impact to the budget with the proposed fare increase and the proposed transfer policy reform would close at about 50 percent. We're looking at about $500,000 from those two changes is what we're projecting. The rest of the gap will be closed in service reductions. The reductions that we are proposing only account for a 5 percent reduction in the total city bus service. And I'll turn this over to uh, Rachel. You're going to take this one? Your service notification. Okay, we're bouncing around a little bit, but you have the full team here. Um, we're going to start the section of the presentation where we talk about the service modifications we're proposing, and Michael Ivory and I will be presenting on this topic. Um, as we've discussed, what we're proposing for February that's under discussion here today is really a focus on the fundamentals of our system's viability and health. So the first issue we're, we've really tried to tackle, as I mentioned before, is the reliability of the system and on-time performance. Our system runs um, uh, at least on half-hour headways, if not hour headways, and so when our times transfer system starts to break down because of on-time performance issues, people begin to have real issues with reliability and with trip time and being able to ensure they can get to work or to school or their other destination on time. So for the, fi the, the viability of our system, we need to ensure first that our, our routes are operating reliably on time. Secondly, we have the financial issue we need to address, which is the $500,000 service reduction. And I want to walk you through, before we talk about the specific reductions, and we're going to go route by route and address each specific one that we're proposing, I just want to walk you through what our process is for identifying routes for reductions. Um, we look at a number of things. Of course, we look at ridership, but perhaps more important is the uh, productivity, which is the number of passengers carried per hour of service we invest in a particular route. Um, and I'm going to walk through a couple slides on that in a minute. We also look at on-time performance. There's one route that we have um, a proposal for, Route 6, West 3rd Street, where if we reduce the frequency somewhat from 30 minutes to 45 minutes, we can get it back reliably on time. And so that is a slight reduction in service for the rider, but it means they'll have a route they can really count on. Uh, we also look at duplication with other routes. If there are places where we can pull back service, but there are other options for people to get where they need to go based on overlap of routes, that's obviously attractive. 
And then finally, we, we have really genuinely taken riders' input into consideration, um, the input of our drivers at several different meetings this summer, and we'll be taking your input into consideration, of course. So this chart is an illustration that provides uh, a shorthand way of looking at uh, what we evaluate when we're looking at service reductions. So the light blue bars on this chart represent the number of hours we have invested in each route in the system, which are the numbers al along the bottom. And as you'll see, at a minimum, we have about 4,000 hours a year invested in each route, but that can go up to as many as about 7,600 uh, on Route 15. The red line is the amount of ridership we're, uh, we're achieving um, on each of those routes. So in this particular illustration, the ideal would be to achieving what, what we're seeing in the routes highlighted here in green. These are our top performing routes, and, and what you see here is that the ridership line matches up pretty well with the bar for the amount of hours invested. So that's what we're really trying to get to. You'll see Route 10 is our productivity all-star, and, and in fact, we're getting more ridership on Route 10 than we would even expect based on the amount of service hours invested. That's the Cottingtown route. It's a, a very good route. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we have some routes where we have a lot of hours invested, but we're not seeing the amount of ridership that really makes a productive route that meets our standards. So we are targeting the routes here highlighted in yellow for some service reductions to try to uh, bring the hours and the ridership in better alignment. So that's Route 2, Bennett Valley, and, and we'll talk about each of these in more detail. Route 15, Stony Point Road, and Route 17, which is Piner. And then we have three more routes that we're looking at for more minor service reductions on um, um, a service hours basis. And um, that's Route 1, which is Mendocino Avenue. That would be for Sunday only. Uh, route 12, Roseland, that would be for Saturday only. And we're not talking about elimination of the route. We're just talking about um, a, a reduction in frequency, which we'll talk about soon. And, and then Route 8, oh, actually, on the Route 1, I, I take that back. On the Route 1, we are talking about eliminating the route, but we'll get to that just for Sunday. Um, and then Route 18, we're talking about just removing a couple of trips from, um, from weekday service. And then finally, there are two more routes that we're looking at more uh, for a priority on on-time performance, which are um, Route 6 and Route 14. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Ivory, who's going to walk through each of these routes and, and discuss exactly what area that route covers and what we're proposing in terms of reductions. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon. Um, as Rachel said, we're going across the board. There's not going to be much that's not touched, but it's only going to consist of 5% of our total service that we're currently providing. Uh, the Route 1. Over the last, after we identified, you can see that the system average identifies the Route 1 as the second lowest performer in the system on, the, on Sunday. So we had the drivers doing surveys for the last couple of months and counting how many passengers were actually carrying up over Sinead and over Fountain Grove. We do five trips a day with the Route 1 and we're carrying an average of six passengers all day long. That's right, right around $100 a trip and carrying six people, it just, it's, that's just really kind of a no-brainer. So we are proposing to stop serving the Sinead portion, well, the whole thing on Sunday. And all of that will be covered. Mendocino Avenue is still covered with the Route 14 and the Route 10 that come inbound and go outbound on it. So everything is duplicative service with the exception of the hill. And our proposal is just to remove that from the, the service on Sundays. So you see it goes up over, we got low ridership, and then everything is really already covered on Mendocino Avenue where, it, where it's important on the Sundays. Uh, the second one, well, this is the Route 12, and this would be a Saturday change. And this, it's on Saturdays, it's the second lowest performing route. Now we changed this route three or, was it four years ago, Steve? 2008. 2008. We increased it because it did have good ridership. It was running once an hour, so we increased its frequency to th every 30 minutes and saw no corresponding change in ridership whatsoever. So we proposed to reduce it back to the one hour performance time, and uh, that will bring up our, our productivity numbers to make it where we need it above that red line. change frequency to 60 minutes and eliminate the low productivity. And we have the Route 2, the Route 15, and the Route 18 all below our average. And this is on the weekdays. 
The Route 17 is, we can't keep it on time. Currently runs for 45 minutes and it just never does get back into the trans mall on time. You, you can't depend on this route to get you where you need to go or to know when it's gonna show up where you're at. So we're proposing to change that to a 60 minutes run time, give it that extra 15 minutes to recover. And hopefully that will take care of the productivity. People are not gonna go stand around next to a pole and wait for that bus to show up. The Route 2, same thing. It's it, out there running, it runs out in Bennett Valley, and the only time that it actually does a good productivity is at school bell times. So we're proposing to cut it back to 60 minute service, and depending on how it's impacted at the school times, we, we have hours available to uh, compensate for that. The Route 15, uh, just low productivity, it runs back and forth from Southwest Community Park to Cottingtown. If we reduce this by 30 minutes, make it a, a, a one hour route, all of its service generators are covered by other routes. If you look at Southwest Park, the 12 and the 19 both go there. Uh, Safeway on Marlow, the 11 goes there. So there's, it, we're not taking any service generators out of this. It, it uh, is fully covered by other routes, so it's uh, going to make that a 60-minute route proposed. And the Route 18, it's our, our circulator. It goes all the way around the community, hits most of the, the senior residential facilities, all the shopping centers, but nobody rides this thing the first hour in the morning or the last hour in the afternoon. We've done numerous surveys on this route, and it, they're, they're just not getting out of bed. So we're proposed just to take the first trip of the day and the last trip of the day off of this route. And uh, that should really, because it is a very popular route as we went to Bethlehem Towers and some of the other facilities, they, they love this route. They don't have to think about doing transfers. They don't have to think about anything but getting on this route, go to the store, get back on the route, and it gets them back home. And they're, they're just, they love it. So it'll probably be one of our top performers at one of these days. So we're just taking the first two hours off and, and those hours will be available for other service if, if needed. So. And the Route 6, uh, can't keep it on time. It's a great route. It goes all the way out to, to Fulton Road and around and comes back downtown on 3rd Street and West College. But we can't make that loop in, in the amount of time we're providing, so we're proposing to make it a 45 minute route and that should take care of it. People can, can depend on what time that bus is gonna get there for them. Okay, so now you look at the city of Santa Rosa and, and if you use Santa Rosa Avenue, Mendocino Avenue corridor, it's, the routes are split pretty well evenly on both sides of that corridor. But we're gonna show you what it looks like as we, we're gonna fly in each one of these routes now, Joy, did you do these like that we... If we just advance through, I, we okay. would definitely need the last one to see it again. Okay, there's the Route 17. That's going to be... We're just increasing the, the time allotted for that route. Mm -hmm. Route 1, reducing Sunday service. Route 2, reducing the amount of time that it... it we're going to take it, make it a 60-minute route. And 15, make it a 60 minute route. And 12, just uh, reduce it by 30 minutes on Sunday, Saturday. And route six, and give it more time to run that loop, 45 minutes. And what do we got there? That was 18, 18 thank you, boy. Yeah, you just take one hour off in the morning, one hour in the evening. And it brings, if you look at your, your blue bars and the red line now, it really, really stabilizes our productivity. It makes it look like something that we could be proud of. And the on-time performance will be to the point where our clientele will not be standing out there wondering where we're at. So. And uh, what's this? You're going to do this for me? Yeah, sure. Um, 
Yeah, Thank this, you. this just sort of gets back, yeah, thanks Michael. This gets back to the earlier issue that we were discussing about restructuring service and we just wanted to point out here in this illustration there, there would still be some routes that um, are, are a little bit out of line in terms of the investment of hours. And we are not proposing uh, changes to these routes at this time, that's uh, Route 5 Santa Rosa Avenue, um, right at 18 be beyond the couple of uh, trips removed. Uh, we're not um, considering restructuring or any other changes at this time. And then Route 19, which is the South City Connector, which runs from Southwest Community Park over to Santa Rosa Avenue. These routes all sort of um, are a little bit tangled up in each other, for lack of a better description. And what we really see here is a need to look at the Santa Rosa Avenue corridor service in a holistic way and do some restructuring of that service so that it's more efficient and it serves the riders in a better way. So these are three routes that we are planning to look at in the coming year for some restructuring as a starting point. So we haven't included them for, for February because we think they do need a little bit more of a public process and further study and consideration before we come in with um, a proposal. So just in summary, um, as Joy discussed, the proposed fare increase and, and transfer policy changes close about half of our million dollar gap. The proposed service reductions would close the other um, half a million of that million dollar gap. Um, we also wanted to mention, we didn't include these in the earlier slides because we, we didn't want to overpromise to the public or to anyone else, but one thing we are looking at is whether we could find a way to have limited 30 minute peak service on the three routes that we're proposing for the, the change on weekdays from 30 minute service to 60 minute service. So for Route 2 Bennett Valley, Route 15 Stony Point Road, and Route 17 Piner, we would be looking at hopefully being able to retain some level of 30 minute service in the peak of the peak so we could get people to work in school with a little bit more of a frequent service. And so that's something we're really um, looking at for those, those three routes to um, ease the pain a little bit for uh, the riders. And then finally, as we've mentioned a few times in this presentation, we will be looking at restructuring routes to improve service and efficiency in the future, starting with the three routes um, I just mentioned and then moving throughout the system um, as part of our long-range planning process. So just to wrap up our presentation, the next steps uh, are to make adjustments to our proposals based on your feedback here today, and we'll be continuing to sort of sift through the public feedback we got just last week um, to see if we can address some of the concerns that were raised. Um, the draft short-range transit plan, including these proposals as well as the larger service plan, um, will be released in mid-October for public review. We're currently scheduled to come back to you for public hearing on November 13th. Um, adoption could happen at that meeting or it could happen at a later meeting in December. And um, on whatever is approved, ultimately, in terms of our proposals, we would be immediately begin doing outreach to the public uh, and marketing to let people know about the changes and make sure that no one has a surprise on the 1st of February when any fare or service changes would go into effect. So that concludes our presentation, and the whole team is here to answer questions. Thank you. I, I just had one uh, question for clarification. We talked on some of these routes about, uh, I'm not sure what words were used, maybe uh, the, anyway, their inability to be on time. What causes that? Is it traffic congestion, other factors? What, what is that? Steve, do you want to talk about that? Or sure. I mean, I, it's a combination of factors, but I think Steve would be the best person to address that. Thank you. Right. The main thing I look at when I'm looking at a route and, whether, and its ability to keep on time is average speed, where I have a, this route must travel a certain distance. And in order to maintain its ability to, to be on time, uh, the industry standard is somewhere between, you know, 11 to 14 miles an hour. Uh, a route like uh, 6, if you look at a 30-minute, well, a 25-minute cycle time, actually, with a 5-minute recovery, um, we're asking that bus to maintain an average speed of 18 miles an hour, which is virtually impossible in transit land. So by extending the cycle time by, you know, 10 minutes or so, it gives it what it needs to stay on time. Um, some routes, of course, are going to need a little more. They're going to need 10 miles an hour, 11 miles an hour as an average to stay on time based on where they go, the amount of traffic lights they encounter, um, the, the loads they encounter, and things like this. So th there's a lot of factors that go into trying to create a route that's going to stay on time at least most of the day. And at the same time, keeping it safe. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Councilman Ross Dupre? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to echo um, the mayor's comment about keeping it safe. Um, we all uh, saw in today's uh, Press Democrat the letter to the editor the concern about keeping it safe, you know, when they were pursuing the, the car chase. Um, I know that the bus drivers have an incredible responsibility to the riders, but also everyone else they come in contact with. 
uh, to me, they do just an exemplary job. I wanted to thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, it went really quickly. I know that you're all under the pressure to keep presentations short, but I know that there are some people in the audience um, here and also at home who, when we talk too quickly, they have a difficult time understanding. So I'm really concerned about you know, the rapidity of performance. So uh, that, that's just, um, just something else. Um, I did have a few questions. Um, we're in a very high-tech a new environment, and I really appreciate all the work that's gone into that. I'm sure that it will, um, you know, be given to our techies, um, but in a, a couple of the slides, I noticed that for those viewers at home, one of them being my husband, um, where we have these beautiful, like the service plan analysis, um, where it Let's see, uh, these are not numbered pages, but it's probably about the six page in um, service plan analysis after service modifications. Um, the light blue compared to the green, there was no difference that was distinguishable. Um, that's not a big deal to me, but it may be a big deal to some people. Um, because I've got, you know, the wonderful hard copy, which, you know, I'm always worried about trees and being decimated, but, you know, it came through as being important. Um, another um, question I have is, and maybe I missed it, but I didn't see the one that we have, and that was about the Roseland, so uh, I don't know if for some reason that slide was not presented or I just missed it. Another one is about how do you keep your stats? Um, is it all based on money that is put into the fare box? Which I know that sometimes people put in, let's say a quarter instead of a dime, and that would, you know, askew the um, stats. Um, I'm quite sure that it doesn't mean that a driver has to do a paper pencil kind of a thing, because they have already oh so many things to do. Another question I had is um, the bus driver has so many things that they're dealing with and I'm wondering, I'm sure I'm not the only one who wonders, what does a bus driver do when a person, for example, I know when traveling in another country and my language is going to be English and theirs would not be, and I want to go to, let's say, how do I get to a certain region and that bus driver has no idea what I'm talking about because my pronunciation is absolutely nil. So how do our bus drivers cope with someone who may be only um, able to sign uh, language um, and or have another primary language? I think I'm about at the end of my queries. Oh, I see, on um, your fourth slide when you talked about the public meetings, one was through May 12, you had about 55 people. One, you had a series of three meetings in September of 12, and you said about 60 people. My guess is that they probably were the same base of the original 55, although maybe you reached a completely different group. I'd, I'd just like some answers yeah, to those. Councilmember uh, Bossipar, you have a number of questions there. Yes. I'm not sure which ones uh, you want some answers. I'm going to let them more, more grapple comments. with what they want to answer. Well, I, and I, I if understand they want to respond <laughs> offline, that's fine too. That, that, okay, that, so that's, that's what I'm trying to clarify because those are a lot of questions with a right. lot of detail. So are there specific things that you want an answer for at this moment right now for them? Maybe we can ask those questions I'd one at a time. I, they're a very sharp group. I think they could probably, you know, bullet to answer many of those things very quickly. And I have a feeling that I'm not the only one who's wondering about these things. Okay, let, let's, see, let's see if they were able to capture all that, so. Right. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful work you do. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Wysocki. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation to staff. Uh, Anita, at the very beginning of the presentation, you talked about a redesign of the system. And yet, I just see modifications to existing routes. Can you elaborate on that? Okay, gotcha. So you'd anticipate, or the council and the public at that time would anticipate an integration with SMART as well as Sonoma County?
there also be a discussion as to integrating any proposed day passes with Smart and Sonoma County as well, or is that a little more problematic? Okay, appreciate that. How many routes do we have that serve the junior college? Four. Is because I've always loved the idea of uh, approaching the junior college for a semester fee. They can ride all the area buses, and I would love to see that effort continue or start along with Sonoma County Transit and perhaps SMART. Uh, it's more of a comment than a question. We did that two years ago. Um, we worked with the junior college, and what they gave us was we calculated how many passes they bought from us on an annual basis, and they gave us that money up front. And what we did was we issued an unlimited amount of passes. They could, anybody could get a pass and ride for free, and they chose to not keep doing that program. Did they, did they cite a reason why, or? they've quit doing that because of their funding issues so I'm not sure if that was one of the reasons why they quit they probably have to pay for that big garage they have doing there. yeah the big parking garage but, right uh, joy you also talked about a fare box ratio uh, could you go over that again what would you, you went real quickly as to and I missed sure. or um, this has a short cord the the fare box recovery is the ratio is the ratio of the fare box revenue to the operating cost so a 10 percent fare box recovery means you're recovering about 10 percent of your operating costs from your fares and there are guidelines from the federal and state yeah, government it's, it's actually state for transportation development act and it's 20 percent for the fixed route and 10 percent for the paratransit okay. service okay and then lastly what i would like to see is uh on your California Transit Association, all these various uh, operators throughout the state, some of them don't quite seem comparable, and, they, and there's three, San Luis Obispo, uh, Davis, and Santa Cruz that jump out as being really analogous to us. Do we have an idea, because those are college towns and roughly the same size, and maybe there's one or two more. Can we get an average from comparable operators as opposed to some of these larger systems? Because I don't, to me, it looks like apples and oranges. And then lastly, I'd like to have a discussion with you. Some of us are aware that uh, there's some proposed changes at, at Warwick Hospital, so it concerns me that Route 2 would be diminished because what might be going in there, they're going to need the bus. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Was anybody aware of that? That's, that's the first we've heard of those changes. We'll follow up and get some information. I'd be, I'd be happy to have that discussion with you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Bartley. We, oh, okay. Council Member Goring. I have a question regarding the reduction of service on Route 1, which serves uh, Sutter Hospital. And though I recognize that Sutter is uh, going to be moving, they're still there now. And mental health outpatient uh, facility is there and a number of other county services there that may or may not need service on a Sunday. And I'm sure, obviously, your survey has taken note of the ridership on a Sunday, but that is a facility that is serving the lower income population, and they would have no other way to access those facilities in that location. There has been uh, employees doing shift work also at Agilent and Medtronics, but I'm not sure that they actually have a great number of employees that would use the service on a Sunday. So I, I, I'm just a little concerned about the total elimination of service on a Sunday for that route. Okay. What's the question? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this, this is one that is a tough one because that's the only component of what we're proposing that is an elimination as opposed to a reduction in frequency. And while the ridership is very low and we've been doing counts on Sundays to see the ons and offs specifically at Sutter and, and there's there have been about five or six a day, um, you know, we did also hear from the public that uh, even though people, we didn't hear anyone in the public meeting say I'm going there for work, I need to get there every Sunday, but um, people were a little uncomfortable with the idea of having no way to get there on a Sunday. So I, I, that, that was feedback we heard as well. Um, it's hard, you know, this, it's important to have feedback from you folks on this issue. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it's hard to justify the cost of running that route for the level of ridership, but um, not everything we do is strictly based on the bottom line. So um, we also have lifeline services that we provide and need to provide. So I, I think that's you know uh, something that that we would seek guidance on as well. I, I okay, I'll go ahead. Uh, I did uh, talk to uh, one of the coordinators at Vista Health, which is on Round Barn. Um, she was quite concerned when she first saw the notice, and then I asked her if they saw if they had appointments scheduled on Sunday, and they don't. So she was really quite relieved to, to hear that. So we could certainly check with Sutter and see if they do have appointment scheduled or if it's just emergency use that. That, that, that would be affected and and I would check with uh, some of the county I know they have the public health facilities there they have the mental health facilities there I would outreach to them uh, it, it's one of our hilliest areas as you in the bus really know and for those of us on bicycles really know it, so to suggest to folks that they just use bikes or walking um, doesn't make a lot of sense I know that I've had discussions with uh, Vista and perhaps Kaiser, preliminarily just looking at a some kind of circulator bus that might round robin uh, for some of the healthcare facilities with the new uh, location for Sutter, Kaiser, um, Vista, and we might be proactive in outreaching to those areas uh, or those uses to see if there is a need for a circulator bus um, and how we could accommodate that even though it's outside of our service area with the new Sutter Hospital. And I think some of us suggested that loudly and clearly to the managers and the uh, executives of Sutter, but it is what it is. But um, there will be, and probably is, an emerging need for us to consider more circulation among medical facilities. And I don't know whether that is a 24-7 or seven days a week or five days a week or something, but we should be proactive in that as well. But I am concerned about the elimination of service. And maybe there is a way that Sutter and or some of the major use users along that route could be more proactive with their employees and especially but certainly visitors to increase ridership rather than just responding to uh, a change or a decline in in ridership thank you thank you council member hours i just want to say thanks for a, a very logical and, and seemed well thought out presentation so You've given us the tools, I think, to to move through this system, and it, it, it was a good one. Thank you very much. And Mr. Vice Mayor, you had a question? Thank you, Mayor. Um, what kind of reduction in revenues or ridership do you expect right right after the the proposed increases, if any, uh, historically? And when do you when do they generally recover after people kind of? get used to it and, and I first of all I want to appreciate your creativity and flexibility and, and you probably showed some restraint in your recommendations as well for the fare box so uh, I, I'm just curious as what what's what's a little bit of the fallout that you might expect the the past history of city bus stretching back to when I was here before is it seemed like we could raise fares almost with impunity and not see a loss in ridership I think that's because of the large number of our riders that are dependent on transit the um, part of when we said, you know, creativity and new ideas is the, the transfer policy, the change in transfer policy is something that we haven't tried and we don't, haven't been able to find many people who've done it. And so we don't know, I mean, we don't really know what the impact is going to be with that one. We could make enough people irritated that they don't ride the bus. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but that's the one that I think is probably the riskiest. 
uh, the there's typically um, some ridership elasticity when you make some route changes and certainly I think when you move from a 30 minute frequency to a 60 minute you're going to lose some of the people the commuters for instance who just can't wait for an hour it's just too hard to, to schedule um, those typically aren't the people that are riding those buses when we we didn't show you the the work that these guys did in looking at hour by hour ridership on those routes and um, we didn't see huge numbers during the commute or that would indicate to us that there are people who have that pattern that would be with it moving to an hour would be uh, have a huge impact so in the end I don't we don't anticipate a major hit on the ridership at all the fare increase may may have a little bit but again it's such a small amount and basically what we heard from the public is we don't like it but we understand you need to do it and you haven't done it in a long time and the, the transfer policy we've given you the best estimate that we could about the impact on that Great. So I, I, does that answer your question it does indeed I appreciate it thank you mr. Bartley yeah just um, the comments regarding the um, elimination of the Sunday service which I have to I have to say I'm very impressed with how little impact there is to the system uh, given the situation we're in I mean it it, it comes back to uh, showing how important sales tax is to our city and the things it does that a lot of people don't realize. Um, obviously, if we were to somehow get not eliminate that service, it's going to have a trickle down into a bunch of other things, which I suspect will prolong. I'm, I'm assuming it'll be sharing the pain or imposing greater pain on any particular one. You must have looked at it. Mm -hmm. um, and why did you choose to eliminate this one? I mean, there must have been a more compelling reason or a compelling reason why you didn't look elsewhere. The, the package that we presented is our best proposal to you based on ridership and productivity. Um, we have a pocket full of other things we could do and if, if we needed to that will impact more riders. The, the Route 1, and, and that Sutter issue is one that we've really struggled with, it's five or six people getting total ons and offs. So if you assume somebody's making a round trip, it's three people. It's not clear that that's the case because we don't know. And when push came to shove, as, as kind of unpalatable as it is to not serve a hospital seven days a week, it was the one place that had the least impact on our riders. Um, we have lots of others that are small pieces that we can change. Um, if we need to and if the council directs us to the other thing is the council can say don't make that change on on route one and Don't make any additional changes. We won't hit the million dollar mark And that has a kind of an impact in out years on the budget And if we're really lucky sales tax turns around if we're not so lucky We'll have to deal with it in the next round of service cuts So there's any number of options that, that we can follow based on where you all want us to go but um, obviously, and you're, and, and you're coming to us at this point because of the time frame and the complexity of the, of the long range plan, which I assume is going to be a, um, you know, uh, we've had the discussion before that we, we're dealing right now with a, a hub and spoke sort of transit system um, to uh, Council Member Gorin's comment about connecting all these future things that could very well be a completely different type of system, I am assuming. That, that's absolutely right and the one thing we fail to make really clear is we don't intend to wait four years to make another bring another set of recommendations to you for service adjustments um, you know the biggest expense for us when we do it is basically printing the map and the schedules so we're looking at at least every six months and maybe more often to come in and keep tweaking the system um, if we made a mistake in something that we recommend and that you accept our recommendation we'll be back here in a few months saying man that was not a good idea we need to fix it so we're not going to let this languish and I don't want to leave you with the impression that we're done doing this kind of work once we start the long-range transit plan this will be an ongoing effort for us and we'll be back here regularly so you're not facing big pieces like this again. Okay, thank you. I appreciate uh, your hard work and your uh, candor and acknowledging. Thank you. Councilmember Bostopray. Yes, um, three points. Um, one is that um, I think the public bus is one of the most significant socioeconomic devices of equaling uh, the many issues that we all face. 
um, and you've recognized that you need the council input because you know that not all the people who attend the public meetings are you know, going to be representative of the riders. For whatever reason, the riders are busy with their families, they're not able to come to public meetings for whatever reason. So uh, I'm glad that you're giving us all this input and opportunity um, for additional input. Um, we as a city council used to meet with Santa Rosa City Schools. Santa Rosa City Schools is just one of the feeders to our middle schools and high schools. Um, and you serve, you know, pretty large geographic distribution. Um, when I spoke about the socioeconomic issue, I'm reminded uh, yesterday I attended a luncheon, Luther Burbank Home and Garden Volunteers, and one of the volunteers is a person who works during the week making electronic equipment, and on the weekend he volunteers um, at the Luther Burbank Home and Gardens, and, and uh, he rides from the Northeast, and he depends on the bus to get him there, you know, 8.15 a.m. He could afford a car, but because of his environmentalist uh, beliefs, he believes in taking public transit. Also, he said, much less stress, and it's always on time, but of course we know that there are reasons why sometimes our buses, for safety reasons, are not on time or whatever. Um, but you really are the equalizer effect, and you know, my hat is really off to you on that. But with the Santa Rosa City Schools, I mean, we can't address all of the public schools and, you know, to meet with them. But I'm hoping that with the new superintendent um, that we will um, reorganize and meet again, um, and maybe it's only quarterly, with Santa Rosa City Schools. I am still very upset when I drive by any of the high schools and I see their parking lots are just flooded with cars. And I think of the environmental impacts on that. Um, and so, uh, you know, it may be that at least one of those meetings, we do have someone from transit um, to meet with us to talk about, um, you know, the, the positive aspects. And it's also going to increase ridership, therefore fare box, blah, 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 blah. I, I, I just think that this is an opportunity that I would like to pursue. The other comment is about the junior college. Um, I really would like to see us pursue again this, I don't know if debacle is too harsh a word, but um, I, I think that there's an opportunity to try to work with the junior college. Um, I know that the email that we all received from Mr. Bertelbaugh, um, yes, it's in the future about the overcrossing, uh, yes, it's in the future about SMART, um, the stations, but I would like to see us do some proactive planning with transit and with the city council as to how we are going to address the needs of students who represent a variety of the socioeconomic levels, represent a variety of ages um, uh, on the overcrossing, on the SMART, and on the existing ways of getting to the junior college. So thank you. Councilmember Gordon. Just one final comment. Uh, the, um, the number of comments that I hear are not related to the to the fair size. I, I think it's as you demonstrated pretty pretty modest. It is the sheer amount of time that it takes to get across town and uh, two hours to get across town, as they say, their words, is unacceptable. And so what we're proposing here is to decrease the frequency of a number of routes that would potentially increase the time that it would take to get across town. So I guess I, I need to hear uh, in the future an analysis or some descriptor. If someone from Bennett Valley were going to Cottingtown uh, at certain times of the day, how long would it take them? Someone from Fulton Road to get to Sutter, how long would it take them to go through the transit hub and to get there with the increased uh, f uh, amount of time that we have scheduled on those routes? And if it moves beyond the two hours, then we will have accomplished nothing. And it, our bus system 
really will only serve those folks who are totally unable to drive. We will be encouraging everybody else to hop in their cars. Mr. Mayor, if I may, that issue is exactly why we want to look at redesigning the system. When you have a system that focuses primarily on the downtown uh, with some satellite transfer opportunities, there is almost no way that you get from one end of town to the other in less than a couple of hours. Um, but one of the pieces that we've tried the hardest on is that gets far worse if you miss your connection when the buses are not running on time. And we're trying to rectify that. That will probably have a better impact than the um, offsetting tough impact of, of reducing the frequencies because people will know when to leave home. They'll know that when they get to the transfer point, their bus is going to be there. They won't have missed it and they can get where they're going. So um, I'm, I'm not real hopeful that we can design it, that we, given the system we have right now, that we can really address that two hour problem other than try and make the transfers better. So there's a little more certainty in what they do. It's going to take some other major work to redesign the system. And the hard part of that is, is it probably means they have to transfer more than once to make it happen, but hopefully they can make it happen more quickly. Now, the one you didn't mention is just north-south on the east side of town to get from Bennett Valley to Rincon Valley. That's a brutal one. That probably takes two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. So it's something we're really aware of, but I think we're so confined with our existing system that it's not something we can easily solve. Well. Uh, uh, again, hats off to you. Good luck with this. And I, I know that this has been an issue for a number of years. Uh, we did have a proposed vehicle registration fee that would help us make up some of the revenue losses to our transit system that we've been absorbing for the past couple of years. Sadly, we know that that did not pass, and here we are faced with the reality. No one likes the choices, but... Um, you're doing the best you can, we're doing the best we can, and we recognize that we're gonna, we will, uh, I'm firmly convinced, lose even more bus ridership um, by, by the changes that we are being forced to contemplate. So thanks. Anita, I wanna th thank you and your team for the presentation, I, I, and I think we appreciate that we're not looking for a one-time fix and that you're willing to continue to look at this and make modifications as needed. Uh, because sometimes you try to fix something, maybe a new problem pops up that we have to address. So I think we all recognize that. So thank you for the effort that you've put into this. Uh, Mr. Bertelbaugh, you've been sitting patiently. Come on up and uh, make your comments, please. Thank you, Mary Alvarez and members. Uh, Steve Bertelbaugh with Friends of Smart. Uh, we're looking forward to the uh, integration of city bus and smart in another couple of years uh, and in the meantime we've been watching the declining revenues with a good deal of concern I was happy to hear staff talk about the idea that six-month tweaks to the system are in order and I really appreciate the level of analysis that's gone in thus far what I would like to see, and I hope we can see it in the short-range plan, is some level of, of funding that we're going to need in order to accomplish the kinds of changes that we're going to need to make in order to make the system truly uh, useful to the rider who is choosing to ride as opposed to the transit-dependent rider. We really need to attract the commuters, other people who will ride out of choice and who don't need to take uh, two hours to get across town, who aren't willing to do that. Uh, so what we're gonna be looking for over the next, uh, we hope in this, in this plan, but certainly in, in the process of getting into the long range plan is a sense of what we need to include in these various measures that come along that are going to enhance our, our income side of things and not always looking at cutting service to match the available income, but being able to offer people some options in terms of if you're willing to spend a little more money, this is what you're going to be able to get. So we're looking for that sort of analysis as, as soon as we can get it. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rurla. So that concludes your presentation, and we appreciate it, and we'll uh, see you soon with, uh, with more information. So that concludes our study session. Let's take a five-minute five minute, uh, stretch, and we'll get ready with our regular session. Check, 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 check. One, two, one, two.
and two. One, two, one, two. One, two. One, two, one, two. Can you hear me good, Mark? One, two, one, two. Yeah. One, two, one, two. Better. Testing one, two, one, two. Check one, two, one, two, three. You got a little headroom there. One, two, I've still got about 20%. Maybe 20. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, call our meeting to order, please. Uh, we'll begin with the announcement of roll call. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. Uh, council member Gorin has stepped away from the dais. Thank you. And we'll uh, report on our closed session. Um, the uh, council met in uh, closed session for uh, two items as listed on the agenda, and uh, no action was taken at the conclusion of that section. And um, then subsequently, the council met at 3 p.m. in a study session to hear about the 2012 short-range transit plan and the proposed fare structure. 
and no action was taken on that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, and today we have three proclamations. Uh, the first proclamation is going to be for the San Rosa International Film Festival. And uh, actually one of the films being shown uh, w during this uh, event is very appropriate for today, September 11th. Uh, today is a day of remembrance, uh, I think a day that we will probably never forget. Uh, but we do have here today Stephen Ashton, uh, co-founder, uh, I believe, and director of the San Rosa International Film Festival to accept this proclamation. And uh, Stephen, I'll ask you and maybe some of your group to come up and talk to us about what's going to be going on during this, uh, this uh, event that's coming back to Santa Rosa. And neither of you are Steve. Not Steve. Okay. <laughs> And Suzanne, Ed Mister, Ed Mister. So um, I think we have a little bit of a. Can we just say a few words yeah, and then we're going to no, pass I it you, on? I want I just, you to share with us what's going on. Oh, Jesus! This, this has got to be one of the best film festivals in the world. I have to tell you, and I'm so proud that Santa Rosa uh, has accepted it and embraced it. And I know you have in your own way, and all of you have. And thank you so much. Um, it really is a representation of the pulse of our community. And we have brought together so many nonprofits and other organizations along the way. So you have to go and see the program. You gotta come out and see, the, see some of the films so you get a, a real sense of what this is all about. Um, and just thank you so much, City of Santa Rosa, for your support. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm gonna turn this over to Suzanne. She's gonna tell you a little bit about cinema and art, a duet dialogue which is unique to this film festival, has never been done in the world. And then, of course, the Vets Fest, which has never been done in the world. And this is a celebration of our veterans, and Herb Williams will speak to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Suzanne Edminster. I'm a local artist. I have a studio in Sofa, south of A Street, another upcoming area. and. Uh, this is an absolutely unique thing. Cinema is art, art is cinema, and the idea that we bring together two kinds of visual art to make something new. So I reviewed a film upside down from India that has been rarely seen, and as a painter, I did a response to that film. My painting will be shown at the opening of the film, but also um, all the artists, you can see them at Glazer Center, um, this Friday between 5 and 7, there's reception. So, upside down. Very nice. Pretty wild, huh? I, live, uh, I lived in India, so I have a right to speak to India, I think. I lived there for two years in Bangalore, which is like the most developed part of India. It's a film about a little boy who is from a very rural part of India, and he gets a, he, uh, gets a chance to go see the circus in Mumbai, and uh, his world is turned upside down. The top part of it has traditional uh, designs for, that are found in houses and clothing in his part of India, and then the bottom is more the chaos and joy of the circus and modern India. So thanks for supporting this innovative program. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Mayor, as a member of the council, my name's Herb Williams. Uh, a year ago, a man by the name of Kevin Mencio, who my son designated to look after my granddaughter's finances, did a bicycle trip from his gravesite to 9-11 in New York City by bicycle in 93 days and arrived on the celebration of 9-11 and today is 9-11. Um, also significant is that he joined the Army because he was there working at Saks in New York when it occurred and he put all of his money into trust and joined the Army. My son was his mother visiting the site and said, I have to go too. And they met in Iraq on Jesse's first tour and became friends ever since. Since then, they did that bicycle trip. 
they had a uh, videographer through a grant, and it, when they saw the rushes, when they got back, the the uh, producer of Godfather Three said, "I want to do a documentary on this," and it won fourth place at the Seattle Film Festival with 79 other documentary films. It is one of the links and is being shown twice this next Sunday during the film festival. And Lou Ratto and myself purchased uh, 300 tickets that we're giving out to veterans so they can attend it. What I really like about this is that the originators of the film festival turned and into Sunday into what they call the Vets Fest. And they have the Patriot Guard are showing up in your parking lot at 11.30 next Sunday for a parade downtown to the Glazer Center to the opening of The Long Ride Home, which is a film about Jesse's friend going to New York. And I need to tell you, and I've never had the opportunity before, and when does anyone in politics not take advantage of an opportunity to thank the people of the city for they gave $36,000 to my granddaughter's education fund, which I just think was phenomenal. And he has now raised with that foundation over $180,000 for her, and so I made him stop. And on this trip, they raised another $120,000, which they're donating to other families of children, the children of families of the fallen. So 9-11 is a great day for us to be here under the circumstances that it's sort of serendipitous that we're here today, we invite you all to come. And if you're a veteran, I don't care what part of the party you're in, you get a free ticket. All you got to do is ask for it. And we thank you very much for making the decoration today for the film festival. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, we're going to have a proclamation for Creek Week, and we have Denise uh, Cadman, who's here to receive this proclamation from Vice Mayor John Sawyer. Thanks for being here, Denise. Hello. Uh, you know, it's, it's, this is, um, doesn't really do the, the Creek's justice, you know, a, a, a proclamation of this size, and all of the work and all of the volunteers that d dedicate so much of their time and their lives to to protecting and maintaining our creeks and being great stewards. Most people don't even know how many miles of creeks we have. Okay. So why don't you give us a little, like, a little background as to what's happening in, in, in Creeks Week. Creek sure. Week. <laughs> and uh, you know, so we, we're public in here what's going on. Sure. Well, there's an incredible week planned um, starting on September 15th and going through the following weekend. And there's activities every day and evening that involve creeks. There's something for everyone. Uh, it's a great lineup, and I'll plug my own Laguna Walk and Talk on September 22nd, which is going to be a lot of fun. All the information is available at srcity.org slash creekweek. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, and I, I saw and Alistair's here, too. And I, I think of him as Mr. Creek, but I don't, I don't know if that's you know, something. It's not an official title. But it's always been a pleasure to, to serve on the, on the Waterways Committee. We usually, usually get uh, a, a lot more information than, than the public because of being in, on that particular committee. But um, hopefully, the word will get out, and people will be able to take advantage of, your, of these yeah. various activities, because they certainly, the Creeks deserve it. Yeah. Thank you. And Alistair, why don't you come on down? Uh, another great body of water that we have in Sonoma County is the Russian River. Uh, provides water for agriculture, recreation, uh, wildlife, etc. And every now and then we've got to get in there and clean it up. So we have a Russian River cleanup uh, day coming up. Or So you can tell us a little bit about, about sure. this project as well. Right. Um, 
September 22nd is the Russian River cleanup, and from Cloverdale down to Duncan's Mills, there are various cleanups from canoe from the shore on the beaches. And uh, last year, 250 people turned out, and they spent one day cleaning up, and then others came back on the Sunday to kind of sort out recyclables, get all the tires sorted out, and everything ready to be disposed of. Um, and all the information you need is at Russian River Cleanup, one word, dot org. And, uh, you know, with this nice weather we're having, it should be a great day on the river. And I'd, I'd like to thank you, Mayor, and, and all members of the council just for recognizing the Russian River and acknowledging the, the clean water and the wildlife habitat and recreation, everything that provides to the county, the watershed, and, and our city. Thank you, Alistair. And I think that the thanks goes to you, too, for your leadership, because you've been there year after year after year to help keep both our creeks and the river clean. So thank you for all that you do for our community. Oh, you're welcome. And the thing is, Vice Mayor Sawyer knows that the creek stuff, that it's not just our stormwater and creeks team doing this, but we work with utilities department, public works, police, uh, parks, and just about everybody in the city to pull this off. Okay, and uh, no, we're not going to have one of the films here at this chamber. It seems like it is, but uh, and that's not a, that's not exactly a new car smell that we're smelling either. But it's probably a little bit worse than that. Uh, but uh, we're going to have a little bit of a, st a study session today, right, to talk about the new technology here. I think we have uh, Eric McKendrick going to be doing this for us. Yeah, we have um, uh, a few staff briefings, and they will be brief. Um, we we'll try to keep them to five minutes or less. Um, our first one is a report on the council chamber audio and video updates. And um, Eric McHenry will make that presentation, and he has a team of technicians supporting him this evening, making adjustments. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Um, I'm really pleased today to uh, present to you the new audio video system in the city council chambers. This has been a project that we've been trying to do for the last probably five years. and. Uh, with the availability of money from the state franchises for audio video franchises, we were able to completely redo what's in here. So let me take you on a quick walkthrough of what you see in front of you on the different screens. I first though want to introduce uh, Mark Latimer sitting at the table. He's the CEO of the company um, Coda Technology that was a successful bidder. And he and his team were the ones that have spent three weeks here uh, over the council uh, break. And you can see many of them in the pictures here. The other people I'd like to thank is a community media center who is uh, sitting back in that room back there uh, uh, trying to figure out how to use this new equipment and it's great stuff. So what we did is the most amazing thing is the screen. You know, for many years we've had the screen over here on the left. Uh, now it's up here on the front and you can get a sense of what the quality of the uh, audio and video is. Um, just look at this. So we have full high definition content in the council chambers so the presentations are crisp. They actually go out to Comcast and AT&T and our web streaming partner at the same quality. But to this point, we're not yet ready with those providers to actually have high def to the homes. But we're now sending a signal out from the council chambers that's as good as uh, most residents are typically used to getting on their home sets. So the monitor here, and for those in the audience, the monitors here to my right and to my left on the walls those are for the city council only. They are showing exactly what's being shown behind the council, as are the dais monitors. So just like before, what you see in front of you on your monitors and on those two on the wall here are the same as what's on, on the wall back there. We've added another, another monitor, which is on the wall behind the elevator, and you can't see it from where you are, but that's one of the most exciting ones for me. That actually is showing the broadcast feed. So on that monitor over there, and why you'll see people looking at it, is that that actually shows what you see at home. In addition, it also shows the closed caption content. So for the first time ever, we're able to broadcast with live closed captioning. And again, thanks to the media center and the agreement you guys uh, agreed to a number of months ago. But this is our inaugural view of uh, closed captioning. It's going out over the web stream, as well as going out over live broadcasts on Comcast and AT&T. The part, though, that was the most work is the part you can't see. And uh, Mark and his team here are still working on that, and that's to get the signal content from here, 
from the microphones, from the cameras, and from the presentation system, but especially the sound, getting that so it actually sounds right. And as you can imagine, it's one thing to adjust the sound in an empty council chamber, which they've been doing over the last probably two or three days. But now that we have a full council chamber, they're making tweaks on the sound system right now and uh, really appreciate any feedback you have. Uh, we can't hear what you hear over there. And they're sitting there right now so they can hear what's happening kind of right behind them in the middle of the auditorium. So next after this upgrade is we're going over to the utilities field operation to complete the last phase of their project, which will enable similar but less expansive technology such that in an emergency, we can actually live stream and broadcast um, from our emergency operations center, which is over in the city, um, the, the uh, utilities field operation building of, on West College. So it's a pleasure. Please give us your feedback. The next phase of the project, we hope to address the monitors on your desk. We've heard from you that uh, we'd like to get those recessed or done differently. And that's in the next phase of the project, which funds allowed will hopefully start in the early part of the next calendar year. Thank you. Questions for Mr. McHenry. Councilmember Gorin. Wow, this is pretty terrific. When we <laughs> first started uh, talking here, and I think our city manager may have been talking, it was difficult for me to hear her. And now I, you must have raised the volume a little bit so that it's, it's better for me to hear. It f still feels a little echoey. Echoey, it does, yes. Perhaps, and I don't know whether that is going to be part and parcel of who we are and what we're doing, or are you going to tweak that? We'll work on that. In fact, me standing here, I hear it for the first time also. You don't hear it back there, but you hear it right here. So again, those are the things that a full council chamber um, allows us to do, you know, initial room turn on and testing. Even the uh, Green Center did some of that also in their uh, original testing as well, and um, so we're no exception with audio-video balancing. And I know for those of us who are aging, we have a little hearing loss, and I include myself in that. Um, for those folks who, and I know Mr. Hours often uh, has his earphones, um, and for members of the public, it, it, Will the system, the loop system, work for those folks who have the hearing assistance and so it can amplify that? But where are the uh, headphones or other devices uh, for them to take advantage of? Yeah, so the loop system, we have, I'm not sure how many headsets. We have at least a couple. The city clerk can get those to people if they, we have four? We have four. In addition to the loop, as I mentioned, we have live closed captioning going up on the screen. So if even a loop doesn't work, then you can look at the closed captioning up on the screen. But the loop functions as it did before. And in fact, in all of our public buildings where we have meetings, we have the loop system. And we've had that for many years. So for those folks who need access for the headphones, who should they contact? They should contact you. Do we have any explanation in the back of the chamber that headphones are available and they should uh, come and see the city clerk. That's a really good point. I, uh, we don't have that. I don't believe. We'll I think check it, on that. It's Thank on you. the speaker card. It's on the speaker card. When they but sign it, but it, it. Okay. It, it's it, also Miles on. Ferris is saying that it's up there, but we may want to maybe put a sign on the door, uh, suggesting that we have uh, headphones available, mm -hmm. and uh, that would be helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Vostoprek. Thank you very much. Yes, I just wanted to thank everyone, um, you know, in the cooperation with the Community Media Center. I think it's a wise use of funds. Um, the only reason I have my monitor down is because Ann Seeley told me I'm too short, I can't see over it. So if this is going to be recessed, that may help. But, uh, you know, the person who's going to be sitting in this seat after December 12 may be really tall and no problem at all. So I'm sure that you'll adjust to all those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Hours. Yeah, this is a subject that's kind of dear to my ears, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or what's left of them. Uh, it's. It's working. Uh, there's still things. I think there's bugs that you got to got to work out with, with this system. Okay. Uh, you know, it was more than a year that I was here before I was aware that th there were headphones available. So, um, it is that's a great idea that you had. And it, we, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people like me that are getting old and they don't hear and they've had uh, done bad things to themselves over the years. And and uh, it's really good that that this system works as well as it does. So, thank good. you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions from council? I have one card on this item. Uh, Mr. Osborne?
Jack, I was born 5636 Del Monte Court. Haven't improved the sound at all. I'll tell you what the problem is, and I've been saying it for a long while. You have no mic control. You people talk over this way, or you talk over this way, and you don't talk into this. Now, the problem lies in the fact that unless you have someone down there riding the gain control, even at home I can't hear people when I have the volume on my TV set up. And the same, and the same thing here, unless you have mic, I could have barely hear him said because he was up here and the mic was down here. It's, it's a question, either you have to have someone riding the mic control, controlling the gain of the audio on the transmission into the speaker, you will never have a satisfactory audio system because we have soft speakers like Marsha and, and then we have loudspeakers, people who speak loud and things. But unless you know you have to speak into the microphone and you don't, if you're speaking like this, the public can't hear you. We deaf people have trouble hearing you, almost deaf. And it's a problem even at home because the audio level changes when there's no one riding the gain control mixing the system. I hope you take what I mean seriously, but I've been saying this for almost 30 years, <laughs> that this is the politician's friend. Make love to it so the people can hear you. <laughs> I, I, if you don't want us to hear you, just back away and not say it. Thank you very much. I might be staying here longer, may not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. I think the folks might want your name and contact information as you come back and kind of be their, their uh, test here, okay? But thank you. The, the, Mr. Osborne, that is valuable information. It is important. I think we have an opportunity right now that we're uh, making these upgrades to, to hear these concerns and try to address them as best we can. Uh, Mr. McHenry? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we've heard that, and in the media center, people were smiling in the back room. They put their head out and said, yes, please have good mic control, and even I not even I, I have the same uh, thing to remind to keep my mouth close to the mic and an even distance apart. Thank so. you, and, and that is problematic sometimes for us up at the day as when we're looking at each other, making, you know, having a conversation, so we will definitely work on that mic control for everybody. Thank you. What I will say also, the media center is riding the mics in the back. That is what part of what they do is, and it's a laborious task to try to equalize the sound level between speakers, but it is part of their job function back there. And that's why our, the quality of our broadcast is as good as it is, because we have live people manning the microphone levels. So thank you back there. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Well, can I just say that uh, I have embarrassed my children to tears by projecting across department stores. Um, <laughs> so, Mr. Osborne, it would be really helpful if you would tell each of us individually who you can hear clearly and who you can't hear. And, it, and so, okay, um, we, we, we will speak up, but also it would be helpful if you would borrow one of the earphones and then give us the same information as to whether or not we are projecting accurately. Well, can, we, we want to know which one of us cannot be heard so that we can help you with what we're saying. Okay, uh, Councilmember Hours, you had another question? I, I do have to say uh, that these headphones work very well, and if you do want to hear all of us, I would suggest you get a pair of them. We have them for you. Uh, it's a good solution. If you don't want to wear them, I guess you're going to have to put up with what, uh, what you can't hear. But the uh, fact is, they work, so give them a try. Good, okay, thank you, Mr. McHenry. We'll keep uh, working at it, and hopefully we'll get it as best as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to item uh, 7.2. Our next briefing is a Spanish language community education project on the sewage treatment process and water use issues. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I'm Denise Cadman, Natural Resource Specialist in the Utilities Department, here to brief you on a new Spanish language education program that we're going to begin this fall. Uh, this is a collaboration 
between the Utilities Department, Environmental Services, and the Santa Rosa Junior College. I worked with Abigail Zoger from the Life Science Department and Darcy Rosales from MESA, which is Math, Engineering, um, and Science Achievement. And the idea was to provide a Spanish language tour of the Laguna treatment plant and make that information available as well as other water related issues to what we believe to be a growing and underserved community. What we did was recruit a couple of top notch biology majors from the life science department who happened to be bilingual. We brought them out, trained them on the really important take home aspects of sewage treatment and related water issues. They went away and worked together and also with instructors at the college to customize a tour that they will present to four different school groups this fall. The first one is going to be this Friday for the Roseland uh, Accelerated Middle School. And um, we will uh, follow that with three more tours in October. And if all goes well, and there's interest and funds available, we would like to continue the program in the spring and um, perhaps even grow it bigger so that we can reach more schools. Um, two of the tours take place, it's all after school programs, so we expect quite a bit of family participation. Two of the tours occur on Sunday. And um, this particular um, series of tours was sponsored by Mesa. They came up with a one-time grant that we could use to provide a stipend to the students. And part of the stipend will be received when they train the next student tour guides to replace themselves. Hopefully that will occur next spring. Um, I have some um, flyers here that describe the program and have all the dates in case anybody is interested in joining us on any of those tours. And I um, am, of course, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Denise. Council questions? We have done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just a, a great job. Thanks. Thank this is very exciting. And that brings us to the approval of minutes for August 7th and August 14th. Any uh, corrections uh, for those minutes? Seeing none, we will approve those minutes and move on to uh, Mayor and Council Members' reports. Any statements of abstention for this evening? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I yes. thought there was an individual in the audience that had a comment on the minutes. I Is that appropriate? Did you not get the card? I was told. I but don't have a card on the minutes. No? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I think miss this this is uh, what is your name sir okay yeah, yeah you had it down for public comment you wanted to comment on the minutes yes. okay come on down Attila Nagy Santa Rosa um, yeah specifically in the minutes I understand that you had uh, passed uh, or I'm not sure exactly how to put it uh, regarding the car, car impound, raising the fee, and I would con uh, ask you to reconsider that, considering who is actually going to be paying the fines, who and it's l lower income people. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Was there was there a question about the minutes specifically, Mr. Tilla? Yes, I understand that you had uh, passed a resolution right. or or raising the fine. Right. Um, can I ask you to reconsider that at this time? I think I'd have to ask for a point of clarification. This is not a correction of minutes. This is actually speaking to an item. I'm not sure about the formal formality yeah, of this. The, uh, an action, a motion for reconsideration would come from a member in the majority, but it would have to be the following meeting. I'm not sure which item or which meeting um, the, uh, the, the action occurred at, but right. we're also not talking about, I mean, that would, that would be something that would originate from the so the, the time the time period has Not passed for us now. to take that up, up for reconsideration by the council mm -hmm. and the reconsideration has to come from this body from the city council itself from a member and that time that time has passed i see and can i make a comment on the sound system because actually i'm not hearing 
very well here. It seems like it's out in a room somewhere, but it's it's kind of interesting. It's not Thank like having a monitor right there. Thank you. Hopefully they heard you back there. We'll, we'll take <laughs> that down as well, okay? <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I just didn't understand the formality. Very well. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we do not have statements of exception for this evening, so we'll move on to mayors and council members' reports. We were away for a period of three weeks. I know a lot has happened. Uh, I guess more recently yesterday I was at the 6th Street undercrossing uh, ribbon cutting. Great event. Uh, great to see the neighborhoods come out, business districts come out to celebrate that. I think it's going to be a good thing for that part of our, of our community. Um, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, only one official uh, item to report on the Sonoma County Transit Authority. I was uh, as a filled in as an alternate for Councilmember Wysocki, and I've actually asked staff to come back to us with a with a briefing because there was an update on uh, the various projects uh, coming going up, uh, both in process, near completion, and some completed throughout the county. And it's really there was three pages of projects and a lot of stuff. A great deal was was reported on yesterday, but and we, it was given to us in in uh, we got a, a, a sheet that had all of the information. I'm asking staff to kind of condense it along with some people from the county, so that we can get it. The council can actually get a briefing on what's on what has happened, what's and what is near completion, because it was a, a, a large body of work, and I couldn't capture it while the gentleman was speaking. So they're going to come back and give the council a full briefing uh, probably in the next week or so. Thank you. Mr. Bartlett. Well, I likewise, uh, along with I think a majority of the council, attended the 6th Street undercrossing. And last week I was down in San Diego at the California League of Cities um, conference with the mayor and the city manager. Uh, it was a very interesting conference. And actually, I think one of the more interesting things, and I think the city manager may think that also, is we two of us sat through a presentation on the city of Stockton um, and their experience with uh, bankruptcy and how they got where they are. And um, I think I can speak with some certainty that both of our jaws were on the floor when we heard of some of the things that they had been doing over the years. And um, my, my particular thing was the amount of redevelopment money that they were using to fund general service provisions in the city. Uh, it was terribly reassuring in terms of uh, how solid we are relative to them. And I actually picked up some information and I'll, as soon as I get get it I'll, uh, I'll send it out to everybody on council because it, it is a good primer at least on the on the bankruptcy process and um, the experience that they are going through and how they got there which is uh, was real eye-opener thank you councilmember Gorin I did attend the technical advisory committee this is the the staff members working with the water advisory committee and I want to let you know there are a couple of items moving forward the water agency has contracted for a consultant to evaluate uh, the current model of funding water uh, for the water agency. We have uh, consistently said as, as the contractors that we'd like to see more rate stability on the part of the water agency. And as you may or may not know, the water agency funds their operations through the sale of water rather than fixed rates uh, to cover their cost of operations. So they are looking at that model. They will be working very closely with the contractors and customers to evaluate that. And they expect to have uh, some check-in times over the next couple of months. And so that, and come back with a final recommendation. Now this may affect our restructured agreement because that does specify how we purchase water from the agency and how much water we are entitled to. And so there may be some, uh, some interesting reactions on the part of the contractors who are less than anxious to even open those discussions or renegotiations with that agreement. And that was made patently clear to the consultant on the, at the meeting on Monday. Uh, and there was one other item moving forward. The water agency is exploring selling $50 million worth of bonds to finance energy efficiency improvements, not only with municipal facilities, but perhaps street lights. And I've alerted our city manager to the fact that the agency is starting discussions about that. And they have sent a request for 
qualification out to a number of very large energy retrofit firms. So we best really understand w what it is they're looking for and whether or not it makes sense for Santa Rosa to participate in something like that. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Vostapre? Yes, thank you very much. No video for the audience. Pardon me? No video for the audience. What do you want to watch? Not what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's, that's the television feed up there? Okay. <laughs> okay. Councilmember Ross to pray. Mr. Osborne, if we could see ourselves, we'd spend all of our time looking up there and not looking at you. I, I'm sure it's one of the kinks that will be worked out, but I, I understand what you're saying. Um, one of the points of clarification that I wanted to try to make, um, member of the audience, um, Mr. Attila Nadja or N-A-G-Y, Nagy, um, wonderful little Hungarian name, was referring to um, our minutes of August 14th. And I, I you know, it, it is a technicality that um, he wanted it to be reconsidered, the towing charge and the impoundment. impoundment. Um, and um, I will talk with him that it has to be from a member of the um, voting majority to vote that we would reconsider that and that that's what part of that protocol is about. Um, as has been indicated, we were off for um, a very nice long recess while they were doing all of this uh, modernization of, of the sound equipment. And so I'm just going to mention um, the August 15th um, event, it's called Circle of Honor at Santa Rosa Junior College was fabulous. The number of people from um, Sonoma County and outside Sonoma County who contribute toward scholarships um, at our Santa Rosa Junior College, that's what happens. It's open to the public. Um, it's usually the third Wednesday in August. Um, but it is really heartwarming to see these young students come forward and receive the funding um, that people uh, in our community and beyond um, have given to um, furthering their education. I did briefly mention um, before, yesterday was a Luther Burbank Home and Garden Volunteer Luncheon, and we as city council members are invited to those events, and uh, a more wonderful group of volunteers, hard to find. Um, for any people who are out there in the audience or present um, who do have discretionary time and want to volunteer, our Luther Burbank Home and Gardens is, is a very, um, I think, worthwhile um, endeavor. It's on the Historic Registry, federal um, and uh, state, and although that means they don't get any additional funds, but um, we do have a jewel right here, and they did mention that the mayor attended one of their fundraiser um, dinners, so uh, uh, there are many other things that have happened, the Sixth Street Crossing, et cetera, but thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rowers. Yeah, the uh, the Sixth Street undercrossing was was interesting in a number of ways. It was uh, it, it's a great new way to get around town, but also it was kind of sad in a way. It was one of the last uses of redevelopment funds that you can visually see with the kind of thing that we're not going to be able to do anymore. Thank you, Councilman uh, Wisaki. Yes, uh, I also attended the Sixth Street undercrossing, and um, I do hope the drainage does work. Uh, but we won't know until the rainy season, so uh, it, uh, you could feel it on the bicycle going through there. Also, Sunday night I attended uh, a gathering by the Santa Rosa Interfaith Council, but not in our town, in support of our Sikh community up on uh, Bennett Valley Road, and just, just a wonderful cross-section of our, of our town in support of our members of our Sikh community to... Uh, basically say that what happened in Wisconsin when, when uh, some Sikhs were gunned down will not happen in this town. Wonderful, wonderful evening of uh, solidarity in our town. Uh, it was a good vacation. Also would like to request that uh, we get a report on the, the taxi ordinance. I got a communication, perhaps many of my colleagues did too, from AC uh, Transportation Services. 
wondering why there's been a, a, a delay in implementation or enforcement of that of that ordinance. So I, I said I would request and at some future meeting I'd appreciate the presentation on that. Thank you. I think uh, for clarification, uh, I, I do believe everybody received that letter so we could get some communication back to the council on, on the status of that. Uh, uh, this is with respect to the taxi ordinance yes. implementation? Yes, yes, we'll do that. Thank you. Allison Burke, our team council member. You, look, you have two more meetings to go. I think next week is your last meeting and you're headed off to college. What's going on? Yeah, in two weeks I will be off to UC Davis, but there will be a new sea of faces to fill my seat um, when the fall session for team council resumes. And I believe that they will be rotating so that there will be a different person each week. And you've been spending some time in Spain, I believe? Yeah, I took a trip to Barcelona. It was a wonderful experience. Good. Well, we're going to miss you, and we'll see you. You will be here next week. I will be here next week, my last meeting, but I'm going to miss this. We're going to plant a roast or something for you for next week. <laughs> Is there a story you have something to say? Okay. Thank you. Uh, City Manager. Thank you. Um, one of the things, I also attended the uh, League Annual Conference, and uh, as the council member and the mayor said, there were a, lot, a number of sessions uh, of interest. I probably went to three different sessions on what the meaning of the uh, voluminous changes to the um, public employee retirement system will be come January 13th if the governor signs the bill, which all indication is that he will. And um, I went to three different sessions and, and basically got three different opinions on certain things. So I think what it tells you is that the three-page analysis and summary that we have in a lot of these things is probably not going to be good enough for explaining a 700-page bill. And um, there are many details to it. Um, it will have effects where our staff is going to be uh, spending time um, uh, with their um, um, professional organizations and with the PERS folks to try and understand this as it goes forward. Uh, that probably won't start until after the governor actually signs a bill, if he goes forward with it. And we'll also need to be spending time with our legal team here as well. Uh, but as soon as we have some uh, notion of how we might be impacted, how it works with existing programs in place, what changes there could be uh, in the immediate or uh, longer term future, because uh, there's some staged implementation within the bill. And so there are a number of aspects that um, it, it certainly, um, Based on my overview, it, it answers some of the questions that we raised um, in our studies a couple of years ago uh, that really were outside of the council's purview um, that really rested with the state legislature to enact, um, but certainly did not answer all of those questions. And so um, we'll get back to you as soon as we can with some uh, additional information and maybe we'll try to give you some initial points uh, for discussion because I'm sure you're getting questions from constituents about uh, that impact. So, it, it's it's a it's a major statement. It doesn't uh, doesn't make all the changes that everybody wanted, but it sure uh, gets a start on a number of major ones. Um, the other thing I would like to do, I'd like to take a moment here and um, introduce a new member of our staff. Um, uh, Bethany Fassendini has joined our staff as our new gang prevention intervention services manager. She's coming down to the podium now. Thank you, Bethany. And um, I w would like to say that um, Bethany competed well in our selection and we're, we're really delighted to have her here. Uh, Bethany's experience in uh, developing several award-winning programs for youth and families in high-risk environments uh, that would connect them to parks, neighborhoods, and their communities, as well as building a lot of partnerships in the community um, really put her put her in the top ranking for this position, and I think we're going to see some positive uh, traction on that fairly quickly. Uh, Bethany's been on board for just a little over 24 hours, so um, <laughs> she's. I think she's been in meetings from uh, dawn to dusk, um, and uh, both internally and getting out into the community. We scheduled quite a an introductory route for, and as you know, there are many community partners to be introduced to. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about Bethany. She's not new to Santa Rosa. She actually graduated from Montgomery High School and, so, and um, also attended Santa Rosa Jun Junior College. So she is returning to um, one of our 
uh, one of our um, locally educated um, individuals now returning um, to the community, which um, has always been the, the question that we've had in our communities. Do we train people and educate them and then send them out? And, and uh, we don't bring our, our best and brightest back to the community. So um, she has gone on to, at several different universities, but culminated in her Master's of Arts in Environmental and Social Justice at Sonoma State University and comes with some pretty high remarks from the faculty um, in that uh, discipline at the university. So uh, Bethany was most recently with the East Bay Regional Park District in Oakland um, and has also been involved in, um, in many uh, separate programs, um, Literacy for Adults, AmeriCorps, uh, California State Parks, Hope Services, Communities for a Better Environment and um, has worked diligently and at the community level and I think is pretty well grounded in um, our local government and community services. So with that, I wanna <laughs> welcome you, Bethany, and, and you, you may wish to say, make a few comments to the council, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, my name is Bethany Facendini and I just wanted to take um, a couple moments of your time to just say that it's a true honor and a pleasure to be working for the community in this capacity. And I'm very much looking forward to working with all of you and all of our extensive community partners to implement, implement the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force um, goals and objectives. And I'm very open to building relationships and it really does take a community. So I look forward to interacting in, in the future. Welcome, Bethany. Thank you. Um, report from the city attorney's office, please. I don't have anything to report other than I'm filling in for Caroline Fallow, our city attorney, tonight. Very well, thank you. We'll move on to the consent calendar. Our first item is a motion for approval of additional funds for Howarth Park Pony Ride concessions. 11.2 is a resolution for contract award fleet management system software. And item 11.3 is a resolution approval of agreement for election services. Thank you. Council question on our consent calendar. You want to speak on one? I know you don't have a card, but come on up, Mr. Osborne. Jack Osborne, 5636 Del Monte Court. I don't understand. Uh, this contract is funded by Recreation and Parks, Budget and Fish, and will be offset by revenue from the sale of tickets. You mean we get back all of the money that we pay that lady from the tickets? Or is there some loss somewhere? And why would they need more money if they're making money? Just a question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. I, I believe that on this one, it, the service is so in demand and so successful, uh, the amount of money we budgeted for the program, um, the success far exceeds that. And so uh, this is a boost to the ex uh, expanded service that's going on. Um, and it's a, it, it must be budgeted and authorized by the council for such purpose. Uh, I think the shorter answer might be is we subsidize the pony rides. No, we don't. This is, uh, it, it is uh, strictly supported through fees that are raised, but uh, we're, we're having greater success, apparently, uh, than we originally anticipated. Well, and then he's got a good question. If there's more rides and we're not subsidizing it, it would seem that we would need less. I mean, it's not a big amount. But I think the more rides, the, the more um, ticket sales, we have to re we we pay for services and then the t the t there's more ticket sales sold that come back to us so it's it's revenue neutral. Okay, so we're sense. just collecting it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have yes. revenue revenue collection and also expenditure and we're trying to recognize that through the budget. More ponies. Well, how do you know? <laughs> and this is the 30th anniversary, so there have been a lot of promotions as well. Very well, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to move consent items 11.1 .1 through 11.3 .3 and wait for the reading. Second. Good. 
Thank you. We have seven eyes. We want to uh, 12.1. Um, our next item, 12.1, um, I'll be giving this report. It's a report on the Boarding Commission's 2012 diversity report. Um, Section 11 of the city's charter does require us to file an annual report on diversity of the council appointments to the city boards and commissions. And um, that report must be done in public session. And so this is uh, now the eighth annual diversity report pursuant to this chapter of the uh, charter. Um, you will find um, in the succeeding pages a comparison from year to year um, of the diversity reporting um, since, the, since we started in 2008. Um, so you have five years here. Um, I think um, we report a little differently because we report the community advisory board as a separate entity compared to co uh, compiling the information jointly for all the other boards and commissions. And, and that's because we have some uh, requirements for some geographic um, representation as well. So that's a little bit, it's a little bit different than um, the other boards and commissions. They're not required, but we are scoring that as well. And so I think it's, the report is self-explanatory. Um, there's, there's been um, only modest uh, progress, I would have to say. Uh, I think our challenge, um, particularly on the Community Advisory Board, as you know, has been um, uh, getting that board full in the last two years. And so um, I think some of the recent change that the council made in terms of uh, complementing both the geographic placement as well as some at large placement um, will certainly assist in keeping that board full, which we would like to do. It's one of the larger boards we have here at the city. Uh, so with that, um, I would submit the report for the uh, council's consideration and posting. Um, I would also note that um, as we looked into this a little bit further, we recognize that the charter actually says that we should be providing not only the diversity data on uh, those who are appointed, but also applications. And so we're going to have to change our procedure a little uh, because it's, it's, it still is voluntary. We don't always get our um, appointees to declare um, their ethnicity, but uh, we certainly are going to be tracking that also with the um, applications, including those who may not uh, reach appointment in any one year. So we'll have a more complete report going forward. Thank you. Questions from Council? Council Member Gorn? Just a comment. Um, actually, I, I think you were very generous in characterizing this as uh, moderate progress. I see this as uh, some major backsliding because you're looking at all of the other boards and the geographical uh, distribution in 2000 and what is it, 2008. 11 members were from the orth Northeast, and in 2012, 23 members were from the Northeast. And the um, Caucasian representation was 36, and now it is 39. So uh, perhaps district elections may help with this, I'm not sure, but um, and, it, I just think we need to be far more aggressive in looking at diversity for appointments for all of our boards and commissions. And I still have a vacancy. I'm seriously remiss on that for the Community Advisory Board. If we've had applications turned in for that, could they be forwarded to me and perhaps other council members who have vacancies on that board? Yes, and, and I think that you know, that's one area where I think we should um, really take a look at how we might better assist the council in that respect. Uh, because the city clerk can be, um, and now with our community engagement program, we have uh, better opportunities for um, helping to in both inform and recruit individuals to make those applications. And so um, we might use that as a supplementary process to the council's own um, search for um, individuals for these positions. So, but yes, the current applications we have, we can share those, certainly. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Member Vassipre? Um, yes, I just wanted to um, compliment the Inclusionary Council has been working really 
closely um, with our city clerk and um, with the city manager and, and the uh, office staff in trying to um, think of ways to help the city council in their board and commission appointments um, as far as the announcement um, opportunity to various groups that would target um, ethnicities, et cetera, et cetera, so that we would have a more rich opportunity um, from which to select um, future board and commission members. So um, hopefully this, this will reflect our community um, better in, in the next report. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Mr. Bartley? Yeah, I um, comment. I think, uh, I think it's, it is something that we all uh, have responsibility for, everyone here, in terms of um, assuring the uh, representation of the diversity of our community. I think no one is to blame. I think everyone is to blame, and that's just the reality of it, and we need to work harder. Um, a question, I, I held back, I have two vacancies now on the cab. I held back because I wanted to wait for the cab resolution to come through, which now has. Now, my next question is something for staff to help us with. Um, we now have an appointment from one area and one at large, but I don't know what area is the one area I have. And someone needs to tell me before I appoint somebody. So Stephanie can help you with that. Yeah. She would have that information. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. She know. I don't know. I don't know that Stephanie would know which I, I think one. This, I think this is going to be new information. This is new. I think we, one of them. We're each going to lose one, and and so you know, I can't pick. We've got to figure out who ends up with one. So I think it's going to come back to us as a. And I, I think the assistant city manager was going to start looking at how to make that happen to make it equitable, make it work for us. Good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Other questions? Schwarzaki? Yes, thank you. I, I just have a comment. Um, uh, I've never had, the staff will help place uh, advertisement when you are seeking applications for, for staff, and uh, I've always gotten plenty of responses uh, when I solicit applications for my appointments. And the geographical location on these years, it is quite telling that in many years, uh, it's either at 50% or just below 50% for the Northeast representation. So that's, it's quite an indictment against uh, retaining the status quo in terms of spreading out representation throughout the city. Thank you, other questions or comments? So I think we're taking action on this by accepting a report, is that correct? That's correct, I have it. Go ahead. Uh, motion to issue the annual report on diversity of council appointments to city boards, commissions, and committees. We have seven eyes. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item 12.2. Our next item is public hearing Project J Winery and Tasting Room Zoning Policy Review. Good evening, Mayor Olivares, members of the council. Before you tonight is a proposal to revise city zoning policies and regulations um, <clears throat> to achieve certain goals uh, with regards to winery and tasting room land uses uh, throughout the city. This is resulting from the city council's economic development priorities initiated by the tier two level of those. Uh, and essentially, the changes proposed tonight are intended to create new land use classifications, specifically winery, tasting room, and brewery, uh, reduce barrier, barriers to winery land uses with uh, emphasis paid downtown, uh, as well as uh, all the industrial zoning districts, and then also to coordinate similar changes for br breweries. Um, we got some of these ideas uh, through public interest demonstrated by uh, pre-application meetings, inquiries for new businesses, um, also just staff's identification that the current zoning code doesn't identify wineries or tasting rooms as land uses. 
uh, wineries and breweries are a growing industry in Santa Rosa. And also the current zoning code only allows tasting rooms within existing wineries. So to determine the appropriate changes, staff uh, spent a lot of time doing outreach with the industry, uh, Chamber of Commerce, um, Santa Rosa Police Department, a um, number of specific wineries and uh, wine associated businesses. Uh, we notified all downtown property owners. We uh, notified the cab groups as well as the old Main Street uh, list of businesses uh, and all the residential properties that were adjacent to downtown. So we did a lot of outreach and notification to make sure that everyone uh, was uh, informed of the proposal. The council direction uh, was essentially to increase uses as permitted uh, to help create jobs and expedite reoccupancies of existing structures. Um, <clears throat> some of the issues, as I mentioned, are with the current zoning regulations are lack of definitions. Uh, most winery uses require planning approval, so there's a, a cost and a time frame associated with the startup of a new winery related business. And um, the code or our interpretation of these relied on, or our use relied on interpretations of the zoning code, so it wasn't clear. So I'm just going to go over some of the new changes that we're proposing. There's analysis in the staff report as to how we've gotten there and, and uh, further discussion, and I'll be uh, able to answer any questions after. So we're proposing to define wineries specifically with two different levels of production, boutique wineries and production wineries based on a 10,000 case maximum annual production limit. Um, they're allowed to have events four times a year, as that's a typical part of winery businesses. If they wanted to go beyond that, they would use a special use permit um, process or temporary use permit. We're proposing to define tasting rooms to allow beer and wine tasting on site with off site retail sales, uh, and it must be directly associated with a wine or a brewery. So that's the, dis the, the difference between a tasting room and a, a wine bar. Uh, we're proposing to define breweries similarly with a brew pub level and a production level. Um, the difference in the production level is 15,000 barrels versus 10,000 cases comes from there's an established industry standard for breweries, for microbrew versus large brewery, and there isn't as much of one for wineries, so we kind of landed on the 10,000 case limit. And also winery production is different than breweries. It's once a year very much more intense than the brewery production, which is spread out over the year. <coughs> uh, we're proposing to allow tasting rooms by right in the CD and Transit Village zoning districts, uh, boutique wineries with minor use permits and production wineries with conditional use permits. In the general commercial and shopping center zoning districts, we're proposing to allow tasting rooms with minor use permits, boutique wineries with minor use permits and production wineries with conditional use permits. S uh, in the neighborhood zoning district, we're proposing to allow tasting rooms and brew pubs with minor use permits. Industrial districts throughout the city, we would like to allow all wineries and breweries um, with tasting rooms by right, uh, as well as a brew pub in the business park and a uh, conditional use permit required in the light industrial district for a brew pub. These changes are also coordinated for the uh, LIL combining district, as that's essentially a temporary holding um, district for light industrial in the Maxwell Court area. We referred the project to the Santa Rosa Police Department as I identified. They had no comments or concerns on the proposal. Uh, all public comment, which there was a fair amount, was all positive and supportive. There was no negative comments on the project. And of course, the largest land use issue was compatibility between um, wineries uh, and breweries in the downtown and transit village. Um, zoning designation, just because there are production um, oriented use, but we thought that the minor use permit and conditional use permit requirements would allow us to address some of the impacts associated with their production. And there's also some other limitations, such as requiring uh, production to be indoors or at least within the building footprint and other things like that that we felt would be adequate to address the potential impacts from these uses in these CD and transit village districts, which tend to be smaller parcels. So with that, it's recommended by the Community Development Department and the Planning Commission that the City Council by ordinance approve the proposed zoning to code text amendments for winery, tasting room, and brewery land uses. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Noah. Uh, <coughs> Council questions? Council, uh, I'm sorry, Council Member Gorin. This is exciting. I know that Healdsburg and Sonoma are bristling uh, with over-concentration. We would like to have that problem in Santa Rosa. 
Um, but it does raise an issue of a, a number of the, I don't think I'll worry about over concentration yet, but um, we, we would welcome that problem. But there is some concern about, first of all, will the neighbors be notified that there is going to be a tasting room? I don't think that there's a problem. It's, it's um, usually not a incompatibility of use. Events, perhaps, is another issue, and the hours of operation is another issue, because if it's spectacularly successful as the Russian River Brewery, it does have spillover effects to neighborhoods. Um, neighbors, I'm sure Mr. Sawyer can attest to that. Um, and so the, the notification for a minor use permit is what? When a minor use permit comes in, the planner has a discretion to uh, file a notice of application, so just let everyone know an application has come in. Uh, but prior to any decision, uh, notification goes out to all property owners within 400 feet of the property. And uh, events, is that part of the minor use permit or is that permitted by, by right? So the winery uses that are uh, permitted by right, such as in industrial districts, would be allowed to have four events per year. Events are defined as uh, involving other wineries, so like the wine road event when multiple wineries join together to try to drive tourism. Um, those would not be notified if a winery was having an event like that within that four times a year allowance because the use is allowed by right. If they wanted to increase beyond that, then they would be required to go through a use permit process, a temporary use permit process, where we would notify the surrounding property owners. And does that include amplified music? Um, the events, all events would be required to meet the city's noise ordinance. Uh, the definition of event didn't get into whether they're going to have music or not. The winery events that I've been to in the past have some have had some have not so I would guess that would depend on the individual wineries in their setting well I think what we're proposing right here is not exactly uh, compatible or um, the same scale as for example Lagunitas brewery down in Petaluma and we see what an incredible facility that is to enliven a business park or a light industrial park and parking is everywhere. Uh, events happen on a regular basis, and people come for, uh, from miles to attend uh, Lagunitas Brewery. So we don't anticipate so far that kind of scale. Lagunitas Brewery uh, is not only a brewery and a tasting room, but also a music venue. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's definitely beyond the scope of any allowances within this project. Okay. And one more question. We know that uh, water always is a consideration and production facilities, especially with breweries uh, specifically and, and wineries to a certain extent. And we know that perhaps in downtown we might have a capacity issue where we're placing water and sewer lines to meet the additional demand and capacity. Have we had conversations with our utilities department about whether or not that's a concern in various parts of Santa Rosa? Definitely. Um, not specific to what areas of Santa Rosa may have capacity issues with regards to pipe size, but one of the uh, influences in this project was the fact that industrial waste requires all um, wineries to install a grate that they filter all of their rinse down and wash down of their equipment and, and all of that. That grate must be stored indoors out of rain because obviously you don't want rainwater going into the sewer system. That um, restriction by itself helped to allow current community development staff to feel comfortable allowing wineries because essentially it allows or it focuses most of the intensity of the uses indoors or at least within a cover uh, in an area that would be over that grate. Thank you, and I'm pretty sure that our utilities uh, uh, department will be working closely with any winery, winery or brew pub to make sure that they have the most water-conserving technology as possible because obviously that's where we're going. It, it's exciting, and I'm, I'm glad that you're working uh, on this. I, I expect that we might have a few ripples along the way, but move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bartley? Yeah, a couple questions. Uh, Mr. Housh, on the, um, I'll save comments for later, but on the um, uh, small wineries, I emailed you regarding the 15,000 barrels, um, and I, I understand that 
should come out of yeah it, it's not in the zone my apologies there was a typo in the definitions that were in your staff report i should have addressed that in, in my presentation some of the language from the brewery definition carried over into the winery definition in the ordinance it's clear and it's specific to the ten thousand case limit okay. and also um i did note in the in the wording of the order you you in in the winery definition you refer to annually but in the winery i assume we we should be adding if it does in your highlighted thing, it does not refer to 10,000 cases annually, but that would be an annual production, correct? 100%. Okay. Um, also, um, on that, uh, from the staff report, the last line is you've allowed for, um, I guess I'm not sure still what that last, under the winery production, you say, in addition, users will produce less than 10,000 cases of beverage or less, but do not meet one or more of the additional requirements considered a boutique winery. Isn't the only... Am I missing something or isn't the only other, quote, boutique definition, the fact that it's all happening indoors? Or oh, that's correct. That's, that's correct. correct. So that is the, the trigger. So then I would question, do you even need to put that line in there if it has to be indoors or? I was imagining, I'd have to look at the specific language, but I was imagining essentially a winery coming in at less than 10,000 cases but operating in an industrial area. So okay. I did not want them to have to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Vastapray. Yes, thank you very much, and I uh, thank you for this um, excellent research that you've done, uh, Mr. Hausch. Um, I was wondering if um, Kevin Brown is also going to speak to this as um, one of our longtime retailers and the experience that um, he's been through with this. I, I would like to hear from the public, if, if that's all right with you, Mr. Brown. To hear how this I, I, is. I will be taking public comment at a later time. I, right. But I'm not sure that he signed up. He is. Good. Okay, thank you. Other thank questions you. from council, please? Mr. Wysocki? Thank you. Thank you, Noah, for the report. Who monitors the four events? Who? Uh, being that there's a potential for um, production winery or, or boutique winery to be principally permitted, there would be no check-in process, so to speak, built into any conditional use permit, it would be resolved through code enforcement issues. Um, it's, it's not. So it'd be through complaints coming from the neighbors, and it's basically how. If, uh, if there's a discretionary permit required for a winery, minor or, or conditional use permit, then we would specify that as a condition of approval. When a use is principally permitted, meaning there's no discretionary uh, planning approvals, they would come in to get a zoning clearance at the front counter. They would be told that that's a restriction on their use it would be up to them to comply or get a complaint filed. That's correct. Thank you. Other questions from council? This time I will be uh, opening the public hearing. This is a public hearing. I do have a number of cards here. We'll call those first. Ken Moult uh, Siebert. Hi, uh, my name is Ken Moholt Siebert. Uh, my wife, Melissa, and I are, uh, own a business called Ancient Oak Cellars. We're a winery, and we're hoping to open a tasting room in Corex. We may be the first to take advantage of this new um, code language. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to joining the community in Santa Rosa. Um, if there are any questions of me, I, I could answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Brown. Hi. Thank you very much, council members, mayor. I really appreciate the city's work on this. They've worked diligently. Noah has done an amazing job, but so has Chuck Regalia. We've been working on this since March 6th, and we're very excited to be able to be the first to take advantage of this, but certainly not the last. Um, I think that our downtown is a wonderful gem, and I think that this is something that will make it much more apparent to all of those people who are starting to come and discover Sonoma County, and I think it will benefit the city greatly. It will benefit us as well, um, and I think it will make our, this community uh, much more alive, and hopefully hope your coffers as well. <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Peter Chernoff. You 
You all looked uh, tan and refreshed from your vacation. Welcome back. So um, more alcohol outlets. That's a capital idea. More money for the city via purchasers. And uh, it would be a great idea that the DUIs uh, should have their fines tripled on behalf of the city. But there's something else we should consider, that there seems to be way too much wine, as evidenced by the tonnage of grapes in California that are often left to rot because they're not used. And of course, the burgeoning warehousing of excess wines, of which some people have taken advantage of by arson, and of course they got caught. But um, So I suggest to you uh, that, uh, that you would consider to pass an ordinance that 50% uh, of all the grapes from these wineries be turned into grape juice for kids and have, have some tasting rooms for kids with these different types of grape juice. What a wonderful idea. It's better than wasting it on the vines or sitting in warehouses that people never drink. Um, and then maybe these, uh, these new, new uh, uh, tasting rooms could have special nights for people in foreclosure to drink away their sorrows. Good news. Uh, I understand that a city ordinance resolution, so to speak, uh, to designate foreclosed homes as historic sites and then claimed by eminent domain. And the reason it would be historic is because, well, we'd all be middle fingering the bankers in the Bush regime that were nice enough to give us 9-11 uh, X amount of years ago. So we have every reason to raise up our glass and toast to the teachers general strike over there in Chicago and we have every reason to join that general strike on behalf of freedom for our kids, these grape juice drinkers and these adults, the wine drinkers. Um, how exciting. You know, <coughs> I really want to see this strike because about 10, 12 years ago I promised I wouldn't touch a drop of alcohol until Leonard Peltier walked out of prison. And let me tell you what, it's been a strain for 12 years to not have one dro dro drop of alcohol. So I need your help with this general strike, which would shut down these bankers and the Bush regime, of course, that owns both Romney and, and uh, Obama both, so it doesn't matter which way we go on this one. Um, but with this general strike, you know, we could pick anybody we want for president. And I kind of like Marsha Dupre for president. That'd be nice. Or maybe even our mayor, Ernesto Olivares. I think he's, got a, he's a serious person. He would be able to handle the job. And he's not owned by the bankers. You know, I think the law enforcement ought to arrest these guys, but they can't do it because of all this complicated conspiracy stuff. So, yes, let's go ahead and uh, pass an ordinance with the vineyards so that 50% uh, of the grape juice goes to grape juice for kids for free. And um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and start talking to our friends on the email, on telephones, to join this teacher's general strike. Maybe we could educate this nation to a higher station. We're all tired of this. And believe me, I would love to have a nice glass of port sometime soon with my dinner, but I can't do it until the guy who's got the U.S. Constitution sitting in his cell by virtue of the fact that he represents the 500-year indigenous resistance uh, has got the Constitution sitting in his cell, Leonard Peltier. It was the Iroquois that gave us this Constitution. Go ahead and have some wine tonight and talk about this with your friends, and let's go ahead and get revved up like Efren, Efren Carrillo. That's what I want to see you guys. You know, I heard that he was in Russia with a sound box and an entourage playing the Rocky, scene, Rocky music Mr. to Chira, it. Thank you. I'm just about done. I got 19 seconds. Uh, well, actually, we... we <laughs> We started the timer a little bit late. We Actually, I noticed that, that for all the times I've been cut off in the fact, I might as well have the last 10 seconds, and, and I appreciate that. So let's talk about this general strike. Let's get on board and shut down uh, this corruption Mr. in Turner, service to the living up. Lord. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Cole. we got to fix that. Aaron, members of the council, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you on this uh, proposed ordinance. And at the risk of being a little too rational, I want to speak in support thereof. As we uh, continue to work our way out of this uh, after effects of the Great Recession, it's absolutely critical that governments, city governments, do whatever you can to help facilitate retenanting of space and the growth of businesses. 
Uh, I really want to commend the community development staff, Chuck Rugeli and his team for bringing forth this particular ordinance and some of the ones that will follow later this evening as means for doing that. It's a real critical role the city plays in terms of helping uh, the development of business and with that the creation of jobs. In this particular instance, I think it's also important because it reflects the change in our economy, the trend towards visitors coming here. As you all know, the Chamber, working with the city's economic development department, spent a lot of time trying to bring visitors to our community. And the more we have for the things for them to do, for opportunities for them to enjoy, wine tastings, breweries downtown, the better it becomes for keeping them here and having them enjoy their stays. So I urge you to vote in favor of this particular uh, ordinance amendment and also as we go forward to continue to do those kinds of things that make it easier for businesses to grow, expand, and put people back to work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Coe. This is a public hearing. Those are all the cards that I have on this item, but you do not, you do not have to fill out a card to speak on this item. If you wish to speak, step forward, please. That was your cue, Mr. Osborne. Jack Osborne, 5636 Dillon, Monte Court. I wasn't going to speak on this because I don't care. I drink wine and beer and most everything else. But what I was concerned a little about was kind of exposing it to the city for the first time. I hadn't seen anything about this. And so here you are, and you're going to make a resolution approving it. But then I see, I'm reading and watching the stuff up there, and it says, public input, all favorable. So ask yourself, what public input? All he said was they asked the, the people who wanted to do it. How can you have public input when the public input doesn't know it's going? Oh, I don't care about that. It's just one of those things about the city. You say, they say public input all favorable. People say yes and no. So they're only listening to certain people. Okay. <clears throat> As I'll switch my voice a little bit. Uh, and then what concerned me even more was police. No comment or referral. What? You're proposing to have 10, 20, maybe 30 more bars and breweries and wineries, and the police don't care? They don't care. They're always complaining. I mean, everybody's always complaining about a bar. Okay, so let's switch away from that. Okay, the next thing is, and then you say it's a right to have it, a right. And what happens if they don't really want to follow your procedures? What happens? It's a right to have it. You can't take my right away without paying me for it. Constitution. And then, and then I watched the last one there and I said, well, more than 10,000 barrels. I think I, that's what I read. 10, 000, I know it said 10,000 cases of beer or wine, 10,000 barrels of brew, 50,000, 500,000 gallons of brew in a small brewery. Sounds like a pretty big one too. You kind of have to have big tanks. But that's all to be worked out in the future. Anyway, I hope they all make money. I hope they all have fun and drink lots of wine and beer. But for heaven's sakes, please don't spring this on the public and then say, well, we didn't get any negative comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Ray Dargenzio. Just a little high here. Thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Mayor. and. City Council. Um, I've been in the wine business here for about uh, 20 years in Santa Rosa. Probably one of the first wineries, um, the Argenzio Winery and also Par Paradise Ridge. And probably in the last uh, five years, there's probably been at least 10 more wineries that have moved to Santa Rosa and probably at least 100 more jobs, maybe even 200 more jobs uh, within the city of Santa Rosa. There's probably at least uh, 20 or 30 more wineries that want to move within the city limits, creating probably a couple hundred more jobs for the community, uh, for its citizens, including housing. Uh, the in increase in uh, tourism is going to be great. It's great for the cyclists, the cyclist community who are traveling.
from all the all the area love to have the experience of the wine industry the um, hotels I was actually checking with some of the hotels this past weekend this coming weekend for um, Harvest Fair weekend they said that almost every hotel in the whole city is completely booked which is obviously very good for the restaurants the hotels and the local wineries so I commend you on your um, accomplishment here and also the staff Noah and the staff here and um, I think this is going to be fantastic for the city of Santa Rosa and the community uh, the is issue about the water issue with the wine waste I wanted to address that the wineries are actually very cautious of, wa of, of wine waste and uh, they want to minimize as much water usage as possible so that's uh, something that uh, wineries have always been very concerned about um, as far as turning grapes into um, uh, as far as the shortage of grapes there actually is a shortage of grapes there's not an overabundance of gra grapes right now the last two or three years have been hard for the vineyards people so now the the grapes are coming back so um, I commend you on what you're doing and I think it's very going to be very good for Santa Rosa thank you Ray again this is a public hearing you, you do not have to fill out a card to speak on this item so if you want to speak uh, please step forward We, I'm sorry, but the time you speak, I'm sorry. Hold on, Mr. Hilton. Go ahead. My name is Rue Furch, and I live in the unincorporated area. <clears throat> and I like to suggest that um, agricultural processing in the incorporated areas, so long as the infrastructure issues and traffic impacts are managed, is optimal for um, increasing the use and access to um, all of our tourism um, drivers in, in Sonoma County and so I'd like to thank you for considering this and hope that you'll find a way to support the ag processing in the city of Santa Rosa thank you thank you mr. Hilton <coughs> so mayor city council members Terry Hilton South and West area business association and the Redwood Empire business association uh, I want to commend Chuck Regalia and his staff for putting together something that I think is going a long ways and my board thinks uh, turning the, uh, the public that we've been exposed to have a negative thought about Santa Rosa uh, being anti-business. This does l tons of what's on the agenda tonight. I can't stay for everything so I want to say this now that it's, this is going to really take us uh, and put us back into a uh, an area that uh, that will make us uh, comparable to Air Sonoma, what, what uh, all other areas. Excuse me for a moment, I'm a little ill. The uh, the South and West Area Business Association w w does want to point out that uh, uh, Chuck Regalia has been doing some wonderful things in the last 25 years that I've been coming up here. Uh, most of that time, uh, Chuck has been in there in the in the uh, in the pits and the front line. So uh, uh, if, when it comes to time to give them a raise, take care of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. <laughs> okay, seeing see no one else rise for public comment, uh, I, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to council. Council, any questions uh, based on comments? Uh, Councilman Regorn? Well, um, Ms. Virch raises the question of agricultural processing in the city, and I'm, does this fall under, is it a subset of agricultural processing, or what else would be encompassed by agricultural processing, and where is that allowed currently? Uh, part, of the, part of the issues was that um, wineries were not even mentioned in the zoning code, so that's part of the things that we were trying to address here. Um, breweries were mentioned uh, in a light industrial mentality, bottling plants, bakeries are in the same category. So it's, uh, the zoning code definitions kind of anticipated uh, large scale industrial production facilities for bottling plants, processing of grapes, which at that time would have been interpreted, it's one of the zoning code interpretations we had to make as agricultural processing, a light manufacturing process. So this is a subset, but at, in general, agricultural processing is much broader than just what we're talking about. And did I hear you say that agricultural processing could be accomplished in an industrial area, perhaps Amy's Kitchen, that's food production? So currently, 
those types of uses are defined as a light industrial process. The light industrial definition does capture agricultural processing, yes. Is there a need for us to consider at some point in the future expanding where agricultural processing could be located? That's not a question from, we don't get um, folks interested in starting other types of agricultural processing businesses like we get people interested in starting wineries. As okay. far as I want to do this use, where can I do it? So maybe at some point in the future, if we do have inquiries, we need to revisit the issue. But for right now, this seems to work. That's correct. Okay. And also, I could speak to the, to the um, Jack Osborne seemed to be under a misconception that there was minimal public outreach. Please. We sent over 1,100 direct mailings just to the residential properties around downtown. That doesn't include the notification to the cab groups or the uh, notification to the business community in downtown. That was my primary concern with taking moving this ordinance forward was public notification and trying to ensure that the folks who live around downtown had a chance to chime in on the, the process. And, and that would include the people who live on the second or third floors of the downtown? My goal was to get residential properties surrounding downtown and then the property owners of downtown buildings. Most of those are not condominiums, so I'm not sure that individual tenants living above, say, the 4th Street Market would have got a notification. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. No, and no, when we do talk about public notification, we don't talk about the entire city. We're looking, we're, we're looking at the impacted area, typically. Thank you. That's correct. Mr. Bartley? All right. Are we moving on comments? I, 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 Mr. Weiss, I got a question? I did, uh, just based on that last answer, no. The uh, notification for the industrial users, since there may be an issue with events. Sure, so w I did not specifically notify um, all industrial property owners. I went to the uh, Pine, Pine Creek Business Park and interviewed about five of those winery owners, got their contact information, then asked them to speak with the surrounding property owners, uh, and then we put a one-eighth page ad in the newspaper as well. And that, that would be the only industrial area in the city that, that could be affected by this, or are there others? All industrial areas in right. the city could be affected by this. Those are the ones that are currently the primary consultation of wineries. That is a bit of, of, of a subject for concern. I generally support this ordinance, but I, I'm a little concerned now that some of our commercial tenants are unaware that they could be affected by this. Is that... Uh, Industrial areas would allow an auto shop to move in without any discretionary action, similarly to a winery, and, and uh, they're, they're the zoned. Events, the events. Oh, the events. That's a valid concern, but I would characterize most events as operating in the evenings and weekends off business hours. Other questions? Mr. Bartley? Yeah, uh, well, uh, to re respond to that one, I think we have a, a, a perfect example right now with Argenzio in an industrial area and it works out perfectly because when the events are happening no one's working and there's tons of parking so it's never an issue um i want to thank staff for for really working hard on this um i i do know something i know a lot about wineries i think this thing is um, very comprehensive i think it's very optimistic i think 20 years from now it's going to be a problem but i think most everything we do in 20 years is a problem. And so if that's gonna be our controller, we might as well do nothing. I think what we're doing right now, this is, this is perfect. It will help energize. We're seeing bits and pieces of it. Uh, Dargenzio, I wish, um, one correction, I wish we could claim credit for Paradise Ridge, but it's actually in the county. It's their entrance, it's in the city. Um, but I know we'd love to claim credit for that too. I think it works really well. I think the controller, um, and I think uh, Mr. Stanley on the planning commission, knowing what 10,000 cases, what, what's required to produce 10,000 cases of wine, that is not going to be happening in very many places. And anything beyond that is not going to happen in any type of ag production. Um, as Furch, and she's got her um, former county planning commissioner hat on. The controlling thing that's going to govern big production in our city is the cost to dispose of, the cost to dispose of the water because at 10,000 cases, and actually probably about 12,000 cases, you could not pencil out 
um, our, our sewer rates to what somebody could get a piece of land in the county and dispose of it on site would do. So that'll be the controller for the bigger facility. Um, I think it's great, um, and I'm really happy to see it move forward, and I can't wait to see what happens inside Corix. Mr. Hours? I, I very much like this push this week. Excuse me. The uh, Economic Competitiveness Task Force was very much in favor of this type of thing, but what we're really talking about here is, is one of the main things is giving our business owners and our property owners in our downtown a new set of, of weapons to continue their businesses. Uh, Corix was on the ropes, and w it, it's the stuff that we're doing here that will allow them to maintain and to continue the traditions that are, uh, you know, have been gone forever. But they have, if we give them the chance, they can adapt, and that's what business does. So this is very important because we are giving businesses a chance to change and adapt to new conditions, and I, I couldn't be happier about this, and it, it's important to me, it's important to our city, and it's going to be probably the future of our city, because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to say, wow, I didn't know that Santa Rosa allowed that. And that brings up the next point that I really want to get to at some point, is we have to tell everybody out there that this is happening. And I, I see Dave Gwine up there, and I know this is something that he wants to do, but it's very, very important that we get the information out to the public, to, to trade groups and other people, that they have an opportunity to do something in Santa Rosa that they couldn't do before, and that we are the heart of wine country, and we're the biggest city, and this is where they should be. So I'm, of course, in favor of this, and, and I really am glad that we're doing it. So. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Well, this is very exciting. And I, um, I remember the days when prior councils were wringing their hands about the ability for a restaurant downtown to serve wine outside their front doors uh, at a table. Uh, and this was in the not too distant past. It would take Santa Rosa sometimes a long time to, to, uh, to come of age, uh, in this case, perhaps decades. So the time, the, the time has come, and I, wa I do want to uh, thank Kevin and, and his wife Jerry and, and Ken and his wife Melissa for taking a risk, taking a risk in downtown, taking a risk in, in, in Santa Rosa, stepping up to the plate and going through the process, which was not an easy one. And it took, it took a long time. And I want to thank staff and Ken, uh, Chuck Regalia and, and Noah and everyone who worked on this. Uh, it's, it was a lot of work. Uh, the, the discussions we had at the Economic Competitiveness Task Force you know, helped to, to push it forward. Uh, it's, the timing was a little off for Corex. I mean, they were, they were thinking of the idea at the same time, just, just about the same time that staff was looking to make these changes. So um, it, it, um, it almost meshed uh, time-wise uh, where they would have been able to have their tasting room open before they had to deal with their, with their um, uh, harvest and then crush. But, you know, t sometimes it just doesn't work out the way we want. But I, but I think it, it, it is a, a wonderful facet uh, to that gym that Kevin talked about in, in, in the downtown. So congratulations, good luck. Uh, it is, like uh, Councilmember Hours mentioned, uh, exactly the, the, what we need in Santa Rosa. Better late than never, and I look forward to the problems that, uh, although the councils may not, the, the, to the problems that Councilmember uh, Bartley mentioned, uh, we should be so lucky to have those kinds of problems. So um, good luck, and uh, I'm really happy to be uh, moving this forward tonight. Thank you, Mr. Weislock. Councilman Gorn. Well, I want to add my note of thanks as well. Uh, this council, the previous council, and other previous councils have talked about how we enliven our downtown, and we thought that the way to do that was to get housing downtown. That has um, not been entirely successful yet. We will get there. But this may be the mechanism to do exactly that. We've seen some of the success in Railroad Square with some of the tasting rooms there. Dargencio uh, Winery, thank you for taking that risk up there because different spots around the city are emerging as those kind of hubs. And I know that it will happen. You are helping to make that happen. Bring the folks downtown after five o'clock and we can, it's not just the bar scene anymore, it's a very sophisticated 
uh, enlivening presence, and I look forward to it. It's going to be exciting, and uh, it's a welcome change, and thank you, everybody, for your efforts in making this happen. Thank you. This, this is a very exciting time for Santa Rosa. I think it's about uh, adapting. I remember when Corks was a place to go get stationary and things like that, and it's, it's changed. You're adapting to changing times. Uh, same thing with our community. We've been hit really hard with an economy, and as we, as we crawl out of this thing, we also see a rise in the popularity of our own city and county as far as tourism, and we're adapting to that. So there's, uh, th this is good stuff. I, I'm really excited about it and continuing on to move to the next, levels, next level with all the good things that we're doing to uh, get our, uh, our, our economy back in shape. So uh, with that, I'll move over to uh, Council Member Vasupre, who actually has this uh, item. Yes, yes, I do. And I'm probably one of the few who even knows what the acronym WCTU stands for. I find it very interesting that I'm the one to um, introduce this. For those of you who are on the edge of your chairs, that's Women's Christians Temperance Union. Um, but I know that because of the um, research that's been done and our whole policy of conditional use permit and the fact that the string quartets that may be playing or other musicians, I, I'm sure it will all be done in very good taste. But that's why we have our um, use permits in place that if something does go awry and, and the police um, do become affected negatively and whatever, it, I, I have a feeling that it, it will be properly taken care of. Ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending zoning code section 20-23.030, table 2-6, allowable land uses and permit requirements for commercial zoning district section 20-24.030, Table 2-10, um, allowable land uses and permit requirements for industrial districts. And then the same um, section 20-28.070, table 2-20, allowed land uses and permit requirements for limited light industrial district. Section 20-42.034, alcoholic beverage sales. And section 20-70.020, Definitions of specialized terms and phrases, file number REZ12-004, and wait for the reading of the text. We have seven eyes. Thank you. Okay, council, do you want to get to the next public hearing before taking a break? Is that fine? Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, public hearing, please. You would rather take a break? Okay, we'll go ahead and take uh, take a break. I think we have something to snack on upstairs. Uh, 20 minutes, sound good?
Okay, let's uh, go ahead and reconvene and we'll move on to item 12.3. <clears throat> Our next public hearing is item 12.3, um, the Zoning Code Text Amendments for the Southeast Santa Rosa Food Desert, and Erin Morris will present. Thank you, Mayor Olivares and members of council. Uh, this project is a change to the city's zoning code to allow large grocery stores as a permitted use within existing buildings in Census Tract 1514.02, which is an area of Southeast Santa Rosa designated as a food desert by the United States Department of Agriculture. Brief background on this, um, there is an overall change to the city's policies and zoning regulations related to grocery stores and food outlets that you approved back on June 19th of this year. Um, following your action on that, you directed that staff bring back um, an additional change of the zoning code specifically to address the need for a large grocery store in the food desert. And then um, we developed that um, zoning code text amendment package and took that to the Planning Commission on July 26th. And they held a public hearing, uh, discussed it, and ultimately unanimously recommended approval of this zoning code text amendment. I have two maps. Uh, the first one shows the north half of the food desert, and the second half shows the, we'll look at the south. So the food desert, um, Census Tract 151402, is bounded by Highway 12 on the north, um, Highway 101 on the west, and Petaluma Hill Road on the east. So just to get your bearings, this is the Santa Rosa Marketplace here. And then traveling south, uh, this is Bellevue Avenue, so the marketplace is probably up here somewhere. Um, the food desert goes all the way down to um, Mountain View Avenue, the south side of Mountain View Avenue, and comes back around Petaluma Hill Road. And one of the questions I've gotten, and I kind of want to maybe go over this a little bit more at length, but still briefly, is sort of kind of why food deserts and why, why is there a definition for this and sort of what's the point of this project. And so from a federal government standpoint, since this was a federal study, uh, Congress initiated the um, Food Conservation and Energy Act of, of 2008. And they basically asked the USDA to do a study to look at improving access to affordable, nutritious food, particularly as it relates to disease and obesity prevention. So the, the USDA did a lot of studies. Out of that came this term, uh, food desert, which is defined by uh, the federal government as an area with low-income residents who have low access to a supermarket or large grocery store. Unlike the city zoning code definitions, the USDA does not define supermarket or grocery store the same way we do. It's a national thing. Um, basically, they define supermarket grocery store as a sort of full-service store that has at least $2 million in annual sales that provides a full product line, essentially meats, fresh meat, uh, vegetables, um, anything you'd find at kind of a typical Santa Rosa supermarket. But the key thing is, there, it's not a specialty store with a limited range, and it is not a membership store. It's a full-service store that's accessible to everyone, and, and part of their study shows why they believe um, those are important to address food affordability and also being able to get a full range of grocery products. So our food desert, which is the only one in Sonoma County, our census tract 151402, is approximately 3.4 square miles. Uh, most of it is still in the unincorporated county. Uh, we have 576 acres, or just a little less than one square mile in the city of Santa Rosa. And per the USDA, and, and all their national data actually goes back to 2010, so that's just important to note. These are 2010 numbers. At that time, there were almost 8,000 people living in this census tract, of which 2,626 um, had low access to a large grocery store, and that was 33% of the total population, which is a, basically the trigger for determining that this is a food desert. Additionally, they noted um, that 431 of the low-income people also had low access to vehicles, so therefore low access to the kind of mobility that would get them to um, a large grocery store out of the area. So um, going back to our food desert, most of it that's in the city is shown here. There's a little bit north of here, and this is, again, the marketplace is right around here, um, and this is Kiwana Springs. Actually, it's right here. And this is Kiwana Springs Road. Most of our zoned area is CG, so this part of the city is where, and the, the general plan is retail and business services. This is where we expect to see sort of the broadest range of commercial uses, everything from the low-key commercial uses to the more busy ones. And um, so... Essentially, what the Zoning Go Text Amendment would do would be sort of going one step further than the changes you approved in June. 
In June, we the city removed the prohibition on large grocery stores in this part of the city and also citywide. Uh, we said you can do a large grocery store through a conditional use permit process. What is before you is the proposal to eliminate the conditional use permit requirement just in the food desert within existing buildings for as long as that area remains a federally designated food desert. So that's sort of the, this is the next step that you asked us to go um, bring back to you. And well, this is a lot of text. It's really big on this new screen, but um, we'd accomplish this by adding a keynote to our land use table, and it basically would say that. Large grocery stores are a permitted use within existing buildings in Census Tract 1514.02 uh, because this area has been designated as a food desert by the United States Department of Agriculture. Once the area is no longer a designated food desert, this note is no longer applicable and proposed large grocery stores are subject to the land use regulations of this table. So essentially, when the food desert goes away, then this area will be regulated like everybody else citywide. Um, just touching on a few points that we always look at with rezonings, we looked at the city's general plan uh, policies and found that on a whole this rezoning is consistent with those policies. Um, for environmental review, um, we found that this project was covered within the general plan 2035 EIR and was specifically exempt from further environmental review by section 15183. I can provide a more technical explanation if you have questions about that, but that was the environmental review determination for the project. And um, I didn't. I did want to mention one other thing. Um, we did receive a lot of public participation through the first project, getting us to June, but haven't had a lot of public participation in this phase. Uh, we did publish an eighth of a page ad in the Press Democrat, and people do read those because they call us about them a lot. Um, I, there's one letter I received today from the Living Wage Coalition. Otherwise, I haven't heard from um, any other members of the public, pretty much. So. I'm happy to answer questions that you have, but I wanted to let you know that the Planning Commission and my department recommend that you introduce this ordinance and approve uh, this zoning code text amendment for the food desert. Sorry, Councilman Wysock. Thank you. So I appreciate the report. Thank you very much, Aaron. So Santa Rosa Marketplace is included within this desert. And there are three establishments that sell, sell food there. Now, I noticed that uh, one's a membership store. That's Costco, so that would exclude them. How does Target and Trader Joe's get excluded from, from that? Trader Joe's is considered a specialty market. And I had to, this is not even, I don't know, an eighth of the study that supports the Food Desert Project, but they categorize stores under a certain size um, as specialty, and that kind of store uh, according to um, both the county health staff that have been assisting me with this project as well as it's based on their conversations with the USDA, Trader Joe's is a specialty store, so it does not qualify. Interesting, because I bet they qualify on the uh, sales requirement. They, they probably do. One of the things to kind of keep in mind with regard to the USDA's interest about affordable and healthy food is that they're looking for the stores that provide the full array like down from dried beans, which is something, for example, you can maybe get at Trader Joe's, at least you can get something kind of approximating that, all the way to, you know, the other more fancy stuff. So I, I don't know how they did it, but they, Trader Joe's is not counted in their um, eyes. And, and Lola's, that's across the street on Petaluma Hill, is that considered outside the food desert? It's actually outside the food desert. It's east of the eastern boundary of the food desert. Just by nature of the street. It's the census tract. The census tract 1514.02 um, is divided at Petaluma Hill Road. It's so just if someone's across the street from Lola's in the food desert, in that tract, they're in the desert even though the oasis is right across the street. I don't believe it's looked at that way, but we're getting into really you know technical detail. I think that they do acknowledge stores that are nearby, but you have to kind of also keep in mind that they're looking at where are the people, the low-income people, particularly those with low access living, how can they get to these stores wherever they're located without, you know, the no, mile, no, the multi-mile track? I, I appreciate your answer, Aaron. I do. I just, it just kind of boggles the mind that the emperor in Washington, D.C. is giving, you know, giving us the, uh, uh, the definitions as to what's walkable or not walkable, and it's right across the street. Um, I did note that Low income was 33.1% and the floor is 33.0%. So yes. we're just kind of squeaking in there. Are these 2010 census numbers? 
These are 20, uh, 2000 census numbers. Oh, these are 2000 Yeah, census. they have not done any updates to the food desert designation. So we've had a census since then, but we're relying on 12 year old numbers. We are um, relying on the USDA's determinations about where the food deserts are located. I'm just, I'm trying to find the analogy about life in Shanghai very good and the emperor is very, very far away in Beijing. And that just, I, I, I'm really skeptical of calling us a food desert when we have all these establishments that sell food. That's, how about, could we, could we allow a farmer's market for fresh, fresh vegetables to set up with in some of these, would that help with uh, the food desert as opposed to changing this? Would that change? I'm just curious. It's just a thought because we had a, the food trucks downtown. I think why not have a farmer's market in this area to facilitate that? What would that do to this? The USD acknowledges that um, they call it a community food environment or a food environment, and that's actually something the County of Sonoma will be studying in this part of Santa Rosa actually starting this fall. But they acknowledge that a food environment isn't just the large grocery stores. It's also the you know, liquor stores, convenience stores, drug stores that sell food, and you know, farmers markets. They call them kind of community-based food initiatives. So they acknowledge that those efforts are positive and can have positive effects on public health, which is sort of their sure. lens. But they specifically relate the food desert definition to large grocery stores, low-income people with low access. So just one final question then. There is a farmers market irregularly or regularly at, at the Veterans Building. Isn't that walkable to, to some of the members in this Food desert? Probably. Possibly some folks in the north. It's not an um, easy walk, probably, but it is you know, accessible. I'm just, I'm just, just a thought. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Bartley? Yeah, just a point of clarification. <clears throat> Didn't we, uh, about, what, six weeks ago, already acknowledge this is a food desert and instituted the zoning code changes to allow supermarkets in this area? Which that we was your before. direction. That was our. And, and so really what we're talking about is, this is specifically regarding retenanting an existing building, not whether the supermarkets can be allowed in this area. It's just specifically being able to retenant existing buildings, correct? This is under the council's guidance on all these economic development projects about retenanting existing buildings, creating jobs, increasing permitted uses. Yes, but I mean, we did go through the discussion yes. six weeks ago about food desert, and I thought we were unanimous in saying, yes, it was a food desert, and we changed the zoning code appropriately and then gave additional direction. Yes. Thank you. Councilman Gore. Well, I do remember that conversation vividly. I think it occurred about 11 o'clock at night, and all of us were just really anxious to agree to something and move on. But never in my uh, imagination would I, did I think about uh, what this really means. And so it generates a number of questions. Um, we have a, a number of designated uh, community shopping centers, and I think I served with Mr. Bartley when we actually did have a discussion about a wonderfully designed mixed-use project with a shopping center on Petaluma Hill Road, but it looks as though Petaluma Hill Road and I think Kiwana Springs, is, if that's where it was, um, maybe outside the food desert, or at least the designation here. That site is designated on the general plan as a community shopping center, but it is east of the boundary of the food desert. So the, um, well, I, who designated the boundary of the food desert? It's the federal government uh, through the census. They okay. have census tract boundaries, and some okay. of them are very logical seeming, and some of them literally zigzag like a jigsaw puzzle through town, but um, it all comes from the federal census. Okay, and, and that may be, uh, I agree with Mr. Wysocki, that's somewhat arbitrary because, in fact, all of the people on the east side of this boundary, east of Petaluma Hill Road, do not have access to a supermarket over there. And um, probably a number of them would qualify for the income uh, categorization here. So I know I'm asking some speculation, but if in fact we had a large supermarket uh, inhabiting a, a, an existing building, the Circuit City building, for example, um, and I don't even know what that large supermarket would be, but what would that do to the demographics and the market share and the economics of any other grocery store wanting to locate anywhere in that southeast area? 
Uh, that is not something that I know. Uh, we did not study the impacts of retenanting vacant buildings on other similar uses. And, but I, I would speculate that, in fact, if we did have a grocery store on, along Santa Rosa Avenue, that um, unless the city grew dramatically on, in the southeast area, that the likelihood of having another uh, grocery store come in along Petaluma Hill Road would not happen for a long, long time. That's my speculation with a, with a little economics minor here. Um, if we allow this to move into an existing building, uh, the infrastructure is already built and, um, and we're sort of granting a benefit for an existing property owner. Are we prepared to give the same kind of concessions to another grocery store somewhere else? I mean, are we going to pave the way with a rezoning or, or anything else? Um, with part of staff's analysis, albeit it was only about six weeks ago that we were all here at 11 o'clock at night, we looked at are there other sites, how, like are there many sites in the food desert where there's existing buildings that could be retented with grocery? And I have concluded there's at least three or four different sites where either existing grocery that could expand or there's vacant buildings at present or there's some cases where there's buildings that are occupied now but could be vacant six months from now or a year from now. So this zoning code change would not benefit just one site. It would benefit any sites within the food desert where there's existing buildings but in need of a tenant. it's within the food desert, yes. not just on the other side of the boundary. It's within the food desert only. Do we have access to any kind of economics information that would talk about um, the economics of grocery stores? Because I think we've had this discussion before um, a number of years ago because we were speculating as to why a grocery store was not uh, constructed in, in southeast or southwest Santa Rosa? Um, the, the federal, the USDA has a lot of information actually about the economics of grocery stores. It's a little bit outside of the scope of the work that we were asked to do to get this item back to you kind of quickly relative to um, the economic development initiatives, but there's a lot of information about how, how grocery stores end up where they are, what kinds of customers they serve, how far people will drive, if they don't have cars, kind of what the substitutes are, if they don't have a grocery store nearby. Uh, there's extensive research available on that. Most of it within the last um, four years because it was initiated in 2008. And then the county actually has a ton of data about this because they've had the Southwest Santa Rosa Food Access Project and they're now swinging over to Southeast Santa Rosa. So they're another resource to the city on that topic. So absent that information, are we a little premature in taking this action tonight because it may preempt any other kind of projects, food projects in the southeast or perhaps even the southwest? I believe that this project implements the council direction that community development was given on June 19th and that ultimately it's attempting to, kind of, to unite economic development with a um, public health concern, um, but ultimately it's an economic development project, so I don't know what else to say. All right, if we took this action, um, what would be the process if a grocery store wanted to uh, tenant an existing building? What, what would they have to do? Well, at minimum, they would probably need to do building permits and uh, comply with building and fire code, because even with an existing building that's been built for general mercantile, there'll be some building changes that they'll want to do, and there'll be some building changes the building code will require. Um, to the extent that it's interior TI with tenant improvement without a lot of exterior changes, it could be just building and fire code related changes and permits. If they decide, and sometimes grocery stores have different features like outdoor changes or they want to make exterior improvements, um, then they would come through the design review process and that would be probably the main way that we would interface with them with permits. Uh, did I hear you say they, they would have to take out a conditional or minor use permit? If this is approved by the council, a grocery store wishing to occupy an existing building in the food desert would not need a use permit. They would need design review if they wanted to make exterior changes. And how would the community or the neighbors know of a particular grocery store or, for example, a Walmart might move into that building? I believe we might have talked about this on June, in June, but they will know when there's grand opening or they start to see activity as the store is gearing up to be opened. Um, the building permit process is a ministerial one and there's not public notification. Now, if design review is required, then owners within 400 feet 
would receive notice of that, and depending on the level of design review, there may be blue signs or not to alert more people about that proposed proposal. Okay, thank you. Council, other questions? We'll go to public comment. Thank you, Aaron. I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Uh, we'll begin with Judy Kennedy. Before I start, I would like to figure out how to work this overhead projector now that everything is new here. So maybe I could have a... Go ahead and set, set your paper down and we're good to go. Okay. Um, and then if I wanted to zoom in to something, do I... What do I... I don't want to touch anything until I know for sure. I'm not going to break the damn thing. <laughs> What'd you tell you? Okay. Okay. No. Um, okay. Good afternoon, City Council, Mayor Oliveras, and people. Um, Judy Kennedy, six twenty Oak Street. Um, Aaron Morris knowing that the Neighborhood Alliance has been advocating for uh, grocery stores in, within walking distance of every resident of Santa Rosa, she knew that it would be important for her to get in touch with us about the grocery store um, in general. And we met with her, Jenny Bard and I met with her um, sometime before June 19th. And we're thrilled that you did pass the, um, the grocery store amendment um, in June that um, makes it possible for small and large grocery stores to come into the downtown area and also to c come into neighborhoods. While we were discussing um, the grocery stores, we talked to her about the um, Circuit City site, and um, one of the things that we noticed, or that I noticed, is now the black X there is the site of the Circuit City. Now, right across the street, across Santa Rosa Avenue, uh, near this site are three separate mobile home parks. The first one, right there. If you live in that mobile home park, it, you have to walk five tenths of a mile to get to that grocery store because there's no easy access across Santa Rosa Avenue the mobile home park that is just below it, your walking distance is now six-tenths of a mile one way. There's a third um, mobile home park just below that one, and you are now walking eight-tenths of a mile to get to that grocery store. So it's obvious that this is not a grocery store that's going to be um, easily walked to. And I dare say um, a lot of people are not going to walk there. They're going to continue to use the little gr stores around them. Um, one of the things that I asked um, Aaron at that time was why doesn't council consider a farmer's market or a mobile farm produce truck that would go into these areas on a weekly or twice weekly or three times weekly basis so that these people could have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh eggs, bread, you know, the staff of life. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that there are cities all over the United States that are now doing this, mobile food trucks carrying produce from local community gardens to their food deserts. And this is happening in New Mexico, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and even East Oakland. Now, I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to ask that you not only look at changing the zoning code for bringing in these large-scale grocery stores, but also change the zoning code so that farmers' trucks and produce stands can come into these areas um, with the same openness that you're giving the um, developer and the property owner for the large-scale grocery stores. Thank you very much. Thank you. Martin Bennett? Martin Bennett?
I'm Marty Bennett, co-chair of the Living Wage Coalition of Sonoma County. And uh, we have submitted a letter to the council on this issue. Um, I am going to just excerpt from that letter. And there is one correction I'll make in it. The Living Wage Coalition um, disagree with city planning staff that the proposed amendment to the city zoning code within census tract 1514.02 in southeast Santa Rosa qualifies for the designation, designation as a food desert. Despite what the staff report says, the area is not a quote food desert. As described in the staff report, to qualify as a food desert, an urban census tract must either have a substantial number of low income residents, 20%, or have quote, low access to a large grocery store, defined as more than 33% living more than one mile from a large grocery store. The staff report claims that 33.1% live beyond one mile of a large grocery store. This makes no sense for the following reasons. One, in the middle of the census tract are a Costco, Target, and Trader Joe's all selling food. If these stores are, and please correct, if these stores are not excluded as large grocery stores over 20,000 square feet, then almost the entire population would be more than one mile from a grocery store. In other words, their interpretation of access to a large grocery store is incorrect. Second, Census Tract 1514.02 has a 2010 population of 9,177. The 7,934 figure identified in the staff report is from the 2000 census. Thus, the finding that this area is a food desert is based upon false assumptions and not the current 2010 census. It appears to be little more than a means to enable a developer to bypass the conditional use permit requirements for large grocery stores otherwise included in the current general plan and zoning code. At a minimum, the city council should direct staff to return with an updated analysis documenting whether in fact this census tract is a quote food desert. If it is not, then this zone text amendment should be discarded and any person seeking to locate a large grocery store in the area should be required to follow the same rules as anyone else. Third, even if this tract were truly a food desert, the statement in the staff report that the tax amendment is exempt from CEQA under section 15183 is incorrect. There is no evidence that general plan 2035 EIR evaluated and mitigated any of the environmental impacts on traffic, air quality, urban decay, et cetera, that might result from locating a large grocery store in this area. Furthermore, as we explained, this appears to be a misinterpretation of section 15183. Section 15183 exemption from additional environmental review was not intended to apply to zoning changes. The history of 15183 makes it clear it was intended to apply to actual development projects proposed Thank to you. be built Thank out you, and consistent with the adopted general plan. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Bennett. Scott Stegman. Thank you, members of the council. My concerns are fairly specific. I have historically been very supportive of retenanting and spoken both to the commission and the council in favor of such efforts. I have several concerns about this particular proposal. One, the food desert is an artifact created by a federal agency that has given you a conclusion that relies on 10-year-old data. The data is available. They simply haven't gotten around to crunching it. So by the time they crunch it, you might have exercised this provision and find out that, in fact, the issue no longer even exists. Secondly, there is no consideration of allowing as a permitted use relocation or retenanting without considering the impacts on the general plan provisions for a community shopping center and a neighborhood shopping center, both in that immediate vicinity. I am concerned 
that there is no consideration of the fact that with a, the degree of market share available, you may in fact be getting a via um, permitted use, a supermarket that then damps or reduces the capacity to get the supermarket where you want it, in the community shopping center, in the neighborhood shopping center. I think you need more supermarkets there, no doubt. One, maybe two. My concern is you're allowing the market to determine that for you, but you're pretend saying that that's a solution to a societal problem. If it's a societal problem of wanting to make sure everyone has access, then exercise your powers to accomplish that. If you just want to open it up, then fine. Take out the community shopping center designation, the neighborhood shopping center designation. That's, I would disagree, but that would make sense. But to grab on a social issue of this food desert and then turn around and say, let the market solve that for us while we sit back and cross our fingers. I think it's a bad idea. I think the market share will not support all the amount of activity, and I think that the two places where you want them to happen won't happen right away because development needs to get there first. My suggestion is, I think, a, a reasonable compromise, and that is require a minor use permit. If it's in a neighborhood where the people want it, where they're literally hungry for it, they'll support it. But if it's a bad show, if it's in a bad spot, if it's going to cut off the uses you want already as specified in your general plan, then you have some leverage. And that's all I'm recommending. I'm not saying I'm opposed to this broad swath at all. I'm saying the con concerns I'm raising can be accomplished and addressed simply by having that one slightly larger bit of control. Design review will not save a community shopping center designation. A, a minor use permit as a control for siting of a supermarket could do just that. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Lugero? Mayor, Council, uh, my name is Tom Lugero. I'm a commercial real estate with Keegan & Copen. I've specialized in shopping center and retail real estate for the last 25 years. Um, the zoning text amendment before you, I think, is in the best interest of the community, the retail property owners, the existing tenants, and future tenants that come into our area, or this area. It makes sense economically, socially, and, and from a community health aspect, it makes sense also. The area there is underserved by grocery and fresh foods, and this is an opportunity to serve the underserved. I, I strongly recommend that you follow your staff's recommendation as well as your planning commission's recommendation and adopt this zoning text amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Those are all the cards that I have. This is a public hearing. You do not have to fill out a card to speak on this item, so if you wish to speak, speak. please uh, come forward. Good evening. Uh, name is David Grable. I'm speaking on my own on this, this issue. Uh, a, f a couple of years ago, uh, there was a propos proposal to put a Walmart at uh, Sebastopol Road and Stony Point. Uh, a lot of community opposition, opposition from the neighborhood, whatever. This council basically turned them down, said that environmental review was inadequate. What this proposal would do is basically open the door to a Walmart or some, some similar kind of store uh, on, on Santa Rosa Avenue. Maybe that's what this pro-business council has in mind, but I think the public uh, deserves an opportunity to weigh in on that like they weighed in uh, at the project on Sebastopol Road. Uh, we need to look at the, the, the impacts, the, uh, the, the traffic, the parking, the blight that uh, something like Walmart brings when they come to a neighborhood. I, I tend to agree with um, uh, Mr. Stegman that we don't necessarily want to have a, a full um, conditional use permit process, but we do need to have an opportunity for real public input a minor uh, conditional use permit process, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a, uh, yeah, minor um, process would probably fulfill uh, th that, that wish. Uh, and what is the downside? 
why don't you want to let the public weigh in on something as, as significant as having a, a Walmart down there? Uh, it might work, might not work. Let's see what comes forward. Let's give the public a chance to, to speak on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak on this item? You want to come up to the microphone, please? I think you guys uh, should open up a Safeway down there on uh, Yolanda, Santa, Santa Rosa Avenue. I think that would be good, you know, and it's union jobs. You, know, you guys are all f uh, funded by unions. You should support unionized uh, business, you know, because it's such a small minority. So I really think you guys should do, you should do that. That would probably be good. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak on this item? See nobody rise. I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to council. Mr. Hours? The mention was made about uh, food food trucks in the uh, in the mobile home parks. Is there some prohibition against that? I, mean, I just don't know. My my understanding is that mobile food vendors have to keep moving every 30 minutes, which is a sort of a citywide rule, which is why they can't you know stop somewhere for more than 30. And then with regard to farmer's market and other outdoor activities, the zoning code allows those, but on a very limited basis through a temporary use permit um, process. I think it's a, it's a really great idea, and thank you for bringing it up, that that, that is, is a way to you know, provide another service for the area that's underserved. So maybe that's something we can look at in the future. Uh, okay. Thank you. Other questions? Councilmember Gordon? Uh, Question. Well, uh, I, uh, you probably saw me going over because I wanted to review the information from the USDA. I really want to understand how they develop the uh, census tract, the information, and more importantly, I'd like to understand the economics of grocery stores, uh, how many thousands of people they need to have surrounding them, what income level they look at. Uh, I am concerned about moving forward on this area w or this proposal without this uh, information. And what Mr. Regalia suggested was that I don't have ac I can't have access to the that particular document right here because the rest of you don't have access to that particular information. So I'm uh, not. I have so many questions about this. It may be a good thing. I don't know. But I'm really concerned about how this proposal might interfere with the uh, positioning of a future supermarket just over the boundary, because we know we've had that proposal before, and a couple of other community shopping center designations. So I would, uh, I move that we table this item until we are able to get more information to make a well-reasoned analysis moving forward. Second that. Okay, we have, we have a motion on the floor for discussion, please. Any discussion? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think your mic is on. Sorry. Let's say let's take action on the motion to table it. Take a, uh, no discussion? I, I'm just fire away? I, well, I mean, let's take action. I, I'm, what to no discussion. What to discuss, what, well, you action. have discussion after you vote on it. Yeah, we're going to. Go for it. Okay, I, I, was, I wasn't clear on your comment. I'm so, I, I apologize. I, I would I, I suggest my discussion point is let's just take action on that motion. On, on this current motion. On the current motion. On, yes. on tabling the item. Right, okay. Yes. Okay. We have uh, three ayes, uh, Councilmember Wysocki, Vasipre, and Gorin. I voted no. Councilmember Bartley, Sawyer, Oliveris, and Hours. Okay, motion fails. Bring it back to Council. Are we in discussion phase? Yes. No? Okay. I, I don't think there were any other questions. <laughs> Besides that, we can go, to, go ahead to, to discussion, please. I, uh, the discussion we had, I know it was late and we were all tired, and I, 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 uh, but I don't think saying we're we're, we were confused and didn't know what we were voting on is, is acceptable um, because we did know what we voted on. We voted on allowing grocery stores, supermarkets in this area already. We said that is what we want to do and we all voted for that. The only thing that's coming back to us is the discussion of the land use issue of whether we allow them to re-tenant an existing building. 
A conditional use permit is meant to impact, to study the impacts, the physical impacts of a project. If the building's already there, the physical impact has already been analyzed or the building wouldn't be there. And that's really all we're talking about tonight. Anything beyond that, I think, is, is stepping down the road to, um, and I think if you look at the people that are here commenting, um, it goes to living wage, it goes to the global issues, it goes to community impact reports. I don't think we want to go down that road. I don't think we have to date. Um, I think it's a bad idea. The living wage issue, I'm going to be honest, some of you have heard this, the idea that somehow um, part-time minimum wage jobs don't have any value. I started my life with a part-time minimum wage job working for a large company. And I was able, as an employee, to, to amass, I think, 90 shares of stock while I was working there because they had a stock purchase process. Um, I put that money aside, went away to college. By the time I was out of college, a few years, within 10 years, I had enough money that I was able to leverage it to buy my business. Um, within another three years, I had enough money that I was able to get a down payment for the house I live in today. So when people say those are dead-end jobs, I say bull. They aren't. Their jobs, and that's really what we talk about when we oppose this thing. This was really just a simple land use issue. Do we want people to have access to a supermarket in this area? Do we want people to have access to the jobs it'll produce? And uh, the simple answer is yes. Thank you, Mr. Rowers. I, I think one of the things that gets kind of lost in the discussion here is that we're trying to solve a problem. We have a place where people can't buy groceries can't buy what they should be able to buy. And we're looking for solutions to that problem. If we wait for some other market to be built some other place, we could be sitting here, I know I won't be, but 20 years from now talking about maybe we should approve this market. What we're trying to do is retenant an existing building. That's not a big deal. Uh, it is a big deal that if that retenanting provides the services that are lacking in the area, then we have accomplished something. There's a limit on how many of these can happen. Uh, it, if we get, if we're lucky enough to have that designation removed, then it's back to the original game plan. Right now, we have a big problem. We have a lot of people that can't get to the services they need to get to. I think what we're doing is just trying to improve the living conditions of people. And uh, anybody who's against that, I don't understand. I, it's a basic issue. And uh, this is a, a way that we can look at solving that, that problem. So I'm, again, this is, this is something that is, to me, simple. Let's get, let's get somebody in there that will prove what's needed in the area. This is an improvement for our city. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Waisaki. Thank you. Uh, boy, uh, to some of my colleagues, the preamble, it was late, we were all tired. That gives it away right there. It tells you right now that we didn't consider, we didn't have time to consider. What I learned tonight is this is somewhat of an arbitrary decision, or arbitrary de definition of a food de desert based on 12 year old data. So it was late and we were all tired. Yeah, we want to see if we can move forward. Sure, we want to retent it. Everyone on this dais wants to retent it. But there's also another basic principle. We want, do we want to have neighborhood input into what goes into that neighborhood or do we not? Do we want to be like Houston, Texas, or do we want to be like Santa Rosa, California? Because what I see here, I see a very, uh, Councilwoman Gorin hit it right on the head. It's an arbitrary de definition of a food desert. Trader Joe's sells food, doesn't it? Been to Trader Joe's? It's food. Target sells food. Lola's just over the line sells food. So it's not like there's no access. And if you look at some of these projects, it's right next to the freeway. That's not easy access either. Once they're in the car, they can drive a quarter mile, they can drive three miles. So it's a question of, do we want to allow the community to have input? And the proposal that there be a minor use permit is not onerous at all. Or do we just want to speed it through because it was 11 o'clock at night? No, that's the way we did it. That sounds awful like, oh, you know, I don't know, it sounds way too elementary. The community deserves a stake in this. There's nothing wrong with allowing access to more supermarkets, but on an arbitrary definition from the federal government based on 12-year-old data, please, this is not our job. We're not doing our job. We're just waving them on through. So if you want to go to Houston and see how it's done, because that's what you get. So I would, 
I think the motion to table was well advised. Let's get more current data. Let's make the right call. That's where I'm at on this. Councilmember Member Vassipre. Um, yes, thank you. I, I think that um, uh, you're right. Uh, we are in agreement that we want to have vacant stores retenanted. But I, I think that we also, uh, all of us would agree that we want more public involvement rather than less. And um, to me, the minor use permit is, is in place for very good reason. I don't think it's because we want people to go hungry or anything like that. I, to me, it just smacks of um, greasing the skids for um, a developer to come in. Now, if they're willing to come in and they're willing to follow our general plan, which to me has always meant a minor use permit for something like this, not just a facelift on the front. And I don't think that that should label you know, me as a non-business friendly person. I, I think that it, it, it should be something that we judiciously do. And I think the um, labeling of this as an artifact, a food desert, a catchy phrase, however you want to label it. Um, you know, I think we've got to look at current data. And, and I think we owe it to the public to follow the procedures that we have. And that's the minor use, per conditional use permit. I, I do not want to be a part of any signatory on um, greasing the skids for any reason that isn't done uh, other than a very judicious, careful way of looking at a building that would either be retenanted or a, a brand new building that there might be an opportunity in, in a location that would be more advantageous. But looking at data that is that old, I just don't think that you know we have to grease the skids and move quickly on based on that. Councilmember Gorn. Well, I'm sorry. It's a, it's appalling to me that four council members have absolutely no interest in understanding the market uh, economics of citing grocery stores. I'm very concerned that in our zeal to retenant a vacant space that we would be throwing out years of planning and potentially damaging a general plan that has been through a couple of iterations. I, it, if we took the time to really understand what it was that we were doing for a market, for a large market store, large grocery store, it may change our thinking if we knew that it would imperil a location of another grocery store in a different location that might be better placed to meet the needs of the people, the residents in Southeast Santa Rosa. This is the tail wagging the dog. And, and I understand retenanting vacant buildings because as mayor, I started that process. And we've made some significant strides in moving forward on that. And this may be a very good strategy to get there but I don't have the information uh, to make sure that, in fact, this is where we want to go right now. Why couldn't we just table the item, have an opportunity to really understand what we're doing in the future, and then make a more intelligent decision? But beyond that, I am very concerned that we are going to be placing a major grocery store slash big box store in this location without having a proper analysis of any traffic impacts. Now, it may be totally the same as what's being generated by the previous tenant, Circuit City, or any other vacant building, but I don't know that. If it's a Walmart, it's going to be a lot more impacts. If it is a Safeway, Safeway then probably might be the same, or some smaller version, but the public would have absolutely no information about the tenant moving in there until the ribbon cutting or design review. And that's concerning to me. I think this community has weighed in on a number of these kind of issues time and time again. They want to know what kind of businesses are moving into our community. I'm not asking that we delay this decision for years or never. I'm asking that we get the information to make a well-reasoned judgment in moving forward. 
So I'm, I'm disappointed, of course, and um, I'm disappointed that I was denied the information to review, just even skimming through it to give me some better information. But that's the way it is. We have uh, four council members who want to move this through in a very zippy process. So I will not be supporting this. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Well, in my eight years on the council, I've never heard the, that being um, late in, an, in a meeting was a reason not to move forward or, or after we had moved forward that it was a reason to reconsider. I, I think that if people wanted to not make a, a decision that evening, we should not have made the decision that we've made and it would not have been a, a 7-0 vote. Um, I, I think that, that how soon we forget the financial condition of the city and how soon we, we forget that people need jobs and how soon we forget that not everyone can afford Trader Joe's or Whole Foods and how soon we forget that a lot of families in this, in this town might want a grocery store in that area that's a little more affordable. I think we owe it to the public to move forward with this project. We owe it to the, to the, to the, to the business person who's willing to stand up and take a risk and put a business on in, that, in that vacant spot and, and not put a process for process sake. What I heard one of the speakers say tonight was, what's wrong with another process? What, what, is, what does this other process hurt? Well, it's a process. It's expensive. And that's what Santa Rosa needs to, to start be looking at and being a little more cognizant of, is when we make decisions about the process, that we make it fair and predictable, and that we don't just put a process, a process in place under the, under the guise of public participation when indeed it, isn't, it is merely a, a way to delay. If, this, if, there, if people were concerned about this, about this project, these, these chambers would be filled this evening. This is, it is not as though we hid this from anyone, and I'm going to support it. Thank you. Yes, it truly was not hidden. I think we had a uh, quite large article in the paper about this recently as well. There's been a lot of talk about this. Um, we work within the rules that we have. We have rules. We have guidelines. We have a, a food desert that's, that's been designated under certain guidelines. If we don't like the guidelines, we change the guidelines and work to do that but we have the guidance that we have available to us at this point. It too concerns me that we're making excuses about the lateness of an hour in making decisions. I th and I think the public should be concerned that they would have council members here making decisions that they don't recall be or because it was late that they're now having regrets about something they agreed to. That's not a good thing. It, it, it does concern me. This is a simple matter. It's a simple matter before us as the, just as the recommendation states and I will be supporting this. I'd, I'd like a chance to respond, Mr. Mayor, since, since my comments have been referenced to a number of times about the lateness of the hour. Uh, I don't believe this is a specific project in front of us. That's the whole point. That is the whole point. There is no project here. It was also when, when you learn new data after you, you've considered the item, are you telling me you don't have an obligation to consider that data? I think you do. You know, we're here representing the community. We should make the best judgment based upon the best information, and we haven't gotten that. So uh, business, to me, wants consistency. I hear it time and time again. We are being inconsistent by doing this, and we need to recognize the impact on the existing businesses that played by the rules that will be affected by another grocery store going in there when they complied with the general plan. I'm talking about the expensive Trader Joe's, which to me is, I've never heard of Trader Joe's be called unaff unaffordable, and the other grocery stores down there, Lola included, as well as the site on Yolanda that's in, in our general plan. So we're being inconsistent, and to me that's about as anti-business as you can get. They want consistency. That's what we need to do. That's what we owe our constituents. It's about looking for more and more hoops to throw out there, and I'm not going to be doing that. Mr. Hours? I, boy, I just want to comment. I, I'm, not sure what, I'm not sure what information was new. I mean, we had all this six weeks ago. I don't think anything that was presented today was distinctly different. It's more detail, but it wasn't distinctly different from what we had six weeks ago. I was unaware that the census data was 12 years old, sir. You don't think that matters? Was there a difference between 2000 and 2010 in our country? Was it the same? 
Well, in response to that question, the concept of a food desert was first raised six weeks ago. I had no concept of what that meant, other than I knew that there were no grocery stores. I didn't know that it was defined by a census tract. And certainly the census tract is extremely arbitrary because you and I both reviewed a proposal just a hop, skip, and a jump beyond that census tract. So indeed, uh, I think there's a lot of new information. And as I just said, I wanted even more information, and I was denied reviewing that. Uh, so in, that was my whole point. There is additional information out there. I would like to review it until we, and so then I can have reasonable information to make this, this decision. But apparently we're not doing that. Thank you. Mr. Hours? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> the, the one piece of information that we did get is that there's 2,000 more hungry people out there in that census tract than there were in 2000. So I don't quite see what the problem is. We're gonna, we have more people that we want to take care of. Uh, an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Section 2023-030, Table 2-6, allowable land uses and permit requirements for commercial zoning districts to allow large grocery stores as a permitted use within existing buildings in Census Tract 1514.02, designated as Food Desert by the United States Department of Agriculture, file number REZ12-003, and waive reading of the text. Second. Thank you. Motion passes with Council Members Bartley, Sawyer, Oliveris, and Howard voting yes. Council Members Wysocki, Vasaprey, and Gordon voting no. We'll move on to item 12.4. Uh, Our next public hearing is Yolanda Avenue General Plan Amendment Project and Final Supplemental Environmental Impact Report. And Bill Rose is the presenter. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to make a couple of introductions. Joining me tonight are members from Michael Bramman and Associates. That's the environmental consulting firm that's assisted us with the uh, secret review of this project. At the staff table is Jason Hayde. He's actually going to uh, give the CEQA presentation tonight. And uh, in the stands here is Randy Chafin. Jason Bramman could not attend, but he was instrumental in the CEQA rev uh, review as well. First off, I'd like to give a quick overview of uh, our presentation. Uh, I will begin with a project summary uh, and then describe the required discretionary uh, approvals that are before the council tonight. Uh, then I will, uh, as I mentioned, hand off to Jason and he will describe the CEQA review. Uh, in this case, uh, we prepared a supplemental environmental impact report for this project. Uh, then I will discuss the issues that we've identified and then lastly, the staff recommendation. So as the council may recall, uh, back in August of last year, the city council directed staff to pers pursue a general plan amendment for just over eight acres of land located at 325 Yolanda Avenue and 2532 Santa Rosa Avenue. And the proposal was to change uh, just under three acres of medium density residential land uh, and just over five acres of light industrial land collectively to retail and business services. So at the outset of the project, staff developed a number of objectives uh, to inform our, our analysis going forward. As an economic development project, uh, the primary objective is to stimulate new capital investment by removing a potential obstacle to new commercial development on the Yolanda Avenue site. Essentially, we're preparing that site for future commercial development. In addition, the proposal is uh, intended to promote the development of the highest and best land uses on a currently uh, quite underutilized site. And lastly, uh, we intend to establish a uniform commercial general plan land use designation on this site. It's a site that's actually currently zoned for commercial uses, and we believe it's well suited to support those uses. 
The other component of this project is uh, the transfer of development potential of a minimum of 35 dwelling units from the Yolanda Avenue site to a site or sites better suited for such uses. And I'll describe this uh, component in more detail in just a moment. With that, we believe that the project will maximize the efficient use of residentially designated land by increasing density on an appropriately located lower density site or sites. And this will also further the goals and objectives of the city's housing element. And lastly, we believe that this project will ensure that adequate sites are available for development of a variety of housing types. So with regard to the existing conditions of the Yolanda Avenue site, uh, it consists of two parcels. They're adjacent to one another. They total just over 10 acres. 325 Yolanda Avenue is currently designated light industrial, and it's zoned, as I mentioned, general commercial. And 2532 Santa Rosa Avenue, uh, it's five acres. It has a split designation. A portion of the site is retail and business services. That is not proposed to be changed and 2.7 acres is designated medium density residential. And as I said, it's zoned general commercial. So this is an aerial photo of the site. You can see uh, it's roughly at the uh, northeast intersection of the Yolanda Avenue and Santa Rosa Avenue intersection. Uh, this area here is where the current McDonald's restaurant is. This is the Santa Rosa Avenue site this portion here that front Santa Rosa Avenue is currently designated retail and business services. It's this portion back here that's designated residential. And the site that fronts Yolanda Avenue is the industrially designated site. So now we move on to the what we term the housing replacement sites. We've selected three that we feel are viable uh, and can sustain additional residential development. The first is 3015 Petaluma Hill Road. It's just about seven and three quarters acres. It's currently low density residential and accordingly it's zoned R16, which is single family residential. The next site is on Mita Avenue, 1865. It's just over four and a half acres. It's currently designated medium low and zoned single family. And then the last housing replacement site is the Montecito Shopping Center. It's approximately 18 acres and it has a mixed use designation. It's uh, currently retail and business services and medium density residential, and the zoning is community shopping center. These are the aerial photos of those three sites. Starting on the left of your frame, you can see the property on Petaluma Hill Road. It's just to the south of the intersection of Yolanda and Petaluma Hill Road. And then in the middle of the frame is the Montecito Center. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with this site. It's mostly vacant. The uh, existing commercial development is located primarily primarily in this area uh, near the intersection of Montecito and Middle Rincon. And then on the right side of your frame is the Mita Avenue site. And there are a mix of uh, land uses around this property. To the south is single family residential. To the north is a medium density development. And there's a school to the west. So this general plan amendment would establish a uniform retail and business services designation for the roughly 10 and a half acres on the Yolanda Avenue site. But when you take this into consideration with the surrounding properties, what would result is roughly 12 and a half acres, an assemblage of parcels that would create 12 and a half acres of commercially designated land. The 2.7 acres designated for medium density residential on the Yolanda site is identified as potentially supporting 35 dwelling units. So when we develop a medium density site, we encourage uh, development at the midpoint of the density range, and that's 13 units an acre. So that's how we came up with 35 units. So essentially, the proposal is to take 35 dwelling units off of the Yolanda site and replace those and put them on a site that's better suited for residential development. As I've mentioned, we've selected three sites that we think are better suited for that type of de development. The Petaluma Hill Road site would be redesignated to medium density and the companion rezoning to R318. And the result is a 48 unit residential dwelling increase. The site currently can sustain 52 units and that would go to 100 units. 
Meta Avenue would have a similar change. It would go to medium density uh, in the general plan and R318 zoning. And the unit increase would be a 13 unit net increase from 46 to 59. And then lastly is Montecito Center. The proposal here is to take three acres of that site, roughly three acres, and redesignate that to medium high density residential. The existing zoning would remain unchanged. And this would result in 35 unit, a 35 unit dwelling increase on that site. So it gives us exactly what we need to replace that from the Yolanda site. With Montecito Center, we've added one other uh, proposal for the council to consider and that's a policy. And the policy states this, the Montecito Center mixed use site shall be developed with a minimum of 180 residential units. The units may be distributed throughout the approximately 18 acre site as determined through the development review process. So the purpose of that was twofold. One, we wanted to ensure that the 180 units would be memorialized clearly and explicitly in the general plan. And we also wanted to make sure that a flexible development would occur. We know that mixed use, uh, mixed use sites uh, can be challenging and we wanted the designers, the architects, as well as the city staff through the development review process to have some flexibility that those housing units could go where are most appropriately, where they would be most appropriately located on the site. Uh, the council should note that none of the actions tonight confer development rights. There are no f uh, physical development or ground disturbing activities associated with this proposal. It is a land use and zoning change. There is no development project tonight. So the first action uh, before the council tonight will be the CEQA action. Uh, in this case, as I said, it's a supplemental environmental impact report. Uh, also the general plan amendment and the rezoning actions. So at this point, I'm going to turn the podium over to Jason Hayde to discuss the CEQA process. May I just ask a question, Mr. Rose? Certainly. First. Thank you. Um, I'm confused because um, when you just spoke about the Montecito Center, then as I'm looking, unless something's been left off of um, the recommendation part, it, um, it stops with Mita. Avenue. It doesn't say anything more about action on Montecito. What page in the staff report? Well, on, on your slides, um, there's reference to the Montecito Shopping Center and what you just read about the LUL-H-3. Uh -huh. But on what I have as far as the recommendation that we're going to be voting on, it stops short of any mention of Montecito. So are we or are we not considering anything with Montecito? You, you are. So the and recommendation. Why is it not on here then? I'm not sure exactly what you're looking at. This is the, the agenda. agenda. It, it is because it's, he, she's referring it to the, it's the corresponding general plan amendments, which are the other three sites, correct? That's correct. So the general plan amendment package that we're proposing to the council is for all of the sites, Yolanda, Petaluma Hill Road, Mita, and Montecito Center. I, I understand that, but I'm just saying what the public is reading, there's no mention under recommendation. So I think that would be difficult if we say that we're doing, you know, the job of informing the public as to what we're going to be discussing. Maybe it was just a sentence or part of the sentence that was left off. It, so it is mentioned okay. in the background in I the understand agenda. That. I understand right. that. I'm as one of the general plan amendments. Right, amendment. yeah. So. I just think we need to, you know, cross all the T's and dot the I's, and I think it was just probably an oversight was left off. Is that what we're, that's the conclusion? I, I'd have to look at the agenda. Yeah. I, I, I think just it was clearly just can state to the council that the proposal is for all of the sites that we've referenced for general plan amendments. I think it was the way it was put together. There's not a rezoning on that particular site. So the way that the language was written was general plan amendments and rezonings on those other two sites, the other two residential sites, I think would have rezoning would have zoning changes okay. going forward. So one's just a general plan amendment, the other two are rezoning. So there's a difference okay. between the actions that are actually That's being fine. taken. That's fine. I so just am yeah. wondering. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Alvarez, uh, members of the city council. As uh, Bill mentioned, I'm Jason Hayde with uh, Michael Bram Associates. We prepare the supplemental EIR uh, for the project. 
Uh, just to start, I'd like to walk you through a brief CEQA overview. Um, as you probably know, the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, requires lead agencies to identify, evaluate, uh, disclose to the public, and mitigate to the extent uh, possible the environmental impacts of proposed land use activities. Uh, for this project, in, in this case, the City of Santa Rosa is the lead agency. A supplemental EAR um, must be certified before the project is approved. As uh, Bill briefly touched on, we prepared a supplemental EAR for the project. Um, this was to essentially augment the analysis prepared for the previous Lowe's Home Improvement Warehouse uh, EAR. So together with the Lowe's uh, EAR, the document before you this evening uh, constitutes the complete environmental analysis uh, for the overall project. Uh, it's important to note that although no specific development is proposed at this time, the project previously evaluated within the Lowe's EAR is a reasonably foreseeable use at the Yolanda Avenue uh, site. So this EIR reviews the uh, general plan amendment for the Yolanda Avenue site as well as the um, three housing replacement sites that we've discussed thus far. The supplemental EIR uh, revises the previously certified Lowe's EIR through uh, supplementation of that previously completed analysis. It handles uh, the Yolanda site and the housing replacement sites in different ways. For the Yolanda Avenue site, it um, supplements the analysis contained within the Lowe's EIR. It identifies and analyzes uh, impacts, be uh, differences between the proposed project and the Lowe's project. And lastly, it does that at a project uh, level. Whereas uh, with the housing replacement sites, uh, it provides a new analysis of those potential impacts because they were not included as part of the Lowe's uh, project. It uh, analyzes the difference between the potential impact of the development under the existing general plan land designation versus the new designations that are in the staff report uh, for each of the housing sites. Uh, lastly, it provides a program level analysis of that uh, part of the project. Just to touch on a few of uh, the uh, CEQA milestones for the project, a notice of preparation was released on uh, February 28th of this year. That was followed by a scoping meeting held on March 15th that provided an opportunity for uh, public input and comments. The draft EAR was released on May 16th. Um, there was a comment session held at the Planning Commission uh, back on June 28th, just before the close of the uh, public review period, which occurred on uh, June 29th. Uh, one more to note there too, the Planning Commission considered and recommended certification of this EIR um, on July 26th after hearing. To summarize the draft uh, supplemental EIR, it includes a project description, uh, five topical sections. These include air quality, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, land use, noise, public services and utilities, and uh, lastly transportation. Other topics uh, were scoped out during the NOP scoping process, so you'll notice they don't appear within the EIR. The alternatives analysis includes uh, three separate alternatives that were uh, looked at. This also features the environmentally superior alternative. The last two topics discussed in the EIR include uh, cumulative effects and the technical appendices, uh, which serve as the backup material for the document. Uh, within the appendices, there's the NOP as well as the responses that were submitted by the public and ag um, other agencies during that time period and uh, the traffic study. As far as conclusions of the draft supplemental um, EIR, it found that the project con is consistent with all applicable provisions of the city's general plan and uh, municipal code. Uh, it found the project would not expose people to excessive noise levels. The EIR also concluded that nearby sensitive receptors uh, would not be exposed to unhealthy levels of air pollution as a result of the proposed uh, project. As far as traffic, the project analyzed in the Lowe's EIR uh, would result in significant and unavoidable traffic related impacts, uh, whereas this project would actually result in less than significant traffic impacts. Uh, just to note, too, that the, the EIR concluded that there were adequate uh, public services available to serve the, the various parts of the proposed project. Several uh, key mitigation measures, uh, just to discuss briefly, include um, 
air emissions reduction measures, greenhouse gas emissions reduction measures, and uh, public safety services funding measures for uh, future residential development. I should point out that uh, no additional mitigation measures were required or identified as needed for uh, noise or traffic issues. So the EIR concluded that all impacts can be mitigated to a level less than significant with the exception of the three I'll uh, touch on now, which were included in the previously certified Lowe's EIR. Uh, these relate to traffic. They are uh, near-term arterial operations, long-term arterial operations, and uh, freeway mainline operations. Um, as some of you may recall, the Lowe's project was actually uh, not approved, although the EIR was certified. Uh, for this reason, a statement of overriding considerations uh, will be necessary to supplement the previously uh, certified EIR uh, this evening. Moving on to the final EIR, um, I'll briefly go over the contents of that document. It includes uh, an introduction, uh, also includes all the public comments received uh, during the 45-day public review period. These include comments from uh, Caltrans, the uh, Bay Area Air Quality Management District, uh, Mark Wolf on behalf of the California Healthy Communities Network and Sonoma County Living Wage Coalition. And finally, uh, they also addressed the Planning Commission comments received um, at both of those hearings. Um, continuing on with the final supplemental EAR, it includes a response to those comments I just identified. It includes an errata, which basically just includes minor uh, clarifications or corrections to any outstanding issues. And uh, lastly, it includes a mitigation monitoring and reporting program. Um, We'd like to note that no comments received during the public review period changed any of the EIR conclusions or findings. And with that, I will pass it back over to Bill. So as Jason mentioned, this item has been before the Planning Commission on two occasions. Uh, in June, the Commission held a public hearing on this item. Um, they did so on the environmental impact report as well as the project. And then they actually took action in July. And the Commission recommended that the City Council certify the supplemental impact report and approve the general plan amendment amendments and rezoning actions associated with this proposal. With regard to issues, staff has identified one issue in particular, it's related to the site on Mita Avenue. Uh, that site does not independently satisfy the housing replacement that we need. Uh, it only offers 13 units, whereby we need 35 units. However, in completing the analysis, staff believes that, that is a viable site for increased residential density. We did the land use analysis, we did the environmental analysis. Uh, it's in proximity to other medium density developments uh, and we think that it would provide a welcome mix of housing in this area. So in conclusion, the Planning Commission as well as planning staff recommend that the City Council certify the final environmental impact report, approve the general plan amendments, and approve the rezoning act, uh, actions associated with the Yolanda Avenue general plan amendment project. Thank you, Bill. Questions? Mr. Bartman. Yeah, just um, one on the Petaluma Hill Road site did you look at um, I mean, obviously you were you were you were set off with a goal of finding replacement so you want medium density because it satisfied it I guess the question is did you consider medium low density as a change and and, and I, I, I'm getting fuzzy on what what that would mean in terms of additional units I don't recall uh, well the the exercise was it was it started out essentially a mapping exercise to look at the general plan and look for sites that were of adequate size uh, that were in good locations that could take the additional units. So really everything was a possibility. Uh, it's just that we identified these sites and so we took the designations that we selected because they seemed like the sites could sustain those additional units. Okay. Is, and on that, again, on that site in, the, in your uh, staff report, you talk about that um, access probably would not come off of Petaluma Hill Road um, other than being very busy. Is there another reason or is that the reason why 
it would it would probably be problematic to do that. Yeah, it was based on uh, traffic analysis, and it, it was somewhat of a cursory review. The uh, uh, this project didn't include a detailed site analysis, so we really have to leave that to a development proposal when that comes in. Okay, okay, but it would at that point because I'm it, I'm just trying to get a handle on trying to get relative distances, whether a traffic light or something else could be part of a project that happened there and gain access on the Petaluma Hill Road. Certainly those could be options, yeah. Um, and then just one point of clarification, the statement of overriding considerations is contained inside the resolution. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Councilor McGoy. I have uh, two questions. Um, the, uh, the, one, the site on Petaluma Hill Road it looks like the uh, surrounding, at least to the the west and the south. Do you know Do you know what density that is? It's single family detached homes, but I don't know what density that is. Is that six so, eight? So or I believe this here. This is a single family residential density. This uh, This doesn't go out wide enough, but there is on Birch Street uh, to the southwest a medium density development. It's an apartment complex. There's a park in the vicinity, and so all of those things, in addition to proximity to transportation, commercial uses, is what led us to believe this was a viable site. Okay, now I do have a question regarding the Mead Avenue, the um, one, uh, the uh, complex just north of there actually is a fair, fairly dense project, affordable housing project, mm -hmm. I, and I know that the particular site is uh, abuts some community gardens and a small strip park. Is there any other park that's designated? Well, of course, we, that may be part of the consideration if this were developed uh, as to whether any part of this particular parcel would be connected with a community garden site and the community park. And so that would be a discussion. But aside from the lineal park further south, is there any other park that might be designated around there? Uh, I think, again, in a wider view, there is some to the south, uh, shown on the general plan maps. And certainly the, the small park that you mentioned would be a consideration, but when a project comes in. So we didn't have the ability, uh, with the scope of this proposal, to have that kind of analysis. Uh, I also know that there is um, a drainage swale that's pretty significant on the property to the east of this, and I think it continues on through this property, which would limit it, u its usability for housing production. Yeah, actually the site to the east is a companion site. It's a similar size, uh, similar designation, and we chose not to select that because those reasons uh, could further impact development as well as it's uh, much more tree covered, so. Yes, they, we've attempted to come up with some projects for that. Nothing has ever been terribly successful. So uh, the, the project just to the north, is that medium density also? Yes. So it would be consistent with the south. Yep. Thank you. Councilmember Vastapre. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, there are not um, a highly visible number of people here in the uh, audience, it looks like, to object to this. Um, but in our packet, we've got um, Petitions from people who um, uh, they say we understand that another a suitable site has been selected for the purpose of this project, that is the Montecito Avenue site. This site appears much more suited to handle the housing offset the city seeks in order to develop the Yolanda site. We strongly urge the commission to consider the Montecito site for the purposes of this project and deny the zoning change for the Petaluma Hill Road site. So uh, that leads me to believe that these people think that there's not even any consideration of the Petal Petaluma Hill Road site. I think their opposition to me shows that they know we're considering it. Uh, so you're correct, the Montecito Center site, it does give the 35 units exactly that we're seeking right. to replace. Um, uh, I did receive the most opposition uh, on the Petaluma Hill Road site. But we, as I've mentioned, think that that is a, a good site for increased density. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Councilman Wasaki. Thank you, Bill, for the report. Appreciate your efforts, and Chuck, you too. 
Um, right now on the Yolanda Avenue site, it's it's part of its zoned light industrial, right? Correct. Do we have? Uh, I, I see that we have an available inventory of a in the city of. Oh, I want to say 60 acres. It's in the report somewhere. It's in the report. I don't know it off the top of my head. But it, it, as we saw with the with the Bodine plant, isn't there generally community opposition whenever we try and zone two industrial or light industrial? Isn't that somewhat problematic? I would say it really depends on the site. Right. But here we have an existing, uh, to me, from what I've seen in my short tenure as a council member, is, Industrial site with sites within the city are somewhat uh, limited. They're, they're hard to come by. We analyzed it, and we think that the the uh, to change this to remove the general or the light industrial designation is a negligible negligible decrease citywide, and so that's why we support this change. But it's right next to a, a industrial site, which is the the petroleum farm, right? The uh, the uh, facility. So it's. It does seem to me that it's, it's proper that industrial and light industrial belong together. I mean, I, I understand that you feel apparently with your professional judgment we have plenty, but to me you want to put industrial with industrial. That's just an opinion, I, I guess. I, I guess what's most troubling to me is, uh, well, let's move on. We don't have a specific project for the Yolanda Avenue site. We just have a, a concept of what a project might be, correct? Uh, there's no specific project, correct? That's just a concept. How can we have, then, then how can we find as a council the statement of overriding considerations when we have no idea what, a pro what the project is? That's highly speculative. Well, we're tearing off the certified EIR for the Lowe's project, so we're taking that as our foundational document. We're doing additional analysis related to this specific project, and those are the conclusions that we've come up with based on the certified EIR and our additional analyses. So basically, if Lowe's comes back, we've already accommodated them, basically. I, I think that it would be the job of the council to, to make findings and to make determinations that the benefits of the project as proposed tonight would outweigh the um, significant impacts that, are, that have been analyzed in the original EIR. I appreciate that. That would be significant impacts from a future project. So if something were to come back in a year to two years, we've already said, hey, we, we've already analyzed that with our, in our infinite wisdom tonight. Okay, that's, that's quite the statement. Um, I'll, I'll, I'd, I'd like a little break. That one kind of seizes me as, as being uh, putting the cart before the horse, but uh, it's troubling. Thank you. Councilmember Member Gorin. Um, Ms. Dillon, I'm sorry, I, between your little croaky voice and, and the new microphone system, I couldn't hear exactly what you said regarding that. The, the EIR for the Lowe's project, the, 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 which is the original document that did a substantial amount of analysis on that site, um, and is supplemented by the additional analysis in the supplemental EIR, has identified potentially significant impacts that would require a finding of um, a statement of overriding consideration for certification, and we need to bring those forward through the supplemental EIR process. It's the job of the council to make a determination that the benefits identified by the particular project that's in front of you tonight um, would outweigh the potentially significant impacts that were identified. Okay, but um, I want to follow up on that. Whoops. We do have we do have a project. We do not have a development proposal. We we have a project that's that's been identified in the supplemental EIR. It's different from the one that was in a, was originally analyzed in the okay. in the original EIR. If a specific project would come forward in six months, eight months. Mm -hmm whatever it is, that would fit within this uh, evaluation, does it have to come back before the City Council again? I think it would depend on the specific development proposal that, that we would be considering. Okay, so hypothetically, if it were a Lowe's store a, or a Walmart store, would it have to come back before the City Council again, and would it have to do any more supplementary 
EIR? I, I mean, again, I think it would depend on the specific project. There are criteria that would trigger some additional discretionary review. Um, staff would have to do uh, an analysis of the particular development project to determine whether or not it was within the scope of the existing environmental analysis to determine whether it was appropriate to do any further environmental analysis. I mean, we really can't say for sure. And if the, de if the staff determined that it fit with whatever action we might take tonight, then it, uh, any discretion that the council might have has been removed. We would not have any more. It's already been rezoned. The EIR has been approved, and it really goes right to design review. It's possible, yes, because the job of CEQA is to make sure that the decision-making bodies have done the environmental analysis. Between the original EIR and the supplemental EIR, there's an extensive amount of environmental analysis, so it's possible. If I may just add a, a little point of clarification. If a project comes in, like Lowe's, we know that it's going to trigger design review. That's a discretionary action. We have to do CEQA on that. So much like this project, if we have a certified EIR that we can look to, we will. But if we have to do additional analysis, we will do that as well. And it is a discretionary action. So it would go to the design review board for design review. Retail over 50,000 square feet requires a full conditional use permit. That goes to the Planning Commission just the same. It would still need CEQA analysis. And, and it, it could be appealed then to the City Council. Correct. But it would not automatically come before the City Council. As I've just described it, it would not. But we don't know what the project would be and if any other entitlements would be required. And one more question, well, I, I do recall, obviously, it's located next to Redwood Petroleum, and I recall from the Lowe's EIR that it had some plumes uh, partially on this site and partially uh, across Yolanda and further south. Would there be any requirement that it would be monitoring wells or anything uh, to really uh, analyze where those plumes are going? Because we don't know what the project is, I can't really answer that. Uh, all I can really say is if there's a discretionary permit needed, we have to review it against CEQA. Okay. You're not helpful at all. I'm trying. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bartley. Uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, well, tonight, isn't it true that virtually any, any, dis any land use decision we make south of Highway 12 that has any significant um, traffic impact isn't that pretty typically? We've always had make a find make a find a, um, a statement of overriding condition, oh, whatever, to um, to approve any project because everything impacts the Hearn Avenue interchange, correct? I mean, I can't yes. recall. I'll, I'll look to Chuck because I think that's I know that's the case. Yes. And um, and then just one other thing: this 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 piece, this 2.7 acres of residential property. Isn't it left over, I believe, since I was on the Planning Commission when it happened, that when two general plans ago, we rezoned the Redwood Oil property and this 2.7 acres to medium density residential. Subsequently, um, it was, the Redwood Oil was removed and turned back into light industrial when, because when we do general plan updates, we don't tell everybody what we're doing. They get to find out on their own. And this piece of property was just, it's just sort of an island that was left that nobody thought about because we were focused on Redwood Oil. I know when I was on Planning Commission, we didn't think about anything other than the specific project before us. Is that not true? I, I believe you're correct. Okay. Other questions from Council before I go to comments? Mr. Wysocki? I do have a follow-up. If, if we had a specific development proposal in front of us for this, who would bear the cost of, of this EIR and all this analysis? Typically, the applicant uh, would, would pay the entitlement fees and bear the costs. How much would that be? It depends on what the applications are. How much do we have into this here, the city? Uh, this particular project is about 200 hours of staff time, um, about $20,000. We have uh, fees, um, I mean, not fees, uh, 
public hearing notices at about four or five thousand. And then the, the cost of the supplemental EIR was $100,000. The city paid half of that, and, and the property owner paid half. So, so we have $60,000, $70,000. And it, I appreciate that. I'm not, that, that. That's the ballpark. So if there was a development proposal, that would be borne by the applicant or the property owner, not the city. Yes. Thank you. Well, just to clarify, are they going to reimburse us for the cost that we have sunk into this? Well, the, by they, do you mean the property owners? Uh, the, or they, the project developer. Well, there isn't a project Pro developer. I, I know, but, but a future project We've already developer. been reimbursed for half of the cost of the EIR, of this EIR, uh, of the supplemental EIR that you're considering tonight. Uh, there's no plan to get reimbursed further that, I, that I'm aware of. We, we achieved the reimbursement when the, when the property owner agreed to pay half of the EIR cost. Thank you. Thank you. This time I will go to public comment uh, and open the public hearing. I have two cards, uh, Jan Vasquez. We'll, we'll switch it over for you right now. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, my name is Jan Vasquez. My name is Jan Vasquez. I'm the property owner at 2431 Summer Creek Drive. This is the property that is at the end of the street, immediately adjacent to uh, the Petaluma Hill property uh, that is under consideration tonight for rezoning. Um, I wrote a letter uh, to Mr. Rose in March hoping that this would be passed on to your environmental consultants. I raised uh, four general plan policy issues. I know that in an EIR they have to address consistency with the general plan, and I felt that these four policies, in fact, uh, were in conflict as it related to the rezoning um, of the Petaluma Hill property. Um, to reiterate, and there is a copy of my letter in your packet, um, one of the uh, policies is to promote creation of neighborhoods, not subdivisions, in areas of new development. And this is furthered under pursue, pursue the goal of meeting Santa Rosa's housing needs through increased densities when consistent with preservation of the existing neighborhoods. Um, I'd like to point out to you what your current general plan does and how this would impact the, um, the pattern of existing development in the general plan and specifically how it affects the uh, harvest subdivision. You have a pattern of um, business and um, services along uh, Santa Rosa Avenue interspersed with it and immediately behind it are uh, mobile home parks and medium density residential. It transitions into low density and um, medium density, I'm sorry, correct, medium low density residential as you move away from um, Santa Rosa Avenue and toward Petaluma Hill Road. Up here is um, 
Taylor Mountain Ridge Line, which provides a scenic backdrop. Um, if you take a look at the Petaluma Hill Road property and now flip over the attachment that I've provided, you'll see that there is suddenly an isolation of a portion of the harvest subdivision. What happens is on this northerly portion, um, it has industrial zoning along the back, medium density at the side, and um, now a proposal for medium density. This does not support the, the um, neighborhood. Um, I Go can't on. believe my three minutes are already Your gone. Your three minutes are up, yes. May I make a few more comments? Or? You're, just, no, okay. you're pretty much done, thank you. Megan Sweeney? Do you, do you have a draft, ma'am, of what else you were gonna say? I'd, I'd be interested in I that. have speaking notes. Do you pass them to the clerk? I'd be happy to look at them. Megan Sweeney? Um, my name is Megan Sweeley. I am a resident at 2419 Summer Creek, which, oh, sorry. I reside at 2419 Summer Creek. My husband and I purchased a home there six months ago, seven months ago. Um, so we are, as Das Quezies, almost neighbors. Um, and I'm going to speak more on the fact that, as a mom in our neighborhood, being truly a little gem in the middle of Santa Rosa, as far as being very neighborhood friendly, our children play out in the front yards. Um, that was one of our greatest considerations when looking at neighborhoods. And um, if you were to put 100 multifamily homes at the end of our street, it would destroy our neighborhood and the whole integrity of it. Um, you know, the EIR says that access to this, that the Petaluma Hill site via Petaluma Hill Road is not an option, which means the only other option is coming through our subdivision. <laughs> and I don't want, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's just no way that, that means Burt Street, Summer Creek, all those through streets, you know, Burt Street, you just opened up a beautiful park less than a year ago, the community park. I mean, to have, having all that additional traffic, all the additional crime it would bring, um, would just be devastating to the whole, the whole aura of our neighborhood. Um, you know, uh, our neighborhood did write a letter in opposition. Um, we had 25, I think, signatures from my immediate neighbors. Um, we didn't go farther into the subdivision. We did it rather spur, um, on spur of the moment. We thought we should get something on before the planning commission hearing. Um, you know, I, I just would draw your attention to that. I pretty much have said everything as my neighbors did on that. And I would just ask you to reconsider putting 100 multifamily units at the end of our street, which would pretty much mean that everything would go through our subdivision. And um, that's all. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. David Grable? Good evening, David Grable with the Housing Advocacy Group. Uh, <clears throat> we like the designation of additional sites for multifamily housing. Keep that. Um, there are some issues with the 2.7 acres in the Yolanda Avenue site uh, with the designation for multifamily housing on that, uh, on that site. Kind of agree with Councilmember Bartley that that was not a good site given that it's got some plume issues and other stuff. But um, we don't like this Lowe's 2 uh, uh, proposal. This is a, clearly a backdoor way of getting a big box uh, into that Yolanda Avenue site. Uh, you remember uh, a couple years ago, you saw uh, Friedman Brothers say uh, a Lowe's there would put them out of business. Me Mead Clark was here. Um, uh, Exchange Bank uh, urging this council not to approve uh, a Lowe's at that site. 
And now what you're doing is, is essentially giving them free reign to come in. Uh, they won't have to do any environmental review. It's all done. Uh, you know, the city needs money, yeah, uh, but you don't need to put Friedman's and Mead Clark and other good, solid, long-term local businesses out of business in the process. Um, it, it, the taking the, uh, the residential uh, 2.7 acres uh, out of residential, making it uh, commercial, you're, you're, you're rezoning, you're changing the general plan land use element, but you're not changing the housing element, which is a big problem. Your, your general plan's got to be consistent throughout. All the elements have to be consistent. You're saying in your land use, oh, that's, that's going to be commercial uh, 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 site. Your housing element still identifies that site as multifamily residential. You've got to go through a housing element amendment process in order to make this switch. And that requires going to HCD first with a draft, getting OK from HCD, coming back and amending your housing element. You haven't done that. And uh, that's a, a, a fundamental flaw in this. You can't, you can't yank sites out of your multifamily inventory um, without going through that housing element process. So I'd urge you to put off uh, uh, any, any approval of this uh, particular project uh, until that's done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Grable. Fred uh, Vetter. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, my name is Fred Vetter. I'm uh, a resident in the Harvest Park neighborhood. I own a house uh, on Summer, uh, Summer Creek, about a block from the proposed site uh, on, your, on Petaluma Hill Road. Uh, I'm a full-time teacher at Roseland University Prep. I love my school. I love my community, especially my neighborhood where I live. Um, I bought here four years ago, and I carefully researched all the places I was looking at. All single family homes in the area where I live, and then the, the empty site we knew could be built on someday, and the deal was that is going to be low density, more single family homes. That was part of the reason that I bought. I'm a teacher. I don't make a lot of money. I put everything I had into this house. And now I find out that we are literally going to be sandwiched between a 100-unit apartment building, it's probably going to be an apartment building, and Santa Rosa Avenue, which is extremely busy. Um, that, that's, a, that's a big problem for our neighborhood. And Council Member uh, Vast Dupre, um, I'm sorry that there aren't more people from the neighborhood represented here tonight, but there is a lot of concern. And you can see that in the 25 signatures. Again, this was just in our small area. There's, there's a lot of concern in the neighborhood, and it's unfortunate that people haven't gotten a little more fueled up about it, but people are living their lives, and they're busy. There's a lot of kids in our neighborhood, and there's always orange cones up to keep the cars slowing down through our neighborhood. And uh, again, I, I, I think that the woman who put up the map that showed that there's kind of a, a, an area where the medium density housing is and we're now literally going to be sandwiched low density between medium density more medium density in Santa Rosa, Rosa Avenue um, I think that really shows the situation that we find pretty unfortunate um, I think that kind of sums up my concern again my I would ask the council not to approve the rezoning of that Petaluma Hill Road site for medium density because no one who bought in that area understood when they bought that that was going to become a huge apartment complex. And frankly, I feel a little bit deceived by that because again, all my investments are now in this one house and it's, it's a big bummer for me as a homeowner, resident, and person who really, really believes in uh, our community, especially in Roseland. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vetter. Those are all the cards that I have. You do not have to fill out a card to speak on this item. If you wish to speak, uh, step forward. Mr. Bennett. Once again, for the benefit of these poor folks that don't understand where the motivation is to uh, have a resolve to follow through with planning that doesn't feel organic to the community 
that they bought into. They bought into a, 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 a rural, almost semi-country landscape, and now they're going to be inundated with smart growth. And the thing that they need to understand is that, unfortunately, their public servant's allegiance has been subverted by globalist interests that wish to install a hardscape that lends itself better to our containment and oppression through being incentivized for grant money through a mechanism that we're not fully privy to. Um, um, your public servants, instead of uh, um, uh, leaving the options open so that the um, uh, free market landscape and capitalism can dictate what happens with that area that is largely rural, and instead of allowing it to grow in the organic manner that is indigenous to the way um, uh, real estate investment has always gone on here in America. Instead, this unnatural smart growth landscape is going next to them. And it doesn't make sense unless you happen to be one of the activists or the people that are awake and understand what motivates the hardscape and the design of our city. It is about being close and within the transportation corridor to the smart train and metamorphosizing our way of life from one that is a free market with the freedom that the automobile lends, with the privacy that a single family home lends, with the abundance, independence that the single family home lends, which are the foundation of what the landscape of our country is supposed to be about. And we have all failed. Us have, as activists, we have not been able to impart on you the importance of this allegiance that you've gone along with and adopted. And you guys have failed because you haven't been able to employ the discernment to recognize the importance and what it really represents to allow yourself to catch Go along, itis. That's what you got. Go along, itis. I wish there was a pill for it. Anybody else wishing to speak on this item? I think you should probably split your, uh, if you're going to build residential units there, 100 units on the Yolanda corner there, or Petaluma, excuse me, Petaluma, Petaluma Hill Road. Um, I recommend like, like 50 units, and then 50, uh, 50 uh, the other units set aside for a supermarket like Safeway, or preferably unionized operation, or Trader Joe's. Are they unionized? Do you guys know? They're unionized labor? Because they pay better wages and it's better, better quality food. Walmart is e the evil empire. They're the largest private employer in America, and they pay the lowest wages in the industry. They are anti-communist, but yet their number one supplier is communist China, who has sw slave labor camps. So Walmart is bad. We don't want Walmart in Santa Rosa. They can stay out in road and puke if they, you know, that's, that's the better path. And uh, I, I, I think uh, you should put a, like a Safeway, like on Petaluma Hill Road or something like a Rayleigh's or something, you know, uh, or, or Trader Joe's. Yeah, that'll work. Uh, my, my brother lives out there. He just moved from San Francisco. It's Calvin Vassallo Chan. Yeah, he's an AT&T uh, operator. Have a nice day. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak on this item? Public hearing is closed. Bring back to council for any other questions. Mr. Bartley. Uh, just a, a question following up on Mr. Grable's comment about we can't just arbitrarily transfer and you justify what, the action you're recommending. Yeah, we did consider the housing element with this proposal. Uh, we don't agree that the housing element needs to be amended at this time. Um, the um, the changes are not medium high density, and that is the trigger for uh, a housing element uh, update. And in addition, we feel that it is consistent because where we are removing 35 units, we are replacing those on other sites. Mr. Rose, can you talk a bit more about the uh, Petaluma Hill numbers? I, I think I read in one of the letters we received about a potential five-story building. I don't think we're looking at that. Uh, it, it's almost doubled in size, uh, and in your assessment, that's doable for that site. Yeah, so the zoning would increase the height uh, limit. It would go up to 45 feet uh, versus 35 feet now. However, we don't have a project, and we know that uh, that project 
uh, would have to be sensitively designed. Um, for purposes of this proposal, we looked at it relative to the things that I mentioned earlier, proximity to transportation, other commercial development. Uh, there is a park nearby. There is an apartment complex that uh, appears to interact effectively with this single family development. So those are the reasons why we selected this site. I would like to um, advise the council, however, that the Petaluma Hill Road site is not necessary to achieve the goals of this project. Uh, if the Montecito site were selected um, by itself or in combination with the Mead Avenue site, it would achieve our objective. Thank you. Mr. Warsaki? Thank you. Bill, uh, that Petaluma Hill Road site, is there a W Trans analysis that says that additional traffic can't a cannot access Petaluma Hill Road because of the speed? of Petaluma Hill Road. I'd like to look at the exact language yeah. to be sp specific about that. I just that. saw that in our citizens' comment. I wanted to be clear on that. Yeah. We, we can to, look. I appreciate that, but that. To, uh, to restate, that 7.7-acre .7 site next to Harvest Park neighborhood, that's not essential for this? Correct. Thank you. Council, comments? I'd, I'd like you, to hear that. He's looking for information. Yeah. Any other questions from council? Okay, we'll wait for that response. So I'll just go ahead and read. Uh, this is from the W Trans report dated April 3rd, 2012. It's regarding 3015 Petaluma Hill Road, and it says, given the volume and speed of traffic on Petaluma Hill Road, it is unlikely that future development could gain access directly to Petaluma Hill Road. Access to the housing replacement site would have to be provided either via an access easement through the property to the north connecting to Yolanda Avenue or through the existing subdivision to the south and west, which leads through Birch Street to connect with Santa Rosa Avenue. So, okay, I appreciate that. So that, it sounds to me that there's a high probability that the neighborhood would suffer increased traffic. It's saying that that would likely be the access, yes. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to uh, offer to my colleagues consideration that we take the Petaluma Hill Road uh, parcel and take that out of this proposal, this rezoning. I'd like to make a motion to do that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So we have a motion in a second. I want to get some clarification. Um, when we talk about dwelling unit potential, that's the potential that you're looking at. If there's increase at 48, doesn't mean we would go to, it doesn't mean we would go to, a, to the actual 100? Is that what you're saying? So, we, for example, just taking the Pilum Hill Road for it, for the example, currently the potential was 52, so you're increasing that to 100. Right? That's, that's correct. And that's just the potential. Doesn't mean that they're going to build. That's correct. 100 units. Mr. Bartley. Well, I have the resolution. I just um, discussion on this motion because it's a little. I agree that um, we don't need the Petaluma Hill site and um, and I was saying that we'd have our comments and to carry it through because it's one of the resolutions at the end um, I guess we can pull it out as a separate one I agree I don't think it is um, there there are issues with that site I think ultimately um, to the people that live there ultimately we're going to do another general plan update and we're going to be looking for parcels that need to be up zone so you know, hopefully the economy turns around and the rest of those single family residents get built really fast. Um, I look at the layout and the planning on it and, and it, there, to my mind, there just wasn't enough, there isn't enough single family in that little block. And you can look at the way the streets are laid out as if it's going to continue. Um, I think just from a planning standpoint, I'm a little, was a little concerned about bracketing that little cluster of single family with medium density on either side because they have a fairly large concentration of medium density to the west before you transition. So I, I had a, I, I was thinking, and since we don't need it, while well, I think someday we're gonna, be, we're gonna be revisit, we won't. Some council will be revisiting the issue. I didn't think it was appropriate this time. Um, I guess I would look to the, we've got a motion, I looked to the city attorney and, and maybe more discussion, but instead of doing this action right now, couldn't we just finish our discussion about the whole thing and the third resolution, which is the one doing the rezone, bring it, have it come back on consent, taking out that one parcel, or does it make any difference? 
did you have a comment? I, I mean, I think you could do it either way. Yes. Why, why not be so, consistent with how we were earlier tonight? Well, I, it's either way. It's just we're still going to bring the other resolution back. Well, I think it, it's. I would probably be a good idea to bring it back because well, we'd want to make sure that we we're absolutely. being thorough. No, yes. I'm saying so either we way. Make, we take this action yes. now. We're still going to have to take an action yes. at the end of this thing, pulling if everybody agrees, pulling that parcel out and bringing it back anyway. So, I mean, if we want to take an extra action, was there a second on it? Yes. I really Mr. don't. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Howard, I, I just wanted to say that I, I think I agree with your logic on that, and uh, it looks to me like this is a bit of overkill. We can get what we wanted to get without including this site, and uh, it does look problematic every way you look at it. If you can't get to Petaluma Hill Road, uh, I think there's a problem with the site, with the, with the increased density. So, then it, it, however we're going to do it, if we're going to pull it you, out now. You have a motion on the table to, to con you, you take action on the motion. It, it, you can either take action on the motion, and if it passes, then you would have to have discussion about the project with that revision or presumably um, already voted on and it, I would say that you would still want to clarify any uh, your final we'll still, action we'll still, on the final that I have you the would have on the final that you would one, have that have change we're going to pull it out and bring it that's back correct that's, all I want to make sure. that's correct well they can do this and we'll just do it we're going to repeat it at the end so this is pull, pull what, what, the Petaluma Hill Road side so off this, this pulls Petaluma Hill Road yeah. off right. we have seven eyes Okay. Now, now we bring it back to council. Yeah, and I, I do, I do have just a comment. Yes. I, you know, over the, the these two terms in office on the council, we are always struggling with finding places for our housing, and I hope that in the future we will start to look at the center of our city and our downtown, and start to use our airspace and and stop the spread um, even though this is well, you know it's, it's already zoned for for single family dwellings but we're always trying to find room for for high density housing when our downtown is sitting here waiting for high density housing in my opinion and i just wonder when we'll figure it out and start using that airspace and going up as opposed to um putting more uh, difficulty into our into our neighborhood so i I don't know when we're going to start doing it, but I hope it's soon. Thank you. Any other final comments on this item? Uh, Mr. Warsaki? Yeah, I, I have a, a real issue with, we're considering the whole proposal in front of us right now, correct? Yes. Uh, it just seems that a statement of overriding considerations prior to a specific project is, is truly the cart before the horse. And when I see, hear the cost, I wonder why are we why are we spending public funds for this one parcel, and how does that square with the recent comments when we had the fish pantry in front of us that we had to take care and, and safeguard all of the city's assets, and here we are just gifting it away, if you will. So to me, there's a basic inconsistency and we wouldn't consider gifting that or, or letting that fish property go to those folks that were running that food pantry when we had improvements and upgrades exceeding its market value. We heard all kinds of talk about how we have to safeguard the city's assets, and here we are just writing a check basically to a private property owner. So I, I have a problem with that consistency. Uh, I do think that uh, this is premature, and I, I look for persuasion from my colleagues to change my position on that, but I don't, I don't see the need to, to go hell-bent into something that we've already considered that would harm an outstanding local business. Mr. Hours? I don't believe that we've got a project before us that has specifics in it, but what we're trying to do here is to entice a user who will generate sales tax. Earlier tonight, we heard our transportation people telling us that they are cutting back, and a lot of that's based on lack of sales tax. We have to, we have to be proactive. We have to attract businesses, and that's what we're trying to do here. That's the whole purpose of economic development. We're going to invest something, and we're going to get something back, more than we invested. So this is what this is about, and, and that's why I'm, I'm very much in favor of this. We are 
developing a site that will attract a user who will be a money generator for the city. Councilmember Vastapray? Comments? Councilmember Sawyer? I mean, Vice Mayor Sawyer? Thank you, Mayor. Well, uh, we heard a couple of years ago when we were still in the, in the depths of our fiscal crisis, and I think we're, we're still there, although we're maybe seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, that we needed to be prepared and ready uh, to take action when things started to turn around, or that those cities that were ready for, um, for, for business to, to come in would be the, the chosen sites. And I think that this is a perfect example of, of our city working in, a, in the best interests of, of our citizens. And uh, by removing the obstacles that were discussed earlier uh, by Mr. Rose uh, to the fiscal recovery of our city. So I'm going to be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Goring. Well, we, as we just heard in the last item, we have any number of sites along Santa Rosa Avenue and other places of, in Santa Rosa that are vacant, ready to have tenants that would accommodate the exact same product mix of this uh, project that might come forward in the future. And we have no idea what this project would be. We have no idea what kind of traffic impacts it would generate. And we had this exact same conversation in around the proposed Lowe's project before. And the and the foreseeable future uh, the financing of, of any improvements on the Hearn Avenue overpass now is even further into the future because of the um, because of redevelopment and other things that have disappeared. So uh, I'm I wasn't in favor of expending public money to benefit a private landowner before. And I'm distressed that we've now spent it, and when we have vacant sites that we could retenant, and I'm not going to be uh, approving this, any statement of overriding considerations without truly understanding what this site might be used for. Thank you. I, I will be brief. This, uh, this is a good investment, and this is aggressive economic development and things that we need to be doing. Uh, Mr. Bartley. Yeah, well, I, um, before we go, uh, we pulled out the, the Petaluma Hill site. I, I'm comfortable with the Mita site. I think that's an appropriate site to stay as medium density residential. Is that what I'm hearing from everybody? Okay, just want to make sure of that. And, and comments, you know, um, it is economic development. I was on the Planning Commission when the Lowe's project came through. Um, and I know it's not a question of big box because the council at that time gave the planning commission, in fact, myself, I think Chair Duggan, uh, Joel Galbraith from staff, and Warren Hedgepass from Design Review, they told us it wasn't a question of it, whether it's a, a large format retailer because this site is intended, if you look at what we describe in our general plan, we're looking for easy at freeway access to sites that will adapt to large format retailers. The council said specifically it was not an issue of large format retailers. It was an issue of design. And they directed us to come back with design guidelines that address that, which we did, presented to council, and the council unanimously passed it. So it does come down to, because of the action of the last council, a question of design. And in terms of the uh, rezone and the difference between, although I think the, the, the issue of fish doesn't really have anything to do with this, um, uh, apples and oranges. The fact is we rezoned this, this, this little piece of residential. The city did that. The owner was never informed of it because it came through as part of a general plan update. It just happened. And so I do think the city, it is appropriate for us to expend some funds to correct that because to be economic development, it's a much greater uh, return. And so with that, I'm happy to move a resolution. Um, may I make a statement first? <laughs> sure, why not? Since I actually did serve on the previous council and considered this project, I want to clarify that the big box guidelines had nothing to do with the discussion of this particular site. In fact, there was a five to two vote against Lowe's, the particular project had not to do with design review, it had to do with traffic 
and the significant impacts to local businesses. So the record has been corrected. I'd also like to add a comment as well, since I also served on that co council, and, and the comment that north-south congestion is always going to be with us, and therefore we just have to live with it, I find unacceptable. Uh, we have a large format retailer right down the street that wants to come into the city. It's a local business that has supported local activities for many, many years. If we are truly interested in sales tax and in benefiting our local economy, we should go talk to Mr. Friedman, who wants to come into the city. There's our solution. And, that's part, and that, I think that's a, that's a great point, but that would probably require a statement overriding consideration because of the impact on Hearn Avenue. So if what I'm hearing is we can't approve anything until Hearn Avenue is built, then we're really not approving anything. So with that, I'm moving it's a resolution. Here. I'm moving a resolution of the city of Santa Rosa certifying the final supplemental environmental impact report for the Olanda Avenue General Plan Amendment, project file number GPAM12-001 and wave reading of the text. Oops, I forgot to push my power. We have uh, four eyes, Councilmember Bartley, Sawyer, Oliveris, and Hours voting yes. Councilmember Wysocki, Vasapre, and Gordon voting no. Okay, and I'll move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving the General Plan Amendments for the properties associated with the Yolanda Avenue general plan amendment project and making findings with regard to significant impacts identified in the final supplemental environmental impact report for the Yolanda Avenue general plan amendment project file number GPAM12-001 and wave reading of the text. Second. Okay. Do we, excuse me, do we need to make a clarification on that one, Bill, the general plan amendment to remove the Petaluma Hill Road Is site? They buried in there too? Yeah, uh, if you would just make a distinction uh, that the Petaluma Hill Road site will be removed. Well, I was just going to give direction with the okay. third resolution. To, okay. I was just going to, okay, can I just direct? Okay. Can we it, just the, third, the third item is an ordinance for rezoning that will be introduced tonight and come back. So the second item is the resolution gen making. Okay. So that, that's a so final specifically action. Pulling out the, the resolution is a final action and okay. the ordinance is not. Okay, so pulling out. we're going to pull out the Petaluma Hill Road site, yeah. yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Second. <laughs> and this motion, motion, motion also passes. Councilmember Bartley, Sawyer, Oliveris, and Howard voting yes. Councilmember Wysocki, Vasapre, and Gorin voting no. Okay, and then the third one, we can direct staff to bring back a resolution with about the rezoning. So that, that's an, a rezoning ordinance, and so we could introduce the ordinance with direction to bring it back, the okay. second re reading with that correction. Okay, so I will move ordinance of the City Council, the City of Santa Rosa, amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, reclassifying approximately 7.7 .7 acres at 3015 Petaluma Hill Road from R16, single family residential, to R318. I'm sorry, I'm just spacing out here. Multifamily residential and reclassification of approximately 4.6 acres. No, wait a second, I am spacing out. I don't want to do Petaluma Hill Road. Right. Hmm? Yeah, I know it is. Maybe it is. <laughs> okay, let me try no, this one not. more time. I'm going to move an ordinance to the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, reclassifying, uh, i got to go down with my bad eyes, approximately 4.6 acres at 1845 Mita Avenue from R16 single family residential to R1 to R318 multifamily residential and directing staff to bring back the final what's something well, it's, it's an introduction of the ordinance so staff would bring back the final but you, with the clarification that we're removing you're the removing Peta Luma Hill Road Peta side. Luma Hill Road side and so then the next thank the you. second reading will have that correction okay right. please second, second. thank you here we have four eyes uh, Councilman Bartley Sawyer Oliver and hours voting yes Councilman Wysocki Vasa Prey and Gordon voting no Okay. Thank you uh, to staff, and uh, now we'll move on. I think we have a series of correspondence here. Uh, Madam City Manager, if you wanted to summarize those, please. Right, let me, let me run down these um, pieces of correspondence. Um, the uh, first three are letters that were submitted to various, well, legislature or the state agency. The first one was on our, um, 
uh, discharge permit. Uh, the second one was regarding um, a uh, land use um, and housing element um, amendment. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to have time to check on the outcome of that one. I don't know that that passed or not. I do know that on the um, AB 685, the next item, a letter of opposition on the state water policy definition, that did pass through the legislature with a letter from the um, author clarifying that it was not his intent to create new definitions which would inspire all this litigation. Um, I don't know whether the governor is actually going to sign this one or not. Um, so uh, we'll, it's likely we're going to be coming back to the council with a list of other um, uh, uh, letters that need to go on to the governor and uh, we'll take a look at that this week. Um, the next two items, the first one is a notice on um, uh, changes due to the construction uh, cost index of changing the threshold for minor construction contracts under our rules. And the last item is a minor contract award for the Brush Creek Bike and Pedestrian Path Rehabilitation between Montesino Boulevard and Highway 12. Thank you very much. We'll move on to uh, public comment. I, I do have one question on, yes. the, on these letters. The one, uh, b I understand we had a hiatus and time was of the essence, but there's one correspondence dated July 23rd, and I know we had a couple of meetings after that. Why are we just seeing that now? Probably because the bill was being acted on at that time, in between meetings. That's probably why it went out. Okay. That would be the circumstance. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd get it in front of the council. Mr. Wheat. Greetings, Santa Rosa City Council members. I'm speaking before you today about a general malfeasance of civic government conducted by your former mayor, Jane Bender. In 2005, Mayor Bender closed down the homeless shelter at the National Guard Armory, and she wasted $1.5 million to, uh, uh, when the Army was costing nothing and had the city build the Sam Jones Shelter, which has half the bed space of the National Guard Armory. This was a heartless maneuver, and at the same time, her act wasn't even fiscally sound when it came to saving the taxpayers any money. The Sam Jones Shelter is located on Wright Road near Sebastopol. The central location of the Army would definitely mitigate and facilitate the ease of transportation issues involved in job searches. It also makes it more convenient for them to access county services like food stamps and CMSP, especially if they have families. Also, the Army is located practically next door to the San Rosa Junior College District Police, so there can be no worries of an outbreak in crime in the Junior College neighborhood. I think it is cruel to force the homeless to live in an effect in a shanty town on the outskirts of West Santa Rosa. All poverty is a function of some failure in domestic policy along with individuals' poor choices or through no fault of their own. The economy is in shambles. We have wasted millions of dollars in useless paperwork studies regarding SMART. The bureaucracy must be accountable to the individual and they must have faith that it can be solved and dispense civic justice. You lose that faith and you're out of a job. Search your conscience. The National Guard Army Homeless Shelter will demonstrate that this council is a commitment to progressive and populist ideas. No longer do the homeless have to die at age 55 under a freeway overpass. Perhaps now they can get help. You have the power to improve people's lives for pennies on the dollar. Do not turn away the act of charity to your fellow man who is often is powerless to change his own station in life. Thank you very much for your time. Restore the National Guard Army as the homeless shelter. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Phaedra uh, Glidden. Hello again, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members. You know, I have something prepared to say, but I just noticed how fast he was reading his document. We need to have our open comment at the beginning of the meeting, and we need to have five minutes, not three. This is ridiculous. <sighs> okay. As you already know, a couple weeks ago, I found out that the funding for the Brown Act has been suspended as part of our state budget cuts. I found this out in an ed editorial in I IJ called Marin Supervisors' Right to Vote, Vote Following the Brown Act. I will leave you a copy of this editorial, but please allow me a moment to quote three paragraphs from that editorial. The first paragraph says, in a show of leadership and commitment to open government, the Marin Board of Supervisors has gone on record that it will allow Brown Act, even though sa state lawmakers have put it in legal limbo, limbo. It also states that the Brown Act is crucial to citizens knowing what our government is doing. 
The legislature's decision to halt funding of the Brown Act is a travesty, but it has helped raise awareness of the importance of the Brown Act. And lastly, the final paragraph says, we applaud Marin's five supervisors for publicly expressing their commitment to abide by open meeting rules, even while Sacramento lawmakers play political games with them. Shortly after reading this, I sent the council an email requesting that they go on record that the city will continue to abide by the requirements of the Brown Act, regardless of the cut, this cut in funding. Thank you, Mayor. Oliveras and C Councilwoman Susan Gorham for responding to my email. I was relieved to hear that you will continue to abide by the Brown Act requirements. However, I would like to res respectfully request that you make this official by making a public statement to this effect or by holding an up or down vote, whichever follows your city pos policy in re this regard. Thank you again for helping to ensure an open and transparent city of Santa Rosa. Good evening. Thank you. James Bennett. You know, um, seven or eight years ago or so when we bought our little um, dealership site on Santa Rosa Avenue there. That was an awfully nifty piece for people of our means to have ended up with. I s searched the owner through tax records, and even though it wasn't on the market, <laughs> he let me know that I wasn't the only one um, um, looking to buy it. And for people of our means, it was a pretty nifty piece to get. At the time, after the sun went down, Santa Rosa Avenue looked like Night of the Living Dead. The Ponderosa was in full swing. The back of our place was like a drive through for scoring a dime bag. And we, with our humble means, tried to make it look as nice as we could. I had an idea of making it look more like a place to taste wine than buy a car. We were going to make it nicer, but we didn't have the check, we didn't have the, uh, a big enough wallet to wait through all the design review convening every two weeks. So we did what we could and got it going. This um, almost precedent-setting move wherein you took a public street and reduced our access to an easement held by our competitor might be a lofty word, but I guess you could say competitor. We are already being damaged by it. Today, no exaggeration, six times before lunch, we couldn't get in or out of our dealership we had somebody from New York honor us with buying a $50,000 black Jaguar from us. We detailed it, and in two, two and a half hours later, when the, his representative came to pick it up, his comment to me was, God, you couldn't even clean the car when my guy had just done a two hour and a half hour detail on it. I'm trying to find a way to tell you that we're already being damaged by this project next door. I got the photographs to prove it. You wouldn't believe your eyes. I had a customer call us and said that he couldn't get into the place and that he'd, when he had time, he'd come back. We can't get in. We can't get out. The place is a mess. Our merchandise is all dusty and dirty. Who could quantify how many people would be coming to our place today? because I, I don't get a chance to talk to them. When you're driving by and you look at the place, one side is completely blockaded, and the other side, no exaggeration now, I left at 11.45, we open at 10. Six times I couldn't get in or out. I would, you've already kind of skirted your fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility to us, and I would thank one of the planners to do the right thing, make a phone call in this little public-private partnership that you're engaging in with Kia, and see to it that we have access to our own property. Be of service to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Meeting is adjourned.
Okay, Derek. Um, did Joe have a wonderful time in Colorado? Oh, he did. He wants to go back. <laughs> <laughs>